to order. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the second day in a series of hearings that the Science and Technology Committee is holding to investigate the Shuttle <coughs> Challenger explosion. Our nation has a commitment to space exploration and space development, and we must maintain these objectives even as we examine the causes of the shuttle accident. As I mentioned yesterday, our approach will be three-pronged. First, we will examine the accident in terms of technology and hardware, which is the process we're on now, really what went wrong. Second, we will scrutinize the role of NASA's management and decision-making process in the accident scenario. And finally, we will use this knowledge to help us make the decisions and judgments necessary for the future stability and success of our nation's space program. Yesterday, we heard from the Honorable William Rogers, Chairman of the President's Commission on the Space Shuttle Accident. The Commission has provided the nation with an outstanding documentation of the technology failures and also management problems that, that led up to the January 28th accident. Today, NASA Administrator James C. Fletcher is with us uh, to respond to the findings and recommendations of the Rogers Commission report, as well as to present his views on changes and ideas and suggestions in NASA's future structure and operations. And I understand that with uh, Dr. Fletcher will be Dr. William Graham, Deputy Administrator NASA, R Rear Admiral uh, Richard Truly, Associate Administrator for Space Flight, Mr. Arnold D. Ulrich, Manager of the National Space Transportation System of NASA, Captain Robert L. Crippen, astronaut NASA, and Mr. Dan Germany, leader photo and TV analysis team from NASA in due course as they fit into the, the testimony. Before I call on our distinguished witnesses today, I defer to our uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Manny Luhan from New Mexico for any opening statement he may wish to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I join you in welcoming Dr. Fletcher and Admiral Truly um, before this uh, committee today. I look forward to hearing their initial responses to the conclusions and recommendations made by the Rogers Commission as a result of its investigation into the Challenger accident. I was glad to hear uh, that Dr. Fletcher had, uh, when he said that he agreed to study the recommendations of the Rogers Commission with an open, and, with an open mind and without reservations. Uh, that certainly is, uh, in my opinion, the first step in the right direction. Uh, a lot of other steps must follow to fully implement the tough changes required by the Commission's findings and recommendations. Uh, the Rogers Commission has made it abundantly clear that a serious, uh, thoughtful, and thorough review of NASA, its policies and practices, is overdue. It is unfortunate that it took a tragic accident and the loss of seven lives uh, to get uh, our undivided attention. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I cannot help but express a deep personal frustration at this time. In the aftermath of the Challenger accident, I grew increasingly tired of seeing NASA again and again adopt a defensive attitude and generally uh, less than cooperative posture towards the inquiry and constructive criticism. However, I believe that uh, Dr. Fletcher has recently committed to changing this attitude, and I welcome this initiative. I hope he is successful in implementing this change at all levels of NASA management. All of us are anxious to get on with the business of rebuilding the space program. I intend to lend my full support to that effort. There is, however, a string of issues which continues to concern me greatly particularly troubled by NASA's organizational management structure as it applies to the state's transportation system, uh, its policies for certifying hardware, and the agency's approach toward criticality one and two items in risk analysis. I'll pursue these issues during the course of our hearings. Uh, Dr. Fletcher, the bad news is that you have your, cut, your work cut out for you, and it won't be easy. Uh, the good news is that I believe you'll have the full support of this committee and as you begin the task of fixing the critical problems and to rebuild our space program. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished gentleman. If there's any other members of the committee that have a, an opening statement they want to uh, issue today, please uh, put it in the record. And I believe there's one or two. Under the, a statement I'd like to have inserted in the record at this, at this point. In the record. No objection, so order. Any other statement? The gentlelady from Tennessee, no objection, so order. Gentleman from New York, no objection, so order. In fact, everybody, no, no objection, order. We'll put them in at this time. And that'll solve that problem. <coughs> now, um, For the benefit of the members of the committee, uh, we have planned on working with Dr. Fletcher and Admin, Admiral Truly and the members of their team, as I announced before, uh, during the day today and tomorrow. Uh, there will be ample time to develop the issues involved and to uh, get, get the facts before the committee as we unfold the second phase of our examination, which really has to do with not only what happened, which we had from the testimony yesterday, but what is the observations and the findings and the references that will be developed by 
the NASA leadership and management under Dr. Fletcher. Now, Dr. Fletcher has to uh, visit with the president. They've got a program that's laid on this morning after, he, and I think it's around 11 o'clock if I'm not mistaken. Right. But as he concludes that, uh, that program, we'll be back here uh, thereafter to continue on through the afternoon. So again, for the benefit of the members, there will be ample time. We'll go through the five-minute process to get organized and uh, get started. So as you're developing your areas of interest, I think you ought to develop them in continuity so that we are carrying through on any particular issue in a continuity so it makes sense as far as the record is concerned and as far as getting the work done. <coughs> now, having said that, I want to welcome our full committee chairman, uh, the Honorable Don Fuquay from Florida. Don, is there any comments you want to make before we begin? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to welcome Dr. Fletcher back. I think he's not been before this committee in this capacity in uh, about nine years. So welcome back, Dr. Fletcher, and we look forward to working with you. All right. Having said that, Dr. Fletcher, again, we want to welcome you and Admiral Truly and your team. And uh, if you would go ahead, I know you have your formal statements, but I do think that they're of su sufficiency that we should review the entire full statements. So set the framework for today's hearing. So Dr. Fletcher, if you would proceed, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I welcome this opportunity to appear before you to address the Rogers Commission report. And not because it's easy or pleasant for me or for NASA, but because it is a necessary and appropriate step in a democratic society. The Challenger accident, in full sight of the American people and the world, raised many questions about what we as an agency were doing and certainly how we were doing it. After a long period of many successes, we at NASA are brought back to Earth, both literally and figuratively, for a time of reassessment. Mr. Chairman, the American people seek answers, and you, as its selective representatives of this committee, do too. We are prepared today to begin to give you our best current information, plans, and responses to questions and recommendations. We do not have all the answers yet, and we expect our dialogue with you to continue often during the coming months. We are dealing with very complicated problems. Simple answers, quick and easy answers, are just not honest or reasonable. The Commission report urges me as NASA Administrator to report to the President one year from now on our progress. I intend that both you and he have interim reports as we work to reclaim the excellence that has been our hallmark. I said last Monday that NASA was prepared to study the Rogers Commission report with an open mind and without reservations, and that is absolutely true. I said that we had already been at work, indeed had begun to seek answers to the disaster even before the commission was appointed, and that is also true. And I promised that where NASA management was found to be weak, we would strengthen it. Where engineering or design or process needed improvement or change, we would do what was needed. And that where our internal communications, and that includes decision making, were poor, they would be made better. It seemed to me that the Rogers Commission report not only was painstaking as it looked back, but cleared the air in a sense for us to move on. The Rogers Commission, in short, not only analyzed the failure of the Challenger launch and made recommendations for change, it also reaffirmed our goal. Mr. Rogers, in his letter of transmittal to the President, said, the nation's task now to move ahead to return to space, safe space flight and to its recognized position of leadership in space. There could be no more fitting tribute to the Challenger crew than to do so. We intend to do so. No tribute may be sufficiently worthy considering the sacrifice of the Challenger crew, but we shall do all we can to make spaceflight safe and to maintain American leadership in space. 
Mr. Chairman, that is not an idle statement, and I would like to review briefly why I believe that is so. First, I believe this body will take an active role in redefining our national space effort for the decade ahead and into the next century, continuing a role this committee has had from the beginning of the American space program. Second, NASA, virtually from the moment of the accident, has been deeply involved in finding out what went wrong so that we could plan for a safer future. Third, the Rogers Commission has performed in an exceptional way without posturing, without placing blame in a vindictive manner, without seeking to destroy a program that has brought knowledge, pride, and glory to this nation. Let me begin with NASA's relationship with Congress. There are those who have seized on our mistakes to question your oversight, the legitimacy of long-time cooperation, and indeed, possibly, the space program itself. The fact is, Mr. Chairman, that Congress has always maintained a careful and thoughtful balance between a critical and sometimes skeptical view of space plans, even as it supplied support and encouragement when that seemed justified. In the 60s, getting to the moon was a national policy, and with the American people's hearty endorsement, the Congress responded with program and financial support to match the public's almost unlimited enthusiasm. But those days are long gone. What has remained is a close working relationship and, I hope, mutual respect. I intend to maintain and improve both. I intend, with Congress, to look carefully at our programs and with OMB to make sure that every request to you is a responsible one. We will set priorities with full disclosure and discussion, and we will carefully spend the monies that you authorize. The American people have a nonpartisan pride in the accomplishments of the space program and in American preeminence in this field. I do not believe they want a timid program that doesn't maintain leadership. I do believe they want this committee and NASA to move with assurance together in seeking new goals. Let me now review some of NASA's own activities in the weeks since the Challenger accident shook our confidence. We were forced to look at everything we had done, from design to the process of our decision making. Part of this was the responsible, uh, responsibility of a task force under Admiral Truly's leadership and with day-to-day -day direction by his associate, J.R. Thompson. It involved a development and production team, a pre-launch activity team, a mission planning and operations team, an accident analysis team, a salvage support team, and a photo and TV team. Much of its activity was aimed at helping the Rogers Commission. The NASA task force reports were made to the Commission in mid-April, but data is still being gathered analyzed and pursued by appropriate NASA leaders. I also asked General Sam Phillips, who was Apollo program manager when we were on our way to the moon, to study every aspect of how NASA manages, manages its programs, including relationships between our various space centers uh, with each other and with NASA headquarters. General Phillips' review is not limited to the Challenger accident and operates with broad authority from me to question every aspect of our activities. The review and report to me is being done without a deadline and will probably take the rest of this year for completion. But as I become aware of things that need to be done, they will be implemented at that time. The period from the Challenger accident to our next launch will be a time or of reevaluation for NASA. Our work will not stop 
it will only be more intense than ever. Mr. Chairman, during the past several weeks, and particularly during the past few days, the question of when we will fly a space shuttle has been raised. I have said that our target date is July 1987, but I want that goal placed in its proper context, and that context is safety. We will fly in 1987 if it is safe to do so. We will not fly if it is not. In the complicated, interrelated situation in which we must function, a target date is necessary, particularly to potential users, but the date is not a fixed and inflexible one. We are realistic about our problems, some of which the Rogers Commission noted, and we know there may be delays in design, testing, and manufacture. You will hear more about all of that from Admiral Truly in a moment. For the moment, we keep the date of summer of 1987 as a goal which may change. What is not changeable is our commitment to fly again only when it is safe to do so. We will fly when we know clearly that we have dealt with the problems which led to the Challenger disaster. Finally, while Admiral Truly will deal with the specific recommendations of the Rogers Commission report, and what we already are already doing or have done, I want to make several observations about the report itself. I said on Monday that the report of a presidentially appointed independent body carries with it special status and the compelling obligation to study its conclusions with an openness and willingness to change. That is particularly so with this report. It was done thoroughly and with care, with both toughness and understanding. And I repeat, it was done with our cooperation. In its preface, it was noted that NASA established several teams of people not involved in the Challenger launch process to support the Commission and its panels. I think it is important for the Committee, the House, and the American people to understand that NASA and the Rogers Commission have worked closely together even as each maintained its independence during the many weeks of the Commission's work. The press preface of the report said, these NASA teams have cooperated with the Commission in every aspect of its work. The result has been a comprehensive and complete investigation. That investigation will have profound effects on NASA and the space programs of the United States. Changes have already been made. More will come. Yet, Mr. Rogers said, you don't want to punish. You just want to make sure it doesn't happen again. That is the goal I think we all share. That is certainly NASA's goal beyond question. I have said, speaking for the employees of an agency that has given this world not only lasting knowledge and moments of excitement and joy, that we have reached with the Rogers Commission report a day of resolve, a time of beginning, a time of rededication. I think you will see the truth of that in Admiral Truly's testimony that will follow. After Admiral Truly's statement, we will be pleased to respond to any questions the commi committee may have. Thank you. I uh, thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Admiral Truly, would you go ahead with your formal testimony, please? Mr. Chairman and uh, distinguished members, during the months since I returned to duty with NASA following the tragic loss of Challenger, I, along with my entire organization, have spent many hours in support of the Rogers Commission. We have done our best to assist them in the conduct of their investigation, and I have reviewed uh, the Commission's report to the President. I personally find it to be extremely uh, thorough and comprehensive. I am in general agreement with all the findings and all the recommendations, and I am pleased to say that because of our close association with Chairman Rogers and their work, 
I've been able to anticipate the corrective actions required to safely return the sh space shuttle to uh, flight. These actions were initiated by mem my memorandum of March 24, 1986, and a sub subsequent one by Mr. Arnie Aldrich on March 28, which di directed the shuttle program to undertake this task. I would like to now to briefly take each of, the, each of the Commission's recommendations and provide you with a summary status of my work. The first recommendation of the Commission had to do with the uh, design of the faulty uh, solid rocket motor joint. On March 24th, I directed the Marshall Space Flight Center to form a uh, SRM redesigned team. And the team was to include participation not only from Marshall, but from other NASA centers, and as well as individuals outside of NASA. It's headed by Mr. John Thomas as its leader. It includes personnel from the Johnson Space Center, the Kennedy Space Center, the Langley uh, Research Center, and the Astronaut Office. And in addition, has an expert advisory panel of 12 people, half of whom are uh, from uh, industry. As a result of the early suggestion from the Commission, Dr. Fletcher has requested the National Research Council to appoint an independent oversight committee to review the activities of our redesigned team. The, Na the National Research Council has agreed and the members of that committee have recently been announced. The team is uh, pursuing a number of options for the redesign of the joint and we intend to have a uh, preliminary design review later this summer. Let me assure you that safety, and not schedule, is and will continue to be our primary concern. We will not return to flight status without a safe, tested, and certified design. I welcome the assistance of the Oversight Committee, and I intend to work very closely with them, just as I did with the Rogers Commission, to assure full and complete consideration of all of their recommendations. The second of the major recommendations of the Rogers Commission has to do with uh, shuttle management. In that same memorandum of March 24th, I initiated a detailed review of our management structure to determine those changes both technically and philosophically that are required. I wholeheartedly support the recommendations to re reassess and define the responsibilities of the uh, STS program manager and to ensure that he has this specific type of authority that the Commission recommends in their report. I intend to reevaluate the shuttle's level one and level two and level three management structure and to implement any changes that are necessary to strengthen that structure and reduce the potential for conflict between the program organization and the institution, whether it be at headquarters or at our field centers. Another uh, recommendation had to do with the utilization of present and former members of the astronaut office, and we will give that proper consideration uh, for management positions within the agency. I want to tell you that I concur completely with the concept of a shuttle safety panel reporting to me, and I will initiate action to implement this concept, and I will leave my door open to them at all times. As you know, Dr. Fletcher has uh, mentioned that he has asked General Phillips to review all aspects of NASA program management, and this internal shuttle review will be done in coordination with uh, General Phillips. The third recommendation of the report has to do with a criticality review and hazard analysis. Again, uh, in March, Mr. Aldridge, who is the level two uh, program manager of the space shuttle system initiated a thorough review of all the items on the critical items list. As the first step in that review, every critical one and critical one R item waiver was canceled. And NASA is in the process of a complete review of every one of those items, not just the solid rocket motor joint. And if we find those that are not revalidated by this review, they will be redesigned and fixed and recertified prior to flight. <clears throat> Further, the criticality two and three items are being uh, reviewed to make sure that they are properly categorized. So this, again, we, by understanding what the commission was doing, we got a, almost a three-month head start on getting going again. 
The fourth major recommendation has to do with NASA's safety organization. And although safety and reliability and quality assurance is not my personal responsibility within the agency, I am vitally concerned about this activity, and I pledge to work closely and do what I can to strengthen this most important element of our program. The shuttle program does perform many of the activities that relate to program safety, and all of these are under our review. Each person in the agency has an obligation to put safety first, and this will be reiterated many times over the next months. I intend to ensure that the management structure and its system is modified so that reporting requirements are clearly defined and rigidly enforced, and management at all levels is informed of all significant issues and their status. The fifth major recommendation has to do with improved communications within our system. I personally think that this recommendation may be the most important work of the Presidential Commission. It applies not to one part of our system, to, but to all of our people and our organizations. And as a part of our review, both internal and external communication will be given a primary consideration. This activity will include the Marshall Space Flight Center and all of the other shuttle program organizations and centers and will ensure that the specific recommendations of the Commission will be considered. Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, depart just for a moment from my prepared statement and tell you that, that of all the recommendations in the Commission's report, the, the two that I had not formally moved out on, until, and purposely so, until the report was uh, in our hands, had to do with the, uh, the assessment of uh, program management and communication. But now that we have that report, I feel it is time to move out. Uh, I have asked uh, Captain Bob Crippen, who has uh, completed his work at the Kennedy Space Center as uh, a full-time member of our task force since the Challenger accident, to uh, head a small group which will, will uh, report to me and, to, and examine the overall shuttle program management and where changes to existing organization or lines of uh, authority are deemed appropriate, this group will recommend solutions and options to myself and to Dr. Fletcher. Well, the gentleman, uh, hold that. Oh, and I think it would be profitable because we have a continuity I don't want to lose. Yes, sir. And I see we've been called to the floor, so why don't the members take the next 10 minutes, we'll recess, go to the floor and vote, and please return as quickly as possible because we're going to, con we're going to continue our work within 10 minutes. I want to keep your continuity going. Yes, sir. I think Thank you have to reiterate this part so that it's clear what you're trying Thank to get you, across. Sir. We'll recess for 10 minutes to vote and then return. You got some water there, Richard? Well done right. so far. You might want to ask Bob. Attention and reconvene. When we uh, broke up for the vote, we were hearing from Admiral Truly and you are adding some added information in reference to the communications uh, methodology and management. So maybe it would be best if you recap that for us again so we don't lose yes, the continuity. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, as I was saying, the, uh, there are two recommendations in the Commission's report. The fifth recommendation, which has to do with uh, improved communication, and the second recommendation, which is the program management structure review, <clears throat> and in each of those, I had elected not to take uh, a, a firm action on and since, number one, we had the time, and, and number two, I wanted to be sure that we had the commission report in our hands uh, so that uh, the action would be appropriate. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Captain Bob Crippen, who has been uh, stationed at the Cape since the accident and been a part of the task force, is being uh, called to headquarters for a period of time to head a small group which will examine the overall shuttle program management. And where changes to the, our existing organizational lines of authority are deemed appropriate, this group will uh, recommend so solutions for approval. Uh, I'd like to quote from my from my memorandum of, on this subject from March 24th. The National Space Transportation Program Management philosophy, structure, reporting channels, and decision-making process will be thoroughly reviewed and those changes implemented which uh, are required to assure confidence and safety 
in the overall program, including the commit to launch process. Uh, Captain Crippen's group will review the findings uh, and conclusions of the Rogers Commission. As a matter of fact, that's the first chore that they will have to do is to go through this entire report with a fine-tooth uh, comb. Are you reading from that uh, memorandum now, Admiral Truly? No, sir. We're just referring to it. No, sir. I'm just referring to it. All right. Yes, well, sir. why don't we why don't we move to make that a part of the record at this point? There's no yes, objection, sir. so ordered. Thank yeah. you, sir. The uh, uh, Captain Crippen's group will be a small one, uh, and he will. But however, during his uh, work, he will uh, visit with uh, people inside and outside of the uh, shuttle program. Uh, including former NASA managers, uh, such as uh, former associate administrators, uh, center directors, and people entirely outside of uh, NASA. Uh, after discussing this at some length with uh, Dr. Fletcher, I think that uh, Crip is, a, uh, is an ideal choice for this assignment. He's the commander of four space shuttle flights. He's had extensive experience in sev several uh, NASA programs, including the shuttle. And uh, I look forward to uh, having uh, him to give me a hand in this most critical area. And if I could, if I could introduce uh, Crip to, to your committee, I would appreciate the opportunity to do so. <clears throat> to return to the uh, specific recommendations of the Rogers Commission, the sixth recommendation has to do with landing safety, which I've had uh, a a uh, work to do with for quite a while because landing safety has been a significant concern of our program since the 1970s during the approach and landing tests which I flew uh, using the Space Shuttle Enterprise. We're going to review all of the shuttle hardware and systems and design reviews for, to ensure compliance with specifications and our concern for safety. Tires, brakes, and nose wheel sy systems are included in this activity and I want to tell you that funding for new carbon brakes has already been approved by me. Tire and brake testing is uh, continuing and scheduled for uh, this summer. KSC uh, runway surface testing has been underway for some time prior to the accident and is continuing. We're looking uh, at better methods of weather forecasting and weather-related support for the, uh, for the Kennedy uh, complex specifically. And as you know, the potential for increased landings at Edwards Air Force Base uh, was recognized prior to the accident, and frankly, that will be a dominant factor in our schedule as we return to flight status. We're also going to look very hard at the need for a dual ferry capability for the system, and uh, we will consider that uh, and, be, uh, and decide uh, when to come forward to, to you for your support. The seventh major recommendation has to do with launch abort and crew escape. Uh, as the uh, commission noted in its report, crew escape was not possible during the, in the uh, 51L accident. It has been looked at numerous times in the past. Nevertheless, uh, prior to the report being issued, we have uh, started, or Arnie Aldrich in Houston has started a comprehensive as crew egress and escape review. We're looking at our capabilities of escape of, uh, throughout launch and uh, the landing environment. And uh, we are re-looking at, at all those uh, possibilities that we've looked at before. We're going to continue to do that. The study is already in progress. And uh, we're looking further at uh, all those things such as launch commit criteria, flight rules, range safety systems, runway configurations and links, and all those complex things that go into the equation. The bottom line is, is we are re-reviewing and we desperately want to provide the best and possible margin of safety for our vehicle and our crew. The uh, eighth recommendation of the Rogers Commission has to do with flight rate. We've already taken some action on this. Uh, we are participating with other governmental agencies in a comprehensive review of our nation's ability to assure access to space. I want you to know that I personally concur with the mixed fleet, fleet concept of void reliance on a single vehicle for our nation. Mm. Development of a NASA flight rate which maximizes safety dictates that we fly at a rate consistent with our resources. And I intend to develop a schedule that achieves such a rate. Within my office is the responsibility 
for payload assignment and for manifesting. And I can assure you that our manifesting procedures that are noted in the Commission's report, for example, late changes and et cetera, that require uh, additional work uh, in, in our mission planning organization are, underneath, are under my personal review. And I intend to change those procedures if they are required to be cha uh, changed, but more importantly, uh, assure that we have the discipline to reduce the late changes which cause such an upheaval in the flight planning uh, process. The ninth and final major uh, recommendation of the Commission's report has to do with maintenance uh, safeguards. We are reviewing our maintenance philosophy and its implementation, particularly with regard to our spares inventory. This has been uh, under review since shortly following the accident, and I want to tell you that the results of this activity will be combined with the uh, results of our safety and reliability and quality assurance review to make sure that we have an overall plan for vehicle processing and maintenance, trend analysis uh, using flight data, uh, good structural inspections and, and uh, adequate spare parts. Mr. Chairman, I came to this job in the weeks following this tragic accident with the resolve and the duty to assist the Presidential Commission in finding the cause. The Commission has done their work. I embrace their report and believe that I have set into motion the initial steps to return the Space Shuttle to safe and effective flight. Their report is a road map for me, and I intend to use it as my mandate for action. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before your committee today for NASA needs your support and guidance as our nation returns to space flight. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if possible, uh, I would like to uh, invite Captain Crippen and uh, Mr. Aldrich to the table to assist good, if yeah. there are questions that committee members have that they uh, that they uh, could help us uh, answer. Yeah, why don't we do that right now? That's a good idea. Thank so you, if the Captain Crip and the others will come up to the table. The, um, before we go into the question period, for the, again, for the benefit of the members of the uh, committee, the team, the support task force teams that both Dr. Fletcher and Admiral Truly spoke to uh, during their testimony will be visiting with us, uh, I think, this afternoon and tomorrow particularly so that they will have the, tomorrow I believe it is, they will have the opportunity in view of the fact that they were a bridge or a catalyst between the agency and the commission, will have a chance to uh, review their work and question their work in any part and piece that we might be specifically interested in. I think that's going to be profitable tomorrow. So I think some of those points that will be made can be best handled at that point. Uh, I have a couple of specific questions that I would like to ask, but I'm going to defer now to our distinguished chairman uh, the distinguished representative of Florida, Mr. Don Fuqua. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Dr. Fletcher, you mentioned uh, in your prepared statement about the relationship between Congress and NASA. And I noticed that while fingers are being pointed, it's uh, pointed at Congress. And I think probably we should share our blame, share the blame. But uh, I might point out those who have said that we were too cozy with NASA, uh, I think need to look at the record. Uh, and maybe you are familiar with that from your days prior in, in NASA, that uh, I think when you look at the record, and particularly the, the gentlemen that uh, have uh, served in the last number of years as chairman of that subcommittee, uh, at the number of days of hearings that they hold in extreme detail of the NASA budget and the questions that are asked, but not only that, but the field trips that are made to the NASA centers and, uh, and even the contractors for that matter, to try to get a better grasp and ask questions about what's, what's going on. Uh, so I would like to, to, not in a defensive manner, but to say that, uh, check the record uh, before you start saying that. I, if uh, maybe some of us are guilty of being supporters of the space program, and I plead guilty, but that doesn't mean that we have always agreed, uh, and you even mentioned sometime with a skeptical view of some of the decisions that NASA has made, and there hasn't always been unanimity of agreement uh, in, in all of the things that have, that have taken place. Sometimes NASA hasn't liked the way we've redistributed money, and uh, sometimes we have not agreed with the way NASA proposed to spend the, the money. But I think if you also look back, you'll find that never, that I recall, 
If we've ever reduced money for flight training and operations and safety during the course that I can remember. We have ch made other changes. Maybe you can uh, elaborate from, from uh, your memory, uh, which uh, is probably hazy like mine is when, when you were serving before, but uh, uh, I think we have tried to work as, and support and be proponents of a space program. I think it's very important to the nation. Uh, but uh, I think uh, those that, that say that uh, need to go back and check the hearing records and so forth. I think they'll come away with a somewhat a different uh, perspective about that. Mr. Chairman, uh, you, you're absolutely right. Over the years that I remember it also, I've followed uh, NASA years since then in some detail. This is the uh, perhaps the most thorough and uh, most critical uh, oversight group uh, of any that uh, NASA deals with in Congress, although Congress as a whole has provided uh, plenty of oversight. On the other hand, having said that, they've been supportive of us when we were doing the right thing and critical of us when we were doing the wrong thing. I, I want to mention to uh, Admiral Truly, I noticed you were talking about uh, the landings, safer landing in uh, your uh, uh, <clears throat> report, landing safety. Uh, and in addition to the, the tires, brakes, and nose wheel systems, uh, I've and even uh, two days before, uh, matter of fact, on January the 26th, I had a conversation with uh, then Acting Director Graham about the possibility of an installation of a Doppler radar system in the KSC area that could be used for more instant uh, weather prediction. Is that included in your plans to pursue that? They're planning to put one in Florida uh, and this would be an excellent test or demonstration facility located in that area to give more accurate uh, weather prediction might, for launch and landing. Might ask uh, Arnie to, to come in. He may know a, a little more about what, where we are there, but I can assure you we are looking at advanced way, uh, weather uh, forecasting uh, capability down there. and We're also uh, looking at some of our own internal NASA work uh, out at the uh, Ames Research Center on advanced uh, 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 systems. Uh, and uh, we're determined to, uh, as, as you know, uh, we've stood down on that Cape runway many times and watched the weather change. And it's, a, it's been a concern to me and to the crew uh, a number of times. And uh, we intend to improve our capability during this downtime. Ernie, could you elaborate it on? Uh, yes, Mr. Fuquay. Mr. Fuquay, uh, uh, that system is under investigation both for application in Florida and on the west coast at Vandenberg, where it would be particularly useful for the kind of conditions there. In addition, we're also uh, proceeding with augmentation of the worldwide capability for weather reporting and analysis in the, at the Johnson Space Center in Houston to advance our capabilities and coverage. So we're, we're looking at all of the ideas we know to make our weather forecasting as up to date and as capable as possible for the future. Well, I would highly recommend that that, uh, that be pursued. I, uh, we are moving into some demonstration projects of the Doppler radar system, and I think uh, it can not only serve as an excellent demonstration area, but also serve a very valuable purpose in our, in our space program. Another point that you mentioned, uh, Admiral, truly was uh, spare parts. I know every year this committee has added additional money in for spare parts. We've had to twist nose, kick, scream, to get NASA to use it, and most times they have not used it for spare parts as it was intended. I was told by uh, one of the persons I shall not name uh, that they had pirated one of the uh, spaceships so much uh, that he could carry it in his suitcase, what was left of it. Uh, and I don't think that's good policy when we do that, and I'm glad that the Commission uh, made specific note of that in their recommendations, and I'm glad to see that uh, that NASA is getting the uh, proper attention, and I might point out this all happened before you came on board, so I'm not directing this at you, but I just want to, while you and Dr. Fletcher are here, express my concern uh, that spare part money that we have put in, have never asked for, uh, the, the committee put in, uh, was never spent in the proper fashion that we had, had directed it to be. And uh, that caused a lot of pirating of one vehicle to another vehicle, and uh, I, I'm glad that the commission noted that, and that is not, uh, in my view, a, a very good way. I'm glad the commission realized it, and I hope that, and I'm glad to see you make that point in your statement. Thank, thank you, Mr. Fuquay. The, uh, 
Uh, again, Arnie has been dealing uh, directly with this problem for some time. Frankly, I'm, uh, I'm, I am concerned about this, and I'm looking forward to having the, the time and the opportunity uh, to uh, really get with, uh, with Arnie and look over this whole problem. I'm a little puzzled by it, frankly. Uh, uh, my concept of spare parts is not people working on spare parts, but spare parts in the bins to support our airplanes and, and in this case, the shuttle. Uh, but uh, I can assure you that during our downtime, we're going to take a hard look at it and uh, make sure that the flight rates that we, that we build up to after this accident are supportable by the logistics system that we have in place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have to leave at 11, I believe, do you not? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it's about 10 minutes of 11. Well, yeah. well, we got a few minutes here. I, but I, I, I think um, I wanted to, well, we'll pick it up later. Let me suggest the following. I think to set the stage here, bo both the Dr. Fletcher's testimony, which I think was a reaffirmation and a first real good strong policy position you have presented so far and I think you've done a splendid job as to where you wanted to go Mr. from there. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, would, would you yield for just a moment? I think it would be productive if we alternated going to vote and keep the hearing going. Well, that's on. exactly what we're going to I do. I apologize. So therefore, what I'm, where I'm coming from, I think you've set that stage. The second point is that uh, Admiral Truly has uh, expanded further, which was our natural question is, what have you done under Dr. Fletcher's direction? What have you done now to already go ahead and implement, not waiting for further you know, elucidations to come from the commission because they've made a number of very uh, solid recommendations and you have now brought us up to date as to what you're doing in that direction, as I understand your testimony. Let me ask you a question. It wasn't clear uh, to me, and I think we ought to get it on the record, uh, I think you developed it more firmly, Admiral Truly, that we were going to follow, NASA will follow the recommendations, all the recommendations of the commission. Is that the committee's understanding? Is that the statement that's being made? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we will certainly study all the recommendations, and I see no reason that uh, nearly all of them can't be followed in detail. But as you recall, some of the recommendations said consider certain things. We will certainly consider them in great depth. They did not say do certain things. I understand things. that. But I want to get on the record because that's the beginning point. We will certainly deal with all of the recommendations and uh, have a report for you in a timely fashion. And we'll be going to be asking for that so that for the following point, is there any recommendations that have been presented that you seriously from a managed point of view, management point of view, uh, would question at this point? Uh, in their recommendations. Anything that they have presented you don't think is the right direction to go. I think that's a fair statement to ask at this point. I think uh, all of the recommendations are things that uh, are proper recommendations and we should seriously uh, consider them. I think, I don't know any of them are not uh, worth considering or even maybe the right way to go. Okay. I just want to get that on the record. So as far as we're concerned, the as far as you're concerned, the recommendations that have been made will be reviewed and toto and someplace along the line as the committee calls back for an overview of what you're doing in those recommendations, you'll be able to give us a better uh, idea as to what the substance will be and where we would go from there. Is that That's correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Let me clarify for the record another point. It seems to me that the fundamental upfront issue is the safety issue, which you both spoke to eloquently, and that is <clears throat> first and foremost in your minds, in your administrative approach, as it is as far as this committee is concerned. And then uh, Admiral Truly spoke to the issue as far as the critical list, the CR1 and the CR1R items were concerned. And again, to reiterate for the record, is it my understanding, the understanding from your testimony, that you're saying that all of those critical items will be review, reviewed individually? That's correct. Every, totally. Every single one, and not just those on the solid rocket motor, but on all the elements of the system. And is, is it the intent to have the process, and I notice you've, you've, weighed, you've, you've abrogated all waivers, so that everything will be looked at, and they'll be recertified, each and every critical item on the list. Is that a correct that understanding? That is correct, and as a matter of fact, that process had been set in work by uh, Arnie Aldrich uh, even before uh, I uh, issued the memorandum that, we, that was discussed in my testimony. 
but uh, when, I, when I did issue the memorandum that uh, charted a course for us to safely get back to flight, that was a major part of it, and you're exactly right. Every single CRIT-1 and 1R element of the, or specific uh, element of the shuttle system is uh, being re-looked at, and if it's found wanting, it'll be redesigned and re-qualified prior to the next flight. And therefore, our first and foremost observation, the first point of management is safety, and that's the direction in which you intend to go, which leads mm -hmm. me to my final question on safety. In part of Admiral Truly's testimony on page two on the bottom, safety organization, you mentioned that although safety responsibility and quality assurance is not my direct responsibility, I'm vitally concerned about these activities and pledge to work closely and do what I can to strengthen. It would seem to me, regardless of what the chain of command is or the specific assignment, that safety, number one, goes fundamentally to Dr. Fletcher and then secondly to you, whether it's a direct responsibility or not. So could we clarify that for the record? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, the responsibility for RNQA, as you know, reports to the administrator of NASA, but that and we, we will make that study for all of NASA. Having said that, however, uh, I don't think it should be uh, uh, said minimally that Admiral Truly is going to take a very hard look at RNQA for the shuttle program. And well, I don't think he meant to imply that he was not going to do that's that. That's why I want to get it clarified. And I yes. think the relationship between yourself and Admiral Truly mm -hmm. uh, being one of your appointees is critically important that there's no breach in the safety communications point that you oh, are making. No. So the, that is not what the intent, and there will be a very close liaison there so we understand that. Let me ask one more question. You spoke of General Phillips uh, being assigned Dr. Fletcher to handle the, to review all aspects of the NASA program management in their internal shuttle overview. That indicates to me is not General Phillips is, was formally with NASA and then left, and is he coming? You called him back again? Is that what? Uh, General just Phillips, uh, Mr. Chairman, has been gone from NASA since the days of the Apollo program, I okay. believe, in 1969 or 70, and has been with the uh, TRW and has just retired as a group vice president. Uh, like a lot of folks uh, that were anxious to help NASA get back on its feet, uh, he, he agreed to come back almost full time and pursue this assignment. Uh, this assignment, as you properly indicated, is to look at the overall management uh, structure of NASA, uh, which uh, impacts uh, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly on the, on the shuttle management program. Having said that, however, uh, uh, Admiral Truly again will look at the management structure and the communications and the procedures for the space shuttle program as part of his assignment, and I suspect that's one of the things that. Well, uh, what I'm leading up to, to, would it be profitable, and we don't have to make that decision now or whatever, but I'd like you to consider one point. Um, sometimes when we're cleaning our own house, we can't see what's in the corner simply because we're used to seeing it. And it seems to me that we are bringing an eternal and no affrontery, whatever, because General Phillips has an extraordinary, wonderful reputation. I don't mean that at all. But would it be profitable for the agency to also consider looking to the private management groups for re-review from an outside point of view? In other words, if we're just going to review internally what happened to us, even though there's added expertise that General Phillips brings, would it not be a good idea to give some consideration to overviewing this whole operation with some outside consulting private management groups from the universities and so forth? Mr. Chairman, uh, when I said General Phillips was uh, heading that effort, he has a series of consultants from all over the country uh, involved with him uh, making that review, all of whom are outside of the NASA organization. Splendid. Could you, for then, Dr. Fletcher, for the record, could you give us a little update response on that, a little bit of a broader view of what the General Phillips will be doing, and also that we have these different uh, experts and expertise throughout the country, from universities and so forth, helping us to make this in-depth, solid review. I think it will help a great deal in credibility. We'll supply that for the record, Mr. Right. Chairman. Those are the questions I want to ask at this point. Now, who's next? I guess I'm about the only one left. Suppose we uh, take 10 minutes while I go do my duty and vote, and then we'll reconvene. You will be leaving us, but then you will return immediately thereafter. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Because I know there's a number of questions the members want to ask you. We will recess for 10 minutes.
I hope what I said didn't agree with anything you plan to do today. <laughs> And then he'll return, and uh, Admiral Truly is leading this team. Therefore, I have concluded my first uh, group of questions, and I defer to the distinguished uh, minority leader from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Admiral, let me tell you, I'm sorry that uh, uh, Dr. Fletcher left, but I, I'm real pleased with, with the direction of, of NASA. As you know, uh, many of us were concerned uh, about uh, what the attitude would, would be to accept those changes that, that need to be done, uh, the fact that there were some, some errors, and let's move on to, uh, uh, to fix them. Uh, at the beginning, it, it appeared like NASA was rather defensive, and, and in that mode, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to make the changes if you don't recognize that something that something was wrong so I, I'm real pleased to see uh, uh, your statements and, and the administrator's statements uh, moving in the in a positive direction and saying let's let's uh, uh, let's go I, I think perhaps we may have some little problem on on down the line and it's necessary that management uh, uh, impart that feeling on you know all the way through uh, uh, through NASA, but I think that's that's moving uh, pretty good. Let me uh, ask you, uh, particularly in, in the terms of, of your testimony on, on uh, improved communications, both uh, the commission and uh, your statement uh, um, mention in that in the communications context, uh, uh, Marshall, uh, not in any specific way, but you always, everybody kind of alludes to Marshall when communications problems are, are, uh, are discussed. Is that the, the basic problem, is Marshall the, the basic problem as, as NASA sees it in the, in this whole thing of communicating information up and down uh, the line? I notice that uh, the commission says, talks about the tendency at Marshall to management uh, isolation. I'd like to pursue that a, a little bit with you, Admiral, if I may. Yes, sir. Uh, I, w I would answer that question in, in two ways, looking backward and, and, and forward. Uh, we had a terrible accident, and uh, it was a part of the shuttle system that the Marshall Space Flight Center was responsible for and they've uh, and they have been under a terrific amount of uh, criticism uh, in the report and throughout the investigation uh, and the reason that I mentioned the Marshall Space Flight Center in my testimony was because uh, because of the way the Commission had written uh, that particular recommendation but in looking forward I would I would answer that question is absolutely uh, not. Uh, communication through the system, through our flight readiness reviews and our L-1 reviews and our, our, uh, require, our change control boards and so forth has got to be uh, looked at and it's not a Marshall Space Flight Center problem. It's a problem that starts in my office and goes right down to the crews once they're in orbit. Uh, it's throughout the system. I don't intend and I don't uh, I know that uh, Captain Crippen, when he looks at the program relationships that are required to be uh, looked at, is uh, not going to, uh, to uh, look at the Marshall Space Flight Center any more or any less than the others. We have had problems. Uh, we did have a terrific communications problem on this launch, uh, and I think in the launch is preceded, and it's, co it's covered in great detail in that report. But as we look forward, uh, we're going to look through our entire system, just, just as in the hardware. We're looking not, not only at the solid rocket motor, but in, in uh, all of the uh, hardware that's aboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, okay. if, if that helps you, sir. Yes, I uh, it, it just, in reading the reports and in reading all of the different things, it just appeared to me like Marshall uh, uh, 
uh, was in need of some special special attention, uh, but that's not uh, the way you look at it. Is that uh, is that correct? No, I do think uh, no. I think uh, as we look at it uh, in the future, I envision a uh, a program management of the shuttle program that flows uh, from. Uh, just, the, just the way the paper uh, says it uh, flows, and that is from me at level one through Mr. Aldrich at level two, and then to any level three program uh, uh, office, whether it be at Marshall or at Johnson. Uh, and and uh, whatever the problems have been in the past, that's the way the program is going to work in the future. Uh, okay, we, we'll be looking anyway at, at the additional reports of the, of the commission and follow through, you know, where those where those uh, bugaboos uh, occurred. Uh, let me, one other thing that kind of stood out in this, in this whole process, uh, as far as I concer I'm concerned, is the question of uh, critical items. Uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know if I misunderstood or, or what, that under criticality one, you have some 746 or 748 items, which means any of those could cause the loss of the shuttle, the cause of life, and, and all of those things, very serious things. It's impossible to assess 746 uh, uh, items uh, without going back and saying, okay, we've got to assign that out of those 746, what are the probabilities of accident, and what is the severity? Is am I correct in 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 that uh, in my analysis of that? Or no, I don't. I don't think you are. I think that uh, even though uh, the number is large, and I, I think uh, Mr. Aldrich could comment better than I because he's running that review. Even though the number is large, it's finite. The space program is used to dealing with extremely complex uh, designs. Uh, and uh, I, I would disagree that uh, we cannot take each of those one by one. We have a great advantage now, although we uh, have a mountain of work to do, we have a great advantage to looking at those items now because we have had 24 successful flights and we have a lot of flight data on those critical items. And uh, so we can look at the histories of each one. It takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of time, it's not going to be quick. We're looking at the ones that, uh, and there are some that, that uh, we were concerned about before the accident, uh, and those are the ones we're looking at first because they're the most likely ones that we might have to make a change to. But uh, before we fly again, we will have looked at every last one, and I, I would disagree that we cannot do that. I'm, I'm sure we can. Chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Scheuer. Mr. Scheuer from New York. Uh, Admiral Truly, uh, you were on the second uh, shuttle which experienced the worst O-ring uh, erosion of any uh, field joint in the history of the shuttle program, I believe. In fact, it's ironic, it seems to me, that the erosion on the second shuttle occurred on the same right aft field joint, as, uh, which is the same joint that caused the Challenger accident. Uh, prior to the Challenger accident, the tragic accident in the investigation, had you been informed by NASA management about the O-ring erosion on the second shuttle and other shuttles? No, sir. Well, how do you feel in retrospect? Having uh, flown other shuttle missions without having been informed by NASA of this known, demonstrably evident life-threatening condition on those shuttles. How do you feel having been sent up in the air on this extraordinarily dangerous mission abs without having vital information about the safety of the flight, the crew, the mission that uh, was there at NASA headquarters, was there in Marshall headquarters? I, I think that this, uh, the, our investigation uh, in this report clearly shows that the, uh, that uh, the failure of communication of that problem uh, or, the, or the proper recogn recognition of it uh, was a major failure and led to the cause of the accident. And uh, I, frankly, personally, I'm, I'm more concerned, not that I as a 
astronaut did not know, uh, but that the program, the total program through the level three, then to the level two, then to the level one, uh, didn't work the, uh, that problem for that flight and others. I, uh, when I was in the astronaut office, I, uh, I, I frankly uh, felt, and I do today, that the astronauts themselves uh, uh, deserve to be uh, involved in those issues that are critical and are being worked. But I'm much uh, more worried that the issue didn't get work in the program than I was that I personally didn't know about it. Well, I totally agree with you, but don't you think if you and other flight crew members had known of the existence of that problem, you would have made damn well sure that it had been worked on and solved before the next sh uh, shuttle event, whether yes. you were on that shuttle or not. Wouldn't yes. it have had a mighty prophylactic effect? Uh, I don't wish to embarrass you at all. Uh, no. But I, wouldn't, isn't this the greatest assurance to the public and to the Congress and to even NASA officials themselves is full and complete knowledge by the uh, shuttle team on every aspect of the program where their own lives and safety are involved, they would uh, insist on proper, prudent steps being taken. They're all risk takers. You're a risk taker. Of course you are. But you're a prudent risk taker. Uh, they yes, say we should have known. In, in, in answer to question, uh, we should have known before us knowing, the way we should have known is that it should have been worked as a uh, major technical problem <coughs> on the top of the table uh, with everybody uh, uh, concerned. And, uh, and uh, if, if it had, I'm sure we would have corrected it much. Uh, we, we would have corrected the problem. It would have been corrected, would it not? Uh, after the second shuttle, when it first appeared, it would have been corrected before the third shuttle. You wouldn't have launched the third well, shuttle. Well, that, that, that would be speculation on my part. I, I, uh, if you go back to that flight and, uh, and looked at that particular incident, what the decision would have been, I, I don't know. But I do know that if it had been uh, worked properly earlier, I believe this accident could have been avoided. If you had been a member of the crew on the third shuttle, and you knew of the existence of the O-ring failure on the second shuttle, would you have acquiesced in that, uh, in all signals are go and a launch, a green light on the launch until they had solved that, until you were assured they had solved that problem of the O-ring failure? If I uh, had known then what I know now, we would have stopped, uh, I think the proper thing would have been stop the program and fix the problem. At, after the second shuttle when the O-ring failure was evident? Whenever the, uh, whenever the joint design right. uh, proved that it was not working as it right. was intended. Right. So, in other words, this is not just a failure of communication. This is a failure of decision making. Isn't that evident? It's not just that the information didn't filter to the decision makers. It did. But they didn't act on it. They permitted the, the shuttle crew to take what we all see in retrospect as unacceptable risks. Wouldn't you think that's a reasonable conclusion? And that's I think, what we want I think to avoid. somewhere in the many, in the in the various levels of program management, there was a failure in decision making and in communication. Fine. Let me go ahead. Between 1980 and 1985, NASA and the Air Force commissioned three uh, studies predicting the probability of failure of the shuttle. Two of these three studies predicted uh, that a booster failure was likely before all of the 500 manned missions were completed. The Sierra study indicated a, an estimated failure rate of 1 in 70, and the Sandia National Laboratory study indicated a failure rate of 1 in 210. There was another one that indicated 1 in 1,000. In but then by some process of ratiocination that I don't understand, the NASA headquarters came up with a failure prediction rate of 1 in 100,000, which was 100 times more optimistic than the most optimistic of these three studies that NASA and the Air Force commissioned. Didn't the, these three studies, two of which indicated failure before the end of the series of manned uh, shuttle flights, didn't they sort of send up an early warning signal to some of you, uh, even, totally apart from this wildly optimistic of 100,000 uh, 100, to one estimate of NASA? And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with any of those uh, studies and, uh, and just can't comment because I'm, I'm not, perhaps. All right. 
perhaps Mr. Aldrich might be familiar, but I, I'm not. <laughs> would would uh, Mr. Fletcher be familiar with uh, the history of these predicted failure rates? I don't know, sir. Pardon? NASA and the Air Will, Force. Will uh, the gentleman yield for a moment? Who, sure. uh, I know you've done quite some research on this. These studies were commissioned by NASA. By NASA and the Air Force, three of them. One that came in with one, chan one, uh, one, one failure out of 70. One came in with one failure out of 210. The third came in with one failure out of 1,000. Well, and on top of these, NASA predicted one failure out of 100,000. Which was 100 well, we, times more optimistic well, well, the than the most optimistic further. of the three. I, I think that the gentleman, if you yield further, is striking upon an extremely important nagging point that every member of this committee, without exception, is concerned about, is that how could there possibly be 14 incidents, as we understand the, the, the issues involved, with some kind of a problem relating to those O-rings, and nothing was given exigency to immediately get at that. I think that's where the gentleman's coming from. Yes, and I'd like now, to know, can I just was, was, was the shuttle designed, yep. each of the components designed, to achieve a probability of success in 999,999 cases out of 100,000? Would the gentleman, if the gentleman would And I'd further, also like to ask them at some point in time, what do they consider a reasonable uh, expected yeah. predicted failure rate. I think that Congress ought to know what they I understand. think is but an acceptable deal, failure I, rate. Because of we, I, I don't want to lose this train of thought because I think you're in a very important one. Yeah. We would, uh, we're going to be breaking sometime, someplace around 1230. We would like to be able to give you the information that Mr. Scheuer speaks to vis-a-vis -vis these two or three studies that were commissioned by, um, what do you call it, NASA. And did that go to the chief engineer? What happened? And how come we don't know about that? And I don't mean that unfairly or unkindly. In other words, why don't we add, oh, here's, an, here's an example. And, and again, it, it, I know we're coming back, being called back. We have new people involved. But we don't know that those were commissioned. What did they say and what did they do? So I would suggest to the gentleman from New York, if he will, that we uh, will. The gentleman will yield. Yes, of course. The, uh, those were studies that were commissioned by the Department of Energy okay. in relation to a uh, uh, power system called the RTG uh, that would be used in some upper stages. I don't remember exactly when they came back, but they were also commissioned for the president's uh, uh, evaluation of approval of those uh, uh, launches. It was not commissioned by NASA. It wasn't commissioned by the Air Force, to my understanding. It was commissioned by the Department well, of Energy. Where the chair is, and I, I respect the gentleman's enormous background and knowledge, is where the chair is coming from, we are going to get as we unfold our efforts and energies over the next three or four weeks, we're going to get people making statements and different presentations that are made that we have to deal with up front for the legitimacy of that particular question. And I think that's where the chairman's coming from. What I'm simply suggesting in the line of questioning that Mr. Scheuer is pursuing, that we ought to look into those facts, check with your chief engineer so we can elucidate as no. the chairman's done. So we can, what we're trying to do here is establish the facts as they are, not hypothetical, what may have happened, what are the facts? That's what we've got to get at, and this is one of those issues that we have to deal with. Sir. Is that fair commentary? And we'll take this matter up first. I thank the chairman. The chair now recognizes the distinguished uh, gentlelady from Rhode Island, Ms. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Truly, I'd like to focus on uh, some of NASA's supervision of quality control and, and safety concerns that have come into question. Specifically, I'd like to focus on the elements of personnel and also of uh, procedures. Uh, in one of the reports I was looking at here, it says that the number of quality assurance personnel dropped from 1,689 people in 1970 to 505 people in 1985, which is a 71% decrease in the number of people who are responsible for quality control. And last October, an Air Force study had indicated that they found a shortage of engineers and technicians, so much so that it led to an average of 2,200 work requirements by ground processing personnel that had not been dealt with, and that only of all of those requirements, only 26% of them were scheduled for work. Now, my question to you is, uh, are we reaching a conclusion that perhaps Part of the reason for, for the accident was a deficiency in, in not only workmanship but also oversight. 
Uh, due to the fact that there were not enough personnel involved to do the kinds of checking and double checking that should have been done? Uh, if, if I might respond first with a, uh, a comment and then get to your question. The, uh, the numbers that you referred to, I believe, have been uh, uh, corrected by uh, the chief engineer, uh, Mr. Mr. Silvera, which I can provide for you for the record. However, that is not to, uh, to say that quality assurance and safety and reliability of that program in NASA was not a major fo focus of the Commission's uh, recommendation. Uh, recommendations and and uh, as I said in my statement I can assure you that uh, that I will personally uh, join that effort to take a look throughout the agency and particularly in my responsibility throughout the space shuttle program to make sure we have the right kind of people on the job in answer specifically to your question uh, I think that that was a uh, something that the Commission discovered in its investigation and was not a direct cause of this accident well, but, it is, but it is something that was uncovered, uh, and, and I'm sorry there was some confusion on the, on the numbers that came public, and, uh, and we should straighten those facts out for you. Uh, but I don't think it was a direct cause of the accident, and it was something that the Commission ran into. It's something we should fix, and, we're, and we will do that. So what you're suggesting is that there are <clears throat> an adequate number of personnel available for monitoring and quality control supervision? I can't say that. I, I have not had the opportunity personally to go through the, uh, the, the sorts of detail. What, we, what the chief engineer and, uh, uh, is going to have to do is to go through all of our contractors, look at, uh, look at what industry standards are for, for systems that are complex like this, make sure that not only we have the right numbers but the right kind of trained people. We have the right sort of uh, uh, supervision and, uh, and look at it from, from the top of NASA. That's what the commission recommended, and I'm, uh, and I'm sure that is precisely what we're going to do. Well, well I'd be happy to yield, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think for clarity for the record, the gentlelady is striking on a very important point, and if I can relate her question back to the earlier comments that Admiral truly made in his presentation. And we did pursue that. We came back and said that one of the key critical issues that um, NASA had to do was to investigate and inspect all of the critical items that were involved, of the 700 and some odd items that were involved. The logical question that the lady is asking, I believe, or our colleague is asking, is that do, what is that going to take to do that? Is numer and you yourself made the point of view that there was an extensive number of people that would be involved. And then our legitimate follow-up question, if the lady would yield further, our gentle lady and colleague would yield further, is that is NASA going to use their people, quality assurance people, to review and inspect these critical parts? Or are they going to use outsiders or a combination of, of, of both? How do we get the assurance that you have enough personnel? What process will you be following, as I understand the basic question? Is that yes. a fair analysis That's of the question? Yep. That's the question I think she's asked. <laughs> I, I agree that is the question, and that is precisely, uh, that is precisely the uh, study that needs to be looked at uh, to determine where we are in the uh, uh, quality assurance area. Uh, within the Office of Space Flight, the, uh, I, I have looked at uh, the, just the numbers. I have not had an opportunity yet to, uh, and, uh, to uh, put my name behind the report because I, I just, I've just seen them. But I know at uh, two of our major contractors, uh, the, the numbers of quality assurance personnel on the job uh, appear to be uh, quite, at, quite adequate at, at Rocket well, Down with the main <coughs> engines and, and also uh, uh, the numbers that I've seen at uh, the Rockwell plant. The numbers have changed over the years uh, because we have been out of production. You need more quality people when you're producing hardware. Uh, but we're going to... Well, the gentleman would yield further. Yes. I think it would be profitable by tomorrow if we could respond to this question as to some thought process you may have developed or your people will think about in the following direction. The question before us is the deepest of concern and the paramount issue of safety. I think we all agree to that. The second point that the 
gentlelady is asking is that it, in order to ensure that issue in the first step as far as technological, technological hardware is concerned, you and your colleagues have testified that there, up front on priority number one is to get your inspection and reassurance you've canceled the waiver positions on the critical items and those are all going to be gone through again because the question was asked by other members that some of those critical all those critical items in effect if they were devoid or defective could create a problem and a serious one that's the question now the second question we're asking there was some question as to whether or not the contractors alone should be the one who do the quality assurance as working for NASA or does NASA consider the issue to be important enough and serious enough to have their own cadre of expertise to double check on the contractors, particularly looking at part of the testimony that was given yesterday where they came back and said one of the contractors did not perform their contract within the ambient levels that they had to perform it into. So what we're simply want to nail down, if I'm correct for the gentlelady, is nail down the point of view as to what process is NASA going to invoke to be able to review the critical list to improve the quality assurance issue, will you rely more upon NASA personnel directly working for you, the government, or are we going to put off more and more of that to the private contractors who are working for us? How do we get that balance and what do we do to test? Is that a fair appraisal of what the general is? That's it. Okay. I appreciate my interpreter doing uh, such a fine job. <laughs> well, I think your point was so important that I didn't want to let it get away. The gentlelady from Rhode Island. Well, I would like to uh, continue on part C of my questioning, and due to my magnanimous nature in enabling the, the chairman to, to clarify this, there are some other points that I would like to have clarified. And if you don't have this information, I would appreciate that we obtain this for the record, perhaps at a later time. But it seems to me that at the same time we were watching the levels of personnel decline since 1970, I'd like to know what the percentage was in increase, decrease, or maintenance, maintain, maintenance of status quo insofar as public information and public relations was concerned for NASA over that same period? Do you happen to have the answer to that on hand? No. No, but I'll be pleased to uh, provide it. As a matter of fact, I can provide the corrected numbers for the entire that were testified to by Mr. Silvera now, uh, uh, which I'll be pleased to do if you, if you would care to. Well, I'd be uh, on very the quality interested. assurance uh, 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 people. Uh, I, in addition to the quality assurance personnel, I'm interested in looking at the budget that has been utilized over that same period of time because it appears to me, Mr. Chairman, that, that we have been seeing over that time period a very aggressive public relations campaign in support of the, the shuttle program. And I certainly understand that the favorable publicity and uh, the, the campaign that was uh, helping to create an atmosphere which would lead to, um, you know, support of this program, but I am concerned about that. And I'm just going to ask it a part D of my questioning here, which relates uh, also to procedures of those personnel. Um, the General Accounting Office had indicated that NASA had cut or delayed one half billion dollars in spending on safety testing, design, and development from the time the shuttle began until the Challenger disaster. Now, the reasons I understand that those procedures were eliminated is because they were proven or it was indicated that they were not cost effective. And I would appreciate it if you could elaborate on the decision making discussion that it indicated that it was no longer cost effective, unlike the Apollo space program where um, various procedures were, were tested and they design it and then they build a prototype and that prototype was then tested. The idea of eliminating this procedure because it was not cost effective, I'd like some more justification for that, please. Um, again, I'm going to have to respond for the record for that. Those happened in years that, uh, that I'm not personally aware of. I will be pleased to uh, try to get you the information, but uh, uh, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, for the record, would just like to say that uh, in looking at various pieces of information, there seems to be a trend between the, the number of dollars spent, the personnel, and 
the procedures, and I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what kind of conclusions we might be able to draw by looking at all three of those aspects. If I had more time, I'd ask how that could be looked at, at an even larger picture insofar as we'll NASA's going. budget versus the defense budget for space programs. You'll have time to do that That's because we're going to go around again. Thank you. We'll start on our next, wit our next uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Bollard from New York, distinguished member from New York. And we'll go to the, to the second bell rings, and then you'll have your time when we come back. Yeah? So you can start now, yes. Mr. Bowler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Part E of uh, my colleague's question, and I think she uh, addresses a very important and critical point. The, the information provided us by staff indicates, for example, that on June of 1970, the marshal had 615 people assigned to reliability and quality assurance. And in August of 85, that number was down to 88, which is an 86 percent decrease. So I think it's important, Admiral Truly, that we do have those figures, because I think we all agree that safety is first and foremost. If I may, I'd like to address something that I addressed yesterday with Secretary Rogers. And the reason I want to do so is because a great many people have asked me, and I'm sure they've asked our colleagues, about uh, the crew of the Challenger. Uh, a great many Americans, I. I think that if Congress had provided more dollars or NASA had established uh, different priorities, it might have been perhaps possible to save the crew. Uh, is there any bailout system or ejection system now operational or even in the conceptual stage that if part of the Challenger would have permitted uh, the saving of the crew? I believe in this accident there is no system that uh that uh, is in development that could have saved the the crew for this uh, for this accident because of the time factor, the 73 seconds, the thrust, and uh, the issue of uh, egress and escape has been uh, studied and argued in the shuttle program since its inception. Uh, the decision was made that the way to provide the best safety was to put that money, uh, those dollars, into the reliabil reliability of the system during the first stage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the only sort of system that I, frankly, uh, am aware of uh, would be a, that could possibly uh, uh, be of use during the first stage would have would involve a combination of thrust termination on the solid rocket motors and a uh, essentially a detachable pod is a uh, part of the cockpit of the of the shuttle uh, and that was determined just not to be a feasible uh, trade in the early days of the shuttle program uh, as we look at the issue now and as I said in my testimony we are reopening all of those uh, possibilities uh, which vary from uh, we're relooking at what would be required both for a, a major change to the system uh, that could be accommodated all the way down to the possibility at least of uh, looking at a, a bailout uh, capability in controlled flight in, in controlled gliding uh, flight. Uh, we're, we're just going to have to get those studies in and take a look at the and see if make the risk and gain uh, trade-offs to decide uh, what to do. In every case, in every study, when we made those trade-offs before, the, uh, the gains to the system were, particularly after we had gotten started in the program, the gains in the system to make a change were, uh, did not balance out against the risks involved in uh, modifying the hatch or putting in ejection seats or so forth. But in this instance, the answer is clearly no to that question. That's correct. It? Okay. Uh, next well, question. I'll yield on that point, however. I'll be glad to yield, Mr. Chairman. By the same token, I, I think that you're, you're, you're uh, developing a more positive approach in the point of what did we use to balance the system. And the idea of balancing the system, and forgive me for being not emotional, but how, what, what kind of a figure do we assign to a life? I mean, if we were dealing in equipment and material and things that we make with our hands as part of the system, and we evaluated that, what kind of cost evaluation did we make when we had seven lives involved? And I don't mean to come down on you. Now, I just wonder what weight we put to a life in this engineering system we're figuring 
versus the point of view whether we can or cannot afford it. And I'm not, I don't mean to mislead anybody and, and, and second guess your initial point when you talk about the, this particular flight. But it seems to me in a systems evaluation, and I don't want to belabor the point, that we ought to be talking about, and I think you're moving in that direction, we're going to take another serious look at this and a very in-depth look at what we may be able to do to be able to help astronauts in different mode accident potential modes. Is that a fair statement? We are looking at that specific uh, question. Uh, the studies are, uh, the review studies of what the possibilities are to do with the shuttle system today are, are not in. Right. Uh, when they uh, are evaluated first by Mr. Aldrich at the level two, uh, uh, a recommendation will be made and we'll deal with it. But we will be, the gentleman will yield further and you'll have your well, time when we yeah. return. But we will be looking in our next oversight and a very, because our oversight will be based continuously on safety. We're going to be looking to that particular issue as to how we put the systems cost analysis, analysis benefit ratio to the loss of a human life. And I think you, you would agree with that. Right. Well, so Mr. We'll, Chairman, if I may follow up on that, and you have promised me some additional time yes, after we'll this. I'm just wondering on, on what level of safety we're looking for before we decide to put people in space. For example, uh, just the other day, Dr. Fletcher is quoted as saying, NASA remains committed to the civilian in space concept. But he also has said that will be delayed until shuttle flights are deemed safe enough for them. For the civilians, are we going to have two levels, one level of safety for the astronauts, another level of safety for the civilians. And that's, uh, I'll ask Dr. Fletcher uh, to expand upon his response to that when he does get here, but I'm wondering where the dividing line is going to be. To me, a life is a life. It is uh, to all of us. The, uh, the question is, uh, in the shuttle system, are there, are there things we could do that would uh, improve the crew escape posture uh, that makes the risk less than it is today. I want to, you know, I, I want to make sure you realize that in, in many cases, things that are approved uh, enter new risks into the system. In other words, pyrotechnics that would blow a, a hatch away, uh, <coughs> that would save you in a certain si situation and kill you in another. So uh, it is a subjective uh, question. And, uh, and the question of uh, citizens in space is a policy question. But uh, the same uh, protection will be provided at whatever level to uh, whoever the occupants of the shuttle are. Mr. Chairman, I think it's relevant to note at this point, in amazement and disbelief, I might say, that while uh, the NASA authorities have been using a figure of one predicted accident out of 100,000 flights, we have the testimony just yesterday of George McKay, a project engineer at the Marshall Space Center, who said yesterday that 20 years ago, Marshall safety uh, engineers predicted a flight <coughs> failure in every 20 to 25 manned flights. And he said, we didn't uh, tell anybody about it at that time because, and I'm quoting, it would, it would have scared the hell out of everybody. Who would you get to be the 20th flight? Now, well, uh, getting to the, your <laughs> question, Mr. Chairman, of the value of a single life, when we have an ongoing program where the top safety officials know in their heads that there's likely to be a failure every 20 or 25 flights, when we have a series of 500 manned flights planned, they don't rate human lives very highly if they uh, proceed on that uh, well, intellectual if, if both gentlemen risk assumption. Deal, because we have to vote, yeah. we will suspend. But what we're on coming from on this question, which I realize is a sensitive emotional question, as both our, our colleagues do, is part of the policy decision that will follow as we unfold our observations over the next two days in d discussing with you the details and facts are going to be based as to what ratio the manned space, man space flight should play to unmanned space flight. That's where we're coming from yeah. in those questions. So we'll suspend for the moment and return in 10 minutes.
This is what we plan on doing is recessing at 12.30 to 1.30. And when we return, we think it would be profitable uh, to uh, demonstrate for the members the uh, motion picture that's there, and then we'll continue on. That'll give them a good insight, I think, into what happened, those who haven't had a chance to see that before. When we broke up, we had Mr. Bollert's time, and we defer to Mr. Bollert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hindsight is always 2020, and I think all of us agree as we look back that had the conversation between the officials of Morton Thiokol and NASA at, uh, at Marshall been reviewed at the very top, there probably would have been a decision not to launch. Now, I note in Secretary Rogers' report that he is recommending, and it's a recommendation that I fully support, that in the future, pre-launch conferences be recorded so that we have a permanent record. But we don't want just a permanent record to review sometime in the future, uh, God forbid, should another tragedy occur. What we would like is a permanent record so at the very top, these conversations can be reviewed. Had that occurred in this instance, the decision not to launch probably would have been made. So Admiral Truly, could you address that point? Number one, do you support the recommendation that these pre-launch conferences be recorded? And number two, can we go a step further and receive some assurances that at least at your level and hopefully Dr. Fletcher's level, that will be reviewed so that you will have the benefit of discussions like the one that occurred with respect to the O-ring? Uh, this is specifically the kind of uh, recommendation in the report that I asked Captain Crippen to lead a group and uh, to take a look at, and that is improved communications and the, and the very structure of the uh, process in the decision to launch. Uh, I, might, I might ask if Mr. Aldrich uh, would have a comment uh, to your question, since he has participated directly in, uh, in, in the flight readiness process uh, far more Fine. than I have personally. Mr. Aldrich? Yes, well, I would comment that uh, we have been looking at precisely those uh, kinds of uh, augmentation to the formality of the flight readiness process uh, prior to the Commission's report in anticipation of that uh, finding on their behalf. Both the uh, recording of the meetings and the uh, more formal uh, requirement for participation from all organizations and formal structure of the timing of those meetings. Uh, what I have done is institute some uh, specific proposals. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have instituted some uh, action to provide a series of specific proposals on uh, the readiness review process to provide true Admiral Truly and now to uh, uh, Bob Crippen uh, as a basis for starting uh, some of the relook and, and final decisions in those areas following the Commission's report based on the experiences we've been through and our understanding of them. And one final question, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Graham, in, in your uh, new role as science advisor to the President, could you expand a little bit upon the role you envision for yourself in that office in connection with direct liaison with NASA? And I'm assuming the Senate will be uh, uh, generous in their confirmation. Yes, as you know, uh, I'm subject to confirmation and wouldn't want to intrude on the prerogatives of the Senate to. Uh, to speak to that position until I'm confirmed. However, Incidentally, when you're talking about the Senate, the different you're now in the bleachers. That's the grandstand over there. We're after the facts, and they're doing a lot of, if yesterday is any indication of what's going to happen during these proceedings, a lot of showmanship over there. I think you're seeing in this committee a determined effort to get at facts and have a, a, a good exchange. I uh, will certainly continue if I'm confirmed to that position, continue to take a, a deep and consistent interest in the National Space Program and in NASA's activities, both the program of returning to flight and the other activities that NASA will be involved in as a major contributor to the National Space Program and as the leadership uh, within the administration in the Civil Space Program. Well, as a practical matter, when you were acting administrator of NASA, did you have steady and frequent contact with the Office of Science Advisor? I recognize it's been vacant for several months now. But, uh, uh, yes. Uh, first through uh, Dr. Keyworth and his staff, and then uh, uh, through Dr. McTague, and now Dr. Johnson, 
uh, there is a, a steady flow of traffic uh, and discussion between NASA and, and that office, and I believe it's, uh, it's very constructive and should be continued. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Volkman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd first like to ask, uh, this committee has been told by NASA in recent briefings that induced environment criteria for the SRB were signed off before the STS-1 and verification compliance notice 12A11. And I'd like to know if NASA can provide us with a documentation supporting this decision. Yes, sir, we will. All right, thank you. Uh, I'd like to have it uh, within a week, if, if at all possible. And there's also, in reviewing the uh, Commission's report, a great deal of confusion involving the, uh, say, environmental criteria, as temperature, uh, wind, uh, everything else, rain, that the solid rocket motor was expected to meet. And can you tell us what these criteria are especially the ambient temperatures expected and the safety factor in the design, or can you provide us documentation from the contract between NASA and Martin Thackel stating the exact temperature mm -hmm. criteria the motor would be required to meet? If I might, I, if I could pass that question to Mr. Aldridge, who is uh, the level two uh, program manager, and I uh, might ask his comment. Uh, Mr. Volkmer, my understanding uh, in reviewing this from the level two organization is that uh, early in the program a uh, an environmental criteria for launch performance for all elements of the shuttle system was established at a uh, range of 26 degrees Fahrenheit to 99 degrees Fahrenheit and this was uh, initially put on contract or it was uh, applied through my level two organization formally to all projects in the shuttle system for them in turn to apply directly to the contracts of their contractors who provide the hardware for the system. Uh, in the evolution of the program, the lower limit, the 26 degrees Fahrenheit, was subsequently raised to 31 degrees Fahrenheit, but was carried forward uh, as the requirement from that time forward, and has uh, not only been on requirement for each project to design to, but also been in the launch commit criteria document that we have used for every flight as criteria for flight performance. Uh, my understanding of the formal documentation is that that was applied to each project, including the Marshall projects, and that formal certification was provided back from those projects, all projects in the program that uh, elements had been designed and tested to perform, uh, certified to perform within those ranges. Now, Within the solid rocket booster, it does not break the booster further as an overall requirement down into sub-elements or sub-components. It merely specifies that it can perform within its design spec within those temperature ranges for those temperatures at launch from either east or west coast launch sites. And the SRB was supposed to be certified down to a temperature as the overall temperature of the SRB at 31 degrees? For launch, yes, sir. For launch. Can Will the you gentleman yield for a moment on that point? Well, could I ask my next question oh, sure. first? But I think the point... Then I will yield. Oh, yeah, surely. And that is that I would like to be provided the documentation for that certification for the SRB uh, and including uh, all the uh, testing that was done by the contractor uh, to uh, arrive at that certification. Uh, Mr. Volkmer, uh, the documentation that I would uh, have direct familiarity, familiar, familiarity with would be the response from the Marshall Project to the Level 2 program that says that those requirements have been fully met. The details of the contract and the certification testing between the Marshall Center and the Thiokol Corporation uh, would be a direct question uh, I think appropriate to Mr. Jack Lee of the task force that has investigated in detail that aspect of the uh, right, uh, certification, then, and he will he will have more direct knowledge of that than I. Although I'm sure we can provide what documentation the task force has uh, has put together on that subject. I have that documentation right here. All right, fine. Uh, the gentleman. Yeah, I think it would be profitable. If I understand where the gentleman is coming from. Were were physical, actual physical tests made, or were these determinations made by uh, computer model analyses? 
In other words, how, where did these temperatures come from? Uh, in terms of their climate or in, uh, yeah. uh, an analysis of the expected range of performance that the shuttle system would be required to perform at was determined. Some of it was determined by, uh, by analysis, uh, and a wide range of environmental conditions are determined in order to provide the design specifications for the shuttle systems each to meet. The uh, temperature criteria for launch uh, was, I uh, understand, a fairly uh, direct assessment of the likely conditions that we would expect to see during the norm of the program in terms of uh, design requirements and launch conditions. Well, well gentlemen, I, revert, I have other questions to ask on this issue, but you have, it's your time, I refer back to you. I'd just like to ask, uh, I know my time's about right out, but uh, I, I would uh, like to ask either Mr. Aldrich or Admiral Truly, in your review of the critical items list, as I understand it, you're reviewing all parts of that, mm -hmm. the one, one R, the twos and the threes, all of them. Uh, is there going to be or will uh, the, will you have the National Research Council an audit panel be implemented in the, during this review or utilized in any extent? As I understand, the commission rec made that recommendation. <coughs> The, uh, I was not aware they were going to make that specific rec recommendation, but uh, I, I frankly welcome it. It's a, uh, we, would, we will have to uh, work out with, uh, uh, we'll have to uh, obviously uh, talk to the National Research Council and work out an appropriate uh, manner in which for, you know, in, uh, in, in the appropriate context uh, in which they can uh, perform the audit to this review. Uh, that we're conducting. I think at some point it might be a very helpful on this criticality one and one R review that uh, we invite Mr. Aldrich to give you a, a good description of it because it's come up several times in the, uh, in the questions and I think uh, uh, in the hearings it might be very helpful to get a, a better and more detailed uh, description of what that review is. I, I, Mr. Chairman, if I may comment, I would like to have a little more detail how that review is uh, taking place and who's doing the actual review, especially as a result of reviewing the uh, commission's report in regard to the uh, SRB and the fact that uh, as a joint put on the uh, 1R list and then put on the 1 list and then we end up uh, having nothing but waivers. So I have some questions in regard to that. Uh, and I, I, from the outside, I uh, think that uh, it's not that I don't uh, trust everybody, but uh, maybe it'd be better uh, to have someone uh, on the outside also actually doing this audit as well. My last question has to do, uh, what was the actual temperature at time of launch, the ambient temperature? Well, uh, again, I think it would be better perhaps to ask someone from the task force, uh, perhaps Bob Crippen. Uh, my knowledge of that is that uh, there were several readings for the temperature at launch, depending on how high above the ground on the service structure. And uh, my understanding is it was in the, in the range of 36 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, if the gentleman would yield, that's a legitimate yes. question, and you're suggesting, Mr. Aldrich, that we would ask them. Those uh, team leaders are going to be here tomorrow, Hal. And, we, and please propound the question at that point again to get it on the record, and I agree with you. Because I want to add to that question line of questioning. I'm, I will give you a copy of these three or four questions we want to get into the record to respond this afternoon. I don't want you to, I want you to think about them a little bit. For example, we're saying, in general, all government procurements require a qualification of test or an equal test that in condition of acceptance and assures that it was designed to meet and, and would operate the expected environment. That's the fundamental question. And we're going to ask you, you know, what, <clears throat> was there a qualification test call out in the design specs for the joint? What were the, re the quality test specs for the joint? Did the joint and seals pass the quality test? And four, was the 51L flight environment within the equal test envelope? We'll give you that to take a look at so that we can ask those questions of you this afternoon. And that'll be more helpful, I think, in responding along Thank the you. line of what Mr. Volkman is speaking to. Any further questions, Harold? No, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. The next. Uh, Person, uh, next member is Mr. Faywell from Illinois. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yesterday, um, I propounded a question to Neil Armstrong, and it had to do with uh, his statement that there had been a change of, of attitude or mindset or policy, or I guess call it what you may, uh, at NASA, uh, in regard to safety or in regard to just in general the can-do attitude, as he described it, which prevailed at one time, and the idea that, uh, that a launch would be presumed to be unsafe and would have to be rebutted uh, to a, an attitude now that is, uh, would be best described by saying a launch is safe and you're going to have to rebut the safety features of that. And um, I ask him the question as to when that mindset or when the policy uh, appeared to change, and uh, he couldn't pinpoint it, uh, nor necessarily get too specific, but I did make reference to an act, which at that time I, I, I didn't know the, the correct name, but it's the National Aeronautic Space Council, or uh, uh, what is called the White House Space Council, which at one time was in effect, and I believe in 1973, President Nixon unilaterally by executive order disbanded that. Uh, I've had several who have uh, mentioned to me they felt that NASA thereafter was uh, described by one as a headless agency and didn't have the, uh, that guidance from on top, which certainly sets broad subjective policies such as, as safety and other subjective uh, policies. Could I have some uh, response, uh, Admiral, Admiral Truly, from you in that regard? Do you think the abrogation of the White House uh, uh, Council, um, uh, Space Council, uh, did have a detrimental effect upon the, the basic attitude and positive can-do attitude and presumptions to which I made reference? I'm afraid that I'm like uh, Mr. Armstrong, Neil, who, who uh, I'm sure responded to that question yesterday, I, uh, I, I frankly don't think that uh, the absence or presence of uh, that body watching over the space program uh, was a specific act that changed uh, an attitude within the agency. As a matter of fact, I think in general, uh, the uh, in many cases, the attitude within, within the agency uh, hasn't changed. I know as short as two and a half years ago when I was at full-time duty in the shuttle program in the astronaut office, uh, a, a large percentage of our time was spent in the office and, and also in the control boards and so forth in safety, and I think that continued right up to January 28th. What uh, the uh, chain of events that led to this accident, though, undoubtedly did include uh, uh, subtle pressures uh, that, that uh, caused the uh, workload to go up and the attention to, uh, and, and to steal from the, the uh, attention that, that people were able to pay. Uh, however, I don't think those were the cause of this accident. I think this, cause, this accident was uh, caused by uh, specific failure in the system to see a problem that was uh, quite apparent uh, and was uh, waving a, uh, a flag and should have been uh, caught. And I think the body of this uh, commission report uh, concludes the same thing and it is my, uh, it is, uh, my duty and, and goal to make sure that before we fly again that, uh, that uh, whatever led to this tragic event will, uh, will not happen because of, a la of, of uh, any problem with attitude within the uh, agency. Did, May would I you add agree? One, uh, one comment to yes. that, please? Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, as you know, Mr. Faywell, uh, this administration has had a very strong interest in the space program uh, over the last uh, uh, several years and has, in fact, conducted uh, frequent uh, White House level reviews of space yeah. policy, but the thing to remember here is that the uh, involvement of the of the executive office of the president in the space program has been at the policy level, and uh, President Reagan has in fact provided strong policy guidance for the program. The implementation of that policy rests with the agencies, 
which is NASA. Today, the, the generation of the policy is done uh, through an interagency process, which is led by uh, representatives from the National Security Council at the working level and finally by the president at the top level. And that process has generated uh, strong policy for the space program over the last five years. Now, uh, you're talking about the senior interagency group on science? The, in fact, the, the uh, hierarchical structure starts with the interagency group, which involves a number of agencies of the government. And today, more agencies than ever before are involved in the space policy because space has become such an integral part of the activities of so many agencies, from the Justice Department, Commerce, Transportation, NASA, and on. After that is the senior interagency group. After that is, is uh, either the uh, Cabinet or the National Security Council, and finally, the President himself. Well, now, I don't have only hearsay to report. I'm by no means an expert. I've had people tell me that, that there is bureaucratic entanglement insofar as this particular uh, uh, senior interagency group, and that as a result, NASA has been left in a rather independent status so that uh, it can make uh, many of its uh, decisions without real strong policy coming down. I, I don't know how accurate that is. And I realize that that has not been in being for any, any length of time. My, my feeling is, though, that basic policy on emphasis of safety comes from on top. And I've had a number of people express to me that the White House Space Council, uh, which was abandoned roughly in about 1973, was doing a very fine job in giving that on top guidance and that, uh, and that, that its guidance, especially in terms of, of emphasis upon safety and the presumption being that it's unsafe and it must be rebutted, being as Neil Armstrong has indicated, somehow that concept was lost in reverse, that the White House Council had a great deal in putting that kind of emphasis from on top on, on, on to NASA. And I, that's the reason I have propounded those questions, and uh, I'm, I'm seeking only to to see if we indeed need that kind of, and I think there's legislation, I guess, pending that will reinstate the White House Council, as I understand it. It would appear to me that that may be something that did contribute to what Neil Armstrong, uh, I think, uh, rather aptly uh, referred to yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is May I just uh, respond, Mr. Chairman? Briefly. Dr. Graham, of course. Uh, uh, the interagency process dealing with space issues today is considerably more complex than the process was in the early 70s. Uh, I view that as a, as a tribute to the space program, to this committee and other members of the Congress who have, in fact, uh, helped to make the space program an integral part of so many of the activities of the government and so many of our international activities as well. That necessarily leads to a more complex process because many more interests are involved now than they were a decade or a decade and a half ago. Nevertheless, there, there has been a con continued strong leadership through this administration in the space program and in the policy of the space program, which has been generated in the, uh, in the White House. Uh, NASA's task in the civilian area is to implement that policy. And uh, if we have a have encountered a difficulty uh, in the safety area in the last two decades, as we clearly have with respect to the Challenger. Uh, I don't believe it has been lack of sound policy concerning safety. It has been too much the assumption that safety is inherently wired into the system and can't leak out no matter what we do. That's not a correct assumption. We have to work every day to keep safety in the system. And uh, one of the uh, one of the consequences of the Challenger accident, uh, as in fact was the consequence of the Apollo fire nearly two decades ago, will be to rededicate the agency to making its implementation of space policy based on an active pursuit of safety in all activities undertaken. All right, thank you. Uh, if, uh, doctor, I, I appreciate your, your comment, and I, I don't feel as if I got an answer to my earlier question that I asked. One of the recommendations under four of the Commission said that the safety organization, NASA, should establish an Office of Safety, Reliability, Quality Assurance to be headed by an associate administrator reporting directly to the NASA administrator. Do you subscribe to that point of view? Uh, 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, and uh, certainly along with the other recommendations of the Commission, we'll look at that one very carefully. Uh, at the present, that responsibility for safety, reliability, and quality assurance does lie with uh, an associate administrator reporting directly to the administrator. That associate administrator is the chief engineer. Well, what's bothering me a little bit, and just so we get clarification for the record, to know where you fellows are coming from, part of the discussion that came from Dr. Fletcher came back and said, well, a number of those things were not specific recommendations, they were, uh, or rather specific directions, they were recommendations for consideration. In this instance, it's not a recommendation for consideration. They use the words NASA should establish. So do we consider any of these areas where we come down in the recommendation where they said should as compared to may or maybe to be something that would have a stronger balance in your thought process when we organize? And boy, am I being sensitive to this issue right now. I think the, uh, there is uh, uh, a difference in the recommendations in various it's areas, and we are paying attention to that. Right. And I, uh, but I would add that we already have an associate administrator who has among his responsibilities safety, reliability, quality assurance. I believe the, the question before us is, uh, should uh, there be an associate administrator position dedicated to only those functions? And we'll certainly uh, consider that as we go forward in implementing the uh, recommendations of the commission. Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to belabor it, but I would suggest the point of view that obviously the Commission certainly must have known that or they wouldn't have put the recommendation in, number one. I'd be astounded if they didn't. I think, number two, they're saying that we should be creating an Office of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance. Part of what the, you were responding to the uh, gentleman for, uh, from uh, Mr. Faywell from Illinois a few minutes ago was based upon your concern with the transmission of safety information through the whole structure. And I applauded that approach. Now, I just want to nail down for the record that there seems to be a hesitancy of saying, are we saying we've already done that, that the, that the NASA has in place an Office of Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance that's headed up by somebody? Or is it effective? I mean, why, did, why did the Commission recommend that or put it in, the, in their response at all? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're saying that uh, that, uh, that recommendation uh, has in fact been uh, in place in one particular form. The fact that it is a recommendation there indicates to me that the Commission is suggesting that that form may not be adequate. And we are going to go back and look at that very hard, make sure we understand exactly what the Commission uh, was tr trying to get at and what it recommended and consider that as we go forward. We will give that the most serious of consideration. Well, I'm making the point on the record so that when we call you back shortly, we'll be looking for what your response is going to be to that. The next, uh, and I thank the gentleman from uh, Illinois, the next uh, uh, colleague is Mr. Slaughter from our distinguished colleague from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when can we expect NASA to have a schedule for shuttle flights over the next year? We have a uh, we have a preliminary uh, schedule for a earliest possible flight uh, of uh, July of 1987. We uh, in, during that year uh, we have already planned that the maximum rate will be either six or seven flights, and that'll depend on specifically which uh, vehicles that we will fly. I hope within the next uh, few weeks to specifically be able to uh, mm. recommend a manifest for specific flights throughout that period, and uh, it would uh, be available at that time. I have no further questions. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Mr. Nelson. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have three questions for uh, this round of questioning. First of all, I want to follow up in my discussion yesterday with, uh, with uh, Chairman Rogers and Vice Chairman Armstrong on what we learned when we were with you, uh, Admiral Truly, last uh, Friday down at the Kennedy Space Center on the uh, question of the verification for the contract specifications of how the SRB was to operate under uh, natural temperature and also under the induced temperature. And the contract specs 
are contained in a document that was prepared for Marshall by Thiokol, dated uh, February the 17th, 1984, in which the temperatures have been mentioned here earlier, uh, from 99 to 31 degrees and with an induced temperature that goes down to 25 and in another case, uh, 21 degrees. I have the documentation he, uh, here of the verific verification that was signed off by all the parties uh, for the flight of STS-1. And then I have the documentation also on the verification uh, for STS-5. What can you tell us that you know about why was this verification given if in fact, as you and I learned at the Cape on Friday, that that testing in fact was not done? What do you know about it? Just share that with us. I'm going to have to take that question for the record or ask you to ask it again when we have our task team uh, members here uh, tomorrow that may can uh, help well, answer that. Well, let's ask Mr. Aldrich, uh, since uh, these uh, level three folks would be at Marshall would be reporting to you as the program manager. What do you know about why wasn't the testing done? Uh, Mr. Nelson, I know very little about uh, the details of the testing and the response between the level four contractor organization and the Marshall level three project organization. Uh, I have not participated with the task force and have not uh, delved into that in detail. Have researched the feedback to the space shuttle program to the level two from Marshall indicating full compliance with that, with that requirement for induced environments uh, as part of the certification that was reported prior to STS-1 and has continued forward since that time. All right, so you're telling me and nobody knows the answer to the question. The question is, does anybody have a clue as to why, under the obligations of the contract, the testing was not done? And why NASA signed off on two occasions that the testing, in fact, had been complied with, the contract had been complied with? Is there anybody here that could address that question now? No. Okay, after we heard that on Friday, what did you ask Admiral Truly to be done with regard to providing information to you on this particular question? Uh, at this point, I have not, uh, I'm not asked any uh, action, but I, I, I certainly will since, uh, you know, you know, the, at that point, we were waiting for the commission report. I don't, uh, I do not know wh wh what that task team concluded in its in support or precisely what the commission staff developed on that issue. But uh, I certainly understand the line of your, uh, your question, and uh, I would like to take it for a record to, to uh, supply the answer as best we can put it together. Okay, when will those, uh uh, folks that you're talking about. Tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, the other question that I would like to address specifically on this issue is, <laughs> since everybody is saying that it, it was not complied with, uh, in addition to why wasn't it complied with, is there some contractual breach here that uh, we need to know from, from a legal standpoint? So let's address that. Uh, Admiral Truly, earlier today, uh, Dr. Fletcher had indicated again that uh, the earliest possible date that we might fly is uh, July of 87. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering about that date by virtue of a report that was given to NASA before you came back to NASA last August, August of 85. It was a thigh call briefing to Mr. Weeks at headquarters, and it was talking about a redesign of the uh, 
the joints, in fact, putting a capture feature, which is one of the things that you all are looking at now in your redesign. And it said that uh, the earliest possible implementation, and I'm reading right from their um, report to NASA, was on STS-81N, which under the manifest was scheduled for August of 1988. Now, if that report would have said that in a redesign for a capture feature, and this was a report that was given last summer, why do we have reason to believe uh, now that we could come up with uh, an opportunity to fly incorporating some of the same redesign, but it to be uh, uh, some 12 or 13 months uh, earlier than what was projected. I think that uh, I'd like to briefly uh, address that question and then ask to, again that it, it might be directed tomorrow to uh, Mr. John Thomas, who's head of our SRM redesign team at Marshall. We have uh, done every, we have recognized that in order to get into test uh, with a new design, uh, we've had to expedite the delivery of, uh, of the uh, case segments uh, in order to get them into a test program that could meet uh, a flight date whenever it may be. The capture feature is one of the various uh, features that is being uh, considered. Uh, the, the early indication that I have is, is that alone it probably is not an adequate design, but that's what the redesign uh, team is uh, for, to look at the various uh, redesigns. So I think the specific answer to your question is we've had to spend money and effort in, uh, in, in bringing those uh, case segments uh, forward as quickly as we can. I should point out at this time that, the, uh, that those very case segments that have enough metal to uh, have a capture feature on them are a threat uh, to the schedule of summer of 87, as is the tooling that is required at the uh, manufacturer's plant to machine them. Uh, and we will continue to evaluate uh, those schedules and, uh, and uh, try our best to meet them, but within the context of what Dr. Fletcher st said in his statement, and that context is uh, flight safety. Okay, I'll follow up uh, on that tomorrow. And oh. Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, the third question that I wanted to lay out here, and uh, uh, let me get uh, Admiral Trilley's response on this. In the report, uh, the Commission notes that numerous, and I'm quoting, numerous contract employees have worked 72 hours per week and frequent 12-hour shifts. And then it goes on to cite the potential implications of such overtime for safety were apparent during the attempted launch of STS-61C on January the 6th when fatigue and shift work were cited as major contributing factors to a serious incident involving a liquid oxygen depletion that occurred less than five minutes before the scheduled liftoff. Uh, you and I have talked about that draining of the locks from the tank. They're saying that that was due to fatigue and excessive uh, uh, work shifts. Do you agree with the commission? And if you do, what is the plan for action to alleviate such fatigue in the work shifts in the future? Well, I must tell you that I am very uh, concerned about some uh, looking at some historical data prior to the flight of the overtime that was required uh, in the uh, year, or, or I would say a uh, year and a half or so before the flight. If you plot overtime, uh, uh, at the Cape versus the number of vehicles in flow, it was uh, increasing. And I think as we, uh, what we plan to do in the future is that we plan to make a major effort to take a look at uh, what a reasonable industry standard is and, what, and with our shuttle processing contract uh, down at the Cape, what, what our actual capability is to make sure that uh, as the flight rates that we choose do not require 
uh, over time below some, above some level that we uh, choose through study and, a, and, uh, and work to be proper. In other words, we're going to look at the overtime uh, for the, when we get back to flight, we're going to agree on what the sort of level is and, and we're going to manage to that and not allow pressures to increase the flight rate to get ahead of our resources, our people resources to do those jobs. Mr. Aldrich, you were right there uh, at the Cape in January. Uh, that's sort of an unfair question to Admiral Truly because he wasn't back with the organization. Uh, do you agree with the commission uh, statement? And uh, if, if you do, what do you plan to do about it in the future? I agree with the uh, commission statement in general that uh, large amounts of overtime were required for the pace of schedule that we were seeing uh, during the latter half of 1985 and leading into 1986. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I would draw that conclusion about 61C, however, if, if you recall, we were scheduled to launch on December 19th and uh, had a problem where we were not able to launch on that day and the mission team made the decision to wait until after the Christmas holidays with one of the major considerations being allowing the team to have time off for that period and uh, pick up again in readiness to launch on January 6th. So that might be one of the more periods prone to, in fact, allowing relief and, uh, and a break for the team, although I'm also sure that maybe specific in individuals might have been involved in a way that did cause them not to get the full break during that period. <clears throat> in the future, uh, there's no question that that consideration needs to be addressed directly, and we need to understand the work we're requiring the teams to do, and also the spread across, <clears throat> excuse me, the number of people on the team. And, make sure no single element of it is overloaded beyond the point of uh, our understanding of the total team schedule. And we'll be looking into that in depth. If you took this recommendation, Mr. Chairman, to its uh, logical conclusion, it would mean that there would have to be either much less uh, frequency of flights or, as the buildup of the frequency occurs, a greater workforce in order to more evenly distribute the workload so that the stress and fatigue factor did not come in here. And uh, therefore, that has imminent budgetary implications, uh, which we're going to have to get onto as uh, we get into the, uh, the uh, authorization for appropriations legislation that's uh, coming on down. The, the gentleman would yield. I, I think that your, your line of questioning uh, this morning goes in the direction which we've been trying to direct, the chairman's been trying to direct this, is the safety aspect. And it seems to me that as we, I know it takes time and a great deal of energy, but as we are developing these specific points, they are all leading towards ultimate policy decisions, funding, priorities, and the points of safety that you're mentioning. So I think your contribution is extraordinarily important, particularly having been there, it's very important. Now, if we would now um, take our break as we had discussed, and we will uh, return at 1.30 uh, to begin our program this afternoon. I want to thank everybody. See you at one third. Right back. Sure. Do you uh, need one? No, I think we may. Uh, I, uh, we need to talk for a minute. We uh, took our recess. We were in the middle of uh, questioning by our distinguished representative from Florida, Mr. Nelson. And then we were going to now re recognize we want to welcome back Dr. Fletcher and uh, Mr. Germany, who has joined us now, right? So I now defer to Rear Admiral Richard Truly to begin again, if you will, uh, for the record, introduce and give us some background on uh, Mr. Germany, and then we'll. Right. Uh, and then uh, go ahead and outline what our plan is for the, your plan for right now. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the makeup of the NASA task force, we had uh, six major teams, and one of those teams was the photo and TV analysis team, and Mr. Dan Ger Germany from the Johnson Space Center was the, the leader of that team. That team supported the commission and all of the other teams with uh, all the thousands of frames of uh, 
individual photography, television uh, shots, and so forth, and has, has pulled together a, uh, a uh, short uh, TV uh, look at the accident itself. And I think without further ado, it would uh, be helpful for me to just turn it over to Mr. Germany and uh, let him talk for a moment with this uh, model of the space shuttle uh, here to my right and then uh, allow him to uh, narrate the, the TV. Dr. Fletcher and some folks sitting up here to see this film because they haven't seen it before. Now, Do uh, Mr. Germany, if you would go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. The photo TV support team concentrated all of its efforts on taking the products that we received that day from the flight from both. With the gentleman here, this is one of five teams, correct? S six, six teams. One sir. of six teams. One of yes, six sir. teams at the. Uh, Four of the teams paralleled in a one-for-one -one relationship the, uh, the four teams on the commission. Well, if the gentleman would yield, it might be profitable, I'm sorry to interrupt you, it might be profitable to, uh, for the uh, members of the committee that didn't have an opportunity to visit with you, together with the folks that are here and other witnesses, it might be, well, give us a little rundown on the six teams. The six teams had certain scores. They're going to be testifying, as I believe, some of them tomorrow, are they not? They'll be with us tomorrow. So why don't you just give a quick overview of that? Why don't you give an overview, and then we'll revert back to Mr. Jeremy, because he can pick up this one team, and then they'll have contact. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. That, that might be very helpful. The, uh, the NASA task force was organized uh, with myself as the chairman and Mr. J.R. Thompson, who will be here tomorrow as the vice chairman. I remained in Washington during the uh, conduct of the investigation, and, uh, and Mr. Thompson was located at the Kennedy Space Center. The, uh, we had, as, as I pointed out a moment ago, we had six teams on the NASA task force. Four of the teams, four of the six, paralleled in a one-for-one -one relationship the four teams on the commission, and I'll speak to them in a minute. We had the, the two additional teams on the NASA task force were the, the first one was the search, recovery, and reconstruction team which was the team that, that uh, managed the salvage effort to get the actual physical evidence of, and, and uh, debris of the Challenger from the ocean floor and then examined that uh, physical evidence in large hangars at Kennedy Space Center. The, uh, the second team is the team that Mr. Germany headed, which is the photo and TV support team. The four teams that, that uh, worked directly with the with the uh, uh, parallel commission teams were uh, the development and production team headed by Jack Lee, Mr. Jack Lee, who is the, uh, who is the deputy director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. And uh, he looked at uh, the development process, the, uh, the uh, part of the investigation that had to do with the buildup of the solid rocket motors, for example, in the factory. The second was a team called the pre-launch activities team headed by Mr. Tom Utzman, who's the deputy director of the Kennedy Space Center. And the pre-launch activities team looked at the flow of the vehicle and the buildup of the 51L Challenger spacecraft as it approached the pad. The third team of, of those four was called the Accident Analysis Team, and it was actually headed up uh, by Mr. J.R. Thompson, it, as well as his job as the vice chairman of the task uh, uh, force. And that was the team that supported the commission in the elimination of the various uh, problems that were uh, postulated, for example, a problem in the external tank, uh, in the orbiter, uh, and as you know, as you read the commission's report, uh, finally narrowed down to the final cause of the accident, which was the uh, failed uh, joint in the solid rocket motor. That was the accident analysis team. And finally, the uh, last team was uh, Mission Planning and Operations Team, which looked at uh, things like mis uh, manifesting, workload at, uh, uh, caused at the Johnson Space Center, training, uh, things like that. In tomorrow's testimony, or uh, here in tomorrow's hearing, we will have each of those team leaders uh, here, as well as Mr. Thompson, and uh, Mr. Germany then was one of the six key leaders of our six teams. Okay. Chair recognized Mr. Germany. Thank you very much, Admiral Tooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the Admiral said, the photo team consisted of people from each of the three major centers, Johnson, Marshall, and KSC. 
we had approximately 100 people, including contractors and, and some photo facilities, processing facilities outside the agency that helped us with our, our analysis of the products that we received that day. There are roughly 108 film cameras and roughly 69 TV cameras for a total of 177 cameras from which we got products that we analyzed. That represented about 13 million frames of film. Now what I'm gonna do today is to narrate a TV film that we've put together that is a compilation from several of the cameras that we had. But before I do that, I'd like to use this model to try to orient you just a, a little bit so that when you do see the film, perhaps it will be uh, a little bit easier for you to pick some of these things up. A lot of times it happens so fast on the film, it's very difficult to, to pick it up the first time you see it with, with your eyes. So a little bit of orientation here. Are you able to, uh, when there's a specific area that you want to highlight, are you able to stop the, the film at that point? We have used Freeze stop frame. action with the way we put the film together. And you can? It turns out that that's not... I'm, I'm going to answer it for you. I'm sorry. We've used stop action when we put the film together, and some of that is stopped as it's moving. If it's not really clear to you, then we can stop it and run it back. Okay. However, with this, with this recorder we have here, when we stop it, you lose everything, and you've got to punch your buttons back and forth. <laughs> All right, so uh, you may get tired of that if we have to do it, but I'll be glad to. The model, as you know, the, uh, the shuttle, when it takes off, Admiral Truman told me not to pick the model up because he didn't want me to break it. When the, the shuttle takes off and, and flies like so, so this is the right hand SRB. And the, the, the points of interest will be the leak that developed was right on this side at around a 300 degree point. Actually, when the recovered hardware that we got back, the burn through was from about 296 degrees to 316 degrees, 294 to 316. So you'll see the flames and the smoke actually come from this part of the vehicle. When you see the film, it'll, it'll be obvious to you what I'm talking about there. The other thing that happened, first of all, there's, there are three main segments of activities, I guess you could say, that occurred with respect to the anomalous events we saw with the photography. The first took place at 0.678 seconds when we saw the puffs of smoke that occurred, and you'll see those. At 0.836 seconds, up to two and a half seconds, there were multiple puffs of smoke, and I believe uh, Mr. Rogers mentioned that yesterday when he was here, like eight or something like that. And then at 3.4 seconds, we stopped seeing any smoke. That was the last time we saw smoke. Then there's a period of time in which there are no anomalous events from the photography. About 58 seconds is when the first flicker of flame appears in the same area from which we saw the smoke. And that goes from a flicker of flame all the way up to a large flame that you'll see that resulted in the LH2 tank leak, which occurred about 64 seconds. Now, a point of orientation for you. This is the external tank. The LOX tank is on top, and the hydrogen tank is on bottom. So that LH2 tank leak I'm talking about occurred right around here, which is what we call the 2058 ring frame. And 2058 is just a station location as you move up and down the tank. So, but that's just for um, simplistic sake, we call it the 2058 ring frame. And that's when the leak occurred, about 64 seconds. And then there's a period of time, about nine seconds, when nothing really happens that we see on the photography. Then at 73 seconds into flight, 73.124 to be exact, is when we have an LH2 tank failure. And you'll be able to see the uh, LH2 liquid as it comes out. Now at the same time, this right-hand SRB starts to move because what's happened is either the strut was burned into or we had a breach of the tank where it came loose. And when, it, when it came loose, then it moved out this way and this part of the SRB crushed into or hit the intratank area. Intratank means that space between the LOX tank on top and the LH2 tank on the bottom. And when that happened, you're essentially losing the integrity of the external tank structure. And the significance of that is this whole 
vehicle configuration wise is tied together through this external tank. You've got the SRBs that are tied to this ring frame I mentioned. At the forward point there's a large truss structure that goes across the inner tank area. So when you lose the, LH, the ET tank structure then the whole thing what we call structural breakup occurs. In that from the point that we saw the LH2 tank failure which is 73.124 seconds then at 73.327 is when structural breakup occurred. So that's only 0 0.2 cent, 0 0.2 seconds, or like 200 milliseconds. Okay. So with that, then what I'm going to do is roll this uh, this film. But before you do it, what I'm going to have to do, Mr. Chairman, to help you is I'm going to come up there and use the monitor and to use the mic. So it'll take me a second to get my prop set up. I understand they have to leave this one uh, spotlight on. You got that all square away. All right. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, someone's going to get the lights in the back. Where's Ken's going to get his lights out except one over here. Well, what I got to do, Tommy, I got to get up here and show the thing. Uh, my arm's not long enough from there. Okay, uh, Tommy, are you ready to roll? Okay, go. And we're starting with the first sequence that shows the smoke. This is one of the TV cameras. You'll see the smoke. Coming right there. And we're going to show some more isolated views in a second so you can see it a little bit clearer, but that's the first time. Now this is the uh, engineering camera 60. Now you can see it coming right there. Yep. We say multiple puffs, you can actually see it kind of billowing out as it goes. And you're going to see that clear in just a second. Okay, this will be a little bit clearer because of the, the background here. See the black smoke going right there? There you go. Then it disappears at that 3.3 .3 seconds and we don't want to see it anymore. This is a combination view. Here and here. Mm -hmm. This is a data camera that's kind of looking to the side. You can see it. So we said it moved initially in the plus X direction, meaning it was moving like so. And this is the attach point. It goes around the SRB to the 2058 ring frame. The joint itself is right above there, right about in there. Now this is later on in the flight where we first see the plume development and we're going to show you several views here. You can start seeing a little bit of the flickering that goes, see right there? And we'll go back and isolate this and you can see it. That's several frames here to give you a perspective of it. You can't see much from the camera because we purposely darkened the background so it would highlight the uh, flame when it appears and that'll, that'll show up in a second. There you go. That's that 58 second point I was talking about. So essentially what happened, you had the smoke, then it tended to heal itself a little bit, and then later on it started developing. Once that flickering starts, 
then it gets progressively larger as it goes. You can see isolated on this shot over here. As the plane gets larger, or the plume gets larger, the aerodynamic effect makes it tend to move to the rear. And as it's large enough, whether, you know, which, what that means is the hole is get, just getting larger as it grows, then the whole thing is constant. And after that occurs, and the flame is impinging upon the LH2 tank is what caused the leak to develop. Get right there. You can see it's just getting progressively worse. At that point, the yaw rates here is what helped us to understand that, that right-hand SRB was starting to move. Now this is a computer aided design picture here, and what we've done is accentuated the motion and re-rock it back and forth. Actually, it did not rock back and forth, but that's just to let you get an idea, is that motion I was talking about earlier on the model occurred here. And then once it started to move away is when it collapsed into the inner tank area forward. Now you'll be able to see the LH2 tank failure because of the flame will start to look different here. There you go, right there. When you just, just change that color there, that was when the, the tank failure occurred. This first hint of vapor at the inner tank area is an indication that that LOX tank on top was leaking after the SRB moved into it. That's right. These are taken from 70 millimeter frames and they're clear on a light table. When you make it into a TV like this, you lose a lot of the clarity. Now you're gonna see a flash right in here. Do the aerodynamics when this hydrogen is leaking here and the LOX is leaking here, the hydrogen actually tends to move up the side of the vehicle. And when it did, it combined, and then you, from the heating, you got the flash there. This is what I meant by us using stop action when we made this to help you to see it. Now 
This intense white flash is when we believe the total structural breakup occurred. The greatly increased intensity of the white flash, that was just the way we, we indicated that was when structural breakup occurred because it appeared to be the large explosion occurred here. Oh, the vehicle came apart. Okay, the SRBs and the, and the uh, orbiter and the ET just all came apart. We call it structural breakup rather than a real explosion because uh, a lot of people are arguing whether or not it was really technically an explosion, but we know it was structural breakup. Now what this series of frames does is just goes back and repeats what you've just seen. You're going to see the uh, shoot here in a second in the nose cap, the right hand SRB. There's a nose cap going, it'll, it'll stop here in a second. There's the shoot, and there's the nose cap there. Then you're going to see range safety destruct to the right hand SRB, and then of the left in a second. Is the left. Now you're going to see a frame of them side by side, a little further distance away. Here and here. It was going out of the limits that the range safety officer had, so he went on and, and Destructed. Turns out it really helped because if those things had burned to completion, it'd probably been out in such deep water, it would have really been tough re for recovery. Tell me I've had a film failure. Um, I have to apologize. It looks like I've had a film failure, Mr. Chairman. The hmm. What happened there, Tommy? Oh, did we lose power? Oh, you lost the plug. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Stand by and let's recalibrate. Can you, uh, hey, Tommy, would you stop that and just back up for a few frames because I want to get the header of this. Just push rewind and just... Mr. Chairman, stand by. We're going to have to replace some of this because I want you to see the first of this. Okay. Because of the interest in the crew cabin, we've included some footage here. You're going to see this uh, several different sequences, so we'll start with the larger picture first and then we'll zero in on what we're able to see. Mr. 
There's some pieces that were coming out here. This was the wing that was going off in that direction. We're going to zero back in in a moment, but in this second contrail, this second smoke trail, is where the crew module ended up going. We're going to show you some details of that. And this is from camera 202. going to be coming right through there. I'm going to show you some more details in a second. This one right here is the, uh, the one that did the dips the doodle, which was the left, right? Now what we did was we took some TV and enhanced it on a frame by frame basis. That was not it right there. No, it was another piece. Coming up, see right there? It's gonna cross through that smoke in just a second. There it is right there, okay? We think this is remainder of the SSMEs burning on the aft compartment there. These have been uh, enlarged a little bit, yes sir. And we just, you can see a lot better on a light table when you have a 70 millimeter. And we just stood there and just studied it for a long time. There it's coming down now, here. That's the crew compartment, yes. In a moment you're gonna see uh, one more series that it looks like it's moving up, but that's just the way we did it when we put it together. It's actually not moving up, but this just gives you an idea of what it looked like. And that completes the uh, film, Mr. Chairman. In fact, that completes uh, what I've got for you today. And I guess tomorrow we're going to use a, a timeline. And in the timeline, I can show you what's happening on the vehicle side as well as from the photography oh, point of view. Are there any questions? Well, any particular member have any questions on this particular issue at this time? The gentleman from California. One came to my mind, uh, is there any significance as to the black puffs of smoke, the color of the smoke, um, because there was, there was black and white smoke together there? The color of the smoke would, would tend to indicate there's hydrocarbons burning, which would be, could represent the erosion of the O-ring that's taking place, as well as there's grease in there as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right, when we, uh, we want to welcome you back, Dr. Fletcher and uh, your other colleagues, and I think that was a very descriptive uh, presentation made that helps the members a great deal to understand the sequence of events, which I'm sure will be helpful when we get into the additional questions and answers. Uh, we had just finished before lunch with uh, <coughs> uh, Mr. Nelson, I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson from Florida, and now we have our next uh, colleague is Mr. Valentine from North Carolina. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. We have uh, had to leave here so often and uh, we've been in and out and this might have been covered by uh, your, your test. This might have been covered by your testimony. If so, I apologize, but we are D discussing the findings of the Rogers uh, Commission, and I, I would like to know whether or not there is now or has been 
and ongoing internal investigation by NASA. And uh, or if after the Rogers Commission was constituted and went to work, uh, whatever was uh, contemplated in that area kind of merged with the, with the Rogers Commission. Uh, that may be more than one question, but. Uh. The uh, NASA did participate fully in the investigation uh, as a part of the NASA task force in those six teams that I described a few moments ago in support of the uh, commission. All of our investigation was done uh, essentially uh, in their support. Uh, we uh, met with them many times. Uh, I'm not aware of another internal investigation that uh, uh, has gone on. Naturally, during the, the progress of the investigation, uh, uh, there were thousands, literally, of uh, things that were uh, 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 looked at, but it was done under the NASA task force in support of the Presidential Commission. So, so what you're saying was that uh, what we have at, the, at this point is one investigation, that there was not any kind of parallel effort. That's, uh, on, that's on, true. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about whether or not there was an effort to look at problems of communication, uh, the things that have been addressed here, but whether or not there was um, uh, another internal investigation of, of the tragedy, the explosion that uh, might have uh, reached a different conclusion or might have been compatible with the results which have been explained or if there was anything of that kind that might be of interest to this committee? No, I would say that it was a single investigation conducted by the Commission. There were many parallel efforts as we chased down uh, possibilities of failure uh, as the weeks went on in the Commission. However, uh, and we did, we, there was plenty of technical controversy as the, as the days went on and we got more and more data that, for example, the film that you just saw was not all developed in the first day or, or looked at. It took many, many, many weeks. But nevertheless, those were all uh, facets of one investigation that came to the answer uh, uh, as reported in the Commission's report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Mr. Lewis from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Fletcher, um, I think you're going to have uh, some very trying moments over the next few months, but I'm sure you'll be up to the challenge. And I think it's uh, excellent that we see uh, those who have flown on a razor's edge, uh, Admiral Truly and Captain Crippen, uh, in the positions that they're in. I was reading uh, the U.S. News and World Report, and uh, you probably saw it yourself, uh, and uh, talking about what uh, you're going to be doing and uh, that you're an interim uh, director. And I think anybody that takes over the administration of NASA is an interim uh, uh, director. Uh, they're not going to stay there forever. But how are you going to be able to cut through the uh, layers of bureaucracy? Uh, and? Uh, really get to the meat of some of the problems. What, what is your plan on doing that? Mr. Lewis, uh, I didn't use the term interim director. I think that was the, the newspaper's term. I plan to stay the remainder of uh, uh, the current administration. Uh, dealing with this problem is not a trivial matter. This is a very complicated piece of machinery. We have a very large team of people that are involved in uh, putting the uh, NASA back together. There's uh, not only the 20 some odd thousand NASA employees, but there are all the contractors that we uh, work closely with. Uh, that's going to take some weeks, months, and uh, probably the full 18 months delay that is caused by the accident to uh, deal with it. Uh, I know of no better way, uh, Mr. Lewis, than to uh, talk to the people uh, at middle management uh, levels, at uh, top management levels, and to the extent that is possible for an administrator, uh, talk to the people that are at the working level. That's, as you know, difficult to do, but nevertheless, somehow or other, you've got to feel 
you know how the troops are feeling because motivation is just a key element in making this uh, complicated uh, piece of machinery work. And it's important that by the time we fly again, the team is properly motivated. Do you plan any uh, shakeups uh, in this point in time? Or are you going to get a new broom and do some sweeping? Or, uh... Mr. Lewis, we'll do whatever is required to uh, make the uh, management uh, team and, uh, and the whole organization function better. Uh, when people need to be replaced, we will replace them. Uh, when uh, we need to reorganize with, with different people or the same people, we will do that. Uh, it will happen not all at once, but uh, you'll be observing it as, as time goes on, and we'll keep you informed as we do it. The, uh, in, in the Rogers report, it points out that you should have um, uh, some sort of quality review and uh, quality management. And I'm just wondering if uh, you're looking to have a um, quality review and design review board uh, with the head of that board that uh, can get directly to you as the report suggests by the either uh, an associate administrator or what have you, and cut through the lower levels of management, either arc them or go straight through or set on the boards, someone like, uh, say, Admiral Truly or uh, Captain Crippen and, uh, or someone that uh, has been there knows the, uh, uh, that something must be done so that we don't uh, have uh, a lack of uh, application on uh, quality tests and things of that nature or redesign that, that can get to you. Mr. Lewis, uh, that, of course, is going to be one of uh, Admiral Truly's high priority items is to look at all of the uh, safety, reliability, and quality assurance uh, aspects. And I'm sure he's going to have uh, such groups reporting directly to him. In addition, however, as you probably know, uh, SR and QA, as we call it, reports directly to the administrator. And we have such a group now. Uh, the important thing is that they're able to get the information from where it, uh, it, it uh, is necessary to come so that free access to that safety uh, board uh, will be possible. In addition to that, as you know, we have a statutory uh, safety review board which was set up after the Apollo fire in 1967. And that uh, also reports to the administrator. That function, both of those functions will have to be tightened up considerably from my point of view, but I imagine Admiral Truly will want to do the same for his, his part of the organization. If I could offer you, if you, ask you to suspend at this point, and we'll return in about 15, 10 minutes, because we're on the second call. We'll recess for 10 minutes. When we uh, recess to go to vote, we were having a line of questioning being presented by the gentleman from Florida. The gentleman from Florida, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to um, ask Admiral Truly uh, a couple of questions about uh, the role that Captain Crippen will play. You mentioned that he will head the Shuttle Management uh, <coughs> Review Board uh, for the uh, various uh, agencies or various uh, groups, is that what his title will be? Uh, I don't know what his title will be. I haven't figured that out yet, but specifically. Well, could you clarify what his role will yes, be? Sir. Yes, sir. There are two specific commission recommendations. One is the second one, which deals with shuttle management structure. And the second, which is uh, uh, number five, which, in, which involves improved communications. Uh, those are complica complicated issues that I'm going to uh, have to decide what recommendation to uh, make to Dr. Fletcher so that we can get, that we can uh, do two things. First of all, look at the total uh, pro shuttle program management structure and, and revalidate that large portion of it that I'm sure will be revalidated, but change and streamline that portion if if, if necessary. I need someone to help me pull that together. Yes. And uh, it is specifically that that I'm going to ask Captain Crippen and uh, whoever he needs to uh, help him to pull together the options and look at it and see where the system could be uh, made better. And that's what he's going to be doing. I see. Do you, do you have any idea at this point who will be working with him? 
I, I hope to I hope to keep it to be a small group, but no, I, we have not selected uh, individuals. But I, uh, my, I would rather have a small group of maybe uh, three to five uh, people that would be the core group, so that they wouldn't uh, be a large committee. However, they will they will have full access, not only to all the management within the shuttle system and our centers, but also uh, people outside the agency. I see. Will there be uh, people from Marshall? Will Marshall have representation on his team? I, we just haven't selected the, uh, the individuals that will, uh, will help uh, Captain Crippen do this task. However, the Marshall uh, uh, management team will certainly be a uh, part of the look as he goes around and, uh, and takes a look at what we have now and where we ought to go. How will, will Cripp's uh, activities interface with what General Phillips' activities are? Well, uh, General Phillips uh, is going to look at the overall NASA agency, and it's anticipated that uh, when the time comes and uh, uh, CRIPS uh, task force is put together, they will interact frequently. But of course, uh, it's more important that we get on with the, uh, the shuttle management and communications aspect, and that's why uh, the first task is what uh, Admiral truly uh, described, get on with the shuttle communications and management. We haven't quite got to that point in, in General Phillips' review. I see. And one uh, final um, inquiry uh, for Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham, you uh, partially answered this this morning, and I'm mainly interested now that you, you have uh, been associated with NASA and you'll be going over to the Office of Science Technology uh, as the President's advisor. How do you um, visualize your role now uh, and working in uh, intra uh, activities with uh, NASA, with Dr. Fletcher and uh, Admiral Truly in get getting this program moving and back up in the air in space. Uh, Mr. Lewis, I have not yet focused on the uh, specific actions that I would undertake if I'm confirmed uh, to that job. However, no doubt that. there has been a strong uh, working relationship uh, between the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the uh, science advisor to the president in the recent past while I've been at NASA and I would like to continue that close working relationship and strengthen it certainly in the uh, in the scientific and the technology area where it's historically been uh, but also uh, uh, try to maintain a, a close cooperation with NASA in the area of the larger US space program the return to space flight and moving forward with NASA generally. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Gentlemen, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The, the uh, chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from California, Mr. Mineta. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Dr. Fletcher. <clears throat> Dr. Fletcher, I'm wondering if you could maybe uh, put me at ease a little bit. Um, you've been quoted as saying, um, if the U.S. space program is in turmoil, most of the chaos is external to NASA. And here we are in a position of having to sort of uh, look at ourselves as Congress, inward uh, at NASA, uh, and um, wondering whether we have the ability to reform ourselves. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering whether or not I may be unduly alarmed in terms of of taking a statement, and am I taking it out of context, or am I saying, uh, when you say that uh, most of the chaos is external to NASA, I'm just wondering whether or not uh, I'm being unduly alarmed about your statement. Uh, Mr. Mineta, I don't remember having made that statement, but uh, it's probably true that if it were made, it was made before I was nominated for the job. Whatever well, this the... was in last week's Newsweek. Oh, then I don't remember making that, but let me go on to say that um, there is not chaos within NASA. There's uh, some uncertainty, uh, as, as you might expect there, uh, there to be. We, we are undergoing uh, management um, reviews and probable management changes. Uh, people are uncertain as to when we'll be able to uh, fly safely again. People are uncertain about when their missions, the scientists, for example, will fly again. Uh, and so I would say rather than chaos within NASA, it's, uh, it's uncertainty. And uh, there is some 
evidence that we need to, to re, uh, reassert our goals within NASA, and we're in the process of doing that. <clears throat> You're not saying then that the NASA's okay, but the chaos is external to NASA? I don't remember saying the chaos, but uh, I can't really speak for the outside world, Mr. Mineta. The, um, the Office of, um, is it Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance that's now being talked about uh, to be created within uh, NASA, uh, I believe that's been recommended by the Commission. And I'm just wondering uh, whether you've had an opportunity to take a look at this uh, as to whether or not this uh, might be, <clears throat> this recommendation is going to be accepted. Um, and uh, I chair the Aviation Subcommittee for the Public Works and Transportation Committee. The FAA, for example, has a um, um, office for, for, for uh, airline safety create standards for airline safety, uh, but is it, it doesn't try to fly the airplanes uh, or um, adhere to schedules or um, make money. And I'm wondering if uh, this internal office is going to be insulated from the kind of, um, I guess, uh, the relationships that that would have, that office would have with other parts of NASA to be able to be really an office of, um, of um, safety, reliability, and quality assurance. Uh, Ms. Mineta, that's an extremely important function uh, in NASA. Uh, the current safety, reliability, and uh, quality assurance uh, program is, under the, is currently under the chief engineer. And uh, uh, reporting to him uh, are the uh, safety and, and quality, reliability and quality assurance uh, directors at each of the centers, and uh, all of these uh, report to uh, uh, the chief engineer. We think that whole process needs reviewing. Uh, it's more important uh, how well it's done and what the communications channels are and make sure that the uh, communications channels are good and the people at both the receiving and the sending end of those communication channels are competent and it's confidence, really, and uh, good judgment that counts in uh, reliability and quality assurance. And we will certainly take a look at that whole program, both NASA-wide and also within the uh, Space Shuttle program, as Admiral Truly will uh, undoubtedly uh, uh, start, or if he hasn't already. Among other findings of the Commission, <clears throat> They stated very expl explicitly that the thiol call management had reversed uh, uh, its position and recommended the launch of 51L um, at the urging of Marshall and contrary to the views of, uh, of engineers in order to accommodate a major customer. Uh, elsewhere, uh, the commission uh, talked about the sluggishness on the part of thiol and addressing the O-ring problems, notwithstanding memos from engineers and even from NASA itself on other occasions. And it's only in the aftermath of the accident that we're getting the sense that Thiokol is devoting uh, total commitment to this redesign and uh, uh, only now are projecting the can-do attitude about fixing the SRBs. I'm wondering, is it possible that we have a moral responsibility, maybe, uh, to look elsewhere for uh, the redesign and the resupply of the SRBs, uh, given Thiokol's um, interest in, in making uh, the, the SRBs, uh, and I'd say it, to the extent of even making money over safety. Given some of their actions since the accident, what I would even call unrepentant attitude, and um, so, uh, and also because of what they've uh, done to their two dissenting engineers, who uh, testified before the uh, Rogers Commission, and I'm just wondering whether or not we should be looking elsewhere for the redesign. 
Uh, Mr. Mineta, as you probably know, uh, we have asked the uh, uh, National Academies of Science, uh, uh, a body called the National Research Council, to form a uh, very uh, high-powered uh, task force to uh, not only uh, review the, uh, the various uh, ideas or suggestions and, uh, for design uh, for improvement of the seals, but also to certify that the tests on whatever designs we, we come up with uh, are adequate and they're going to follow these tests uh, as, we, as we proceed over the, the, the ensuing months. So the design will, and by the way, I should say that in addition to Thiokol, we have people at Marshall, we have people from uh, the Johnson Space Flight Center and probably other places that uh, uh, Mr. Aldrich or Mr. Truly will want to mention all involved in that, uh, in that redesign effort. So it's not just Thiokol that's involved, it's a large group of, I guess the expertise of the entire nation is involved in that redesign. Will the gentleman from California yield? Of course. Um, <clears throat> as we have been unfolding our hearing process uh, without too much reiteration, we spent yesterday analyzing and digesting the response from the commission. And then we have invited you good folks to come in today uh, to bring us up to date as to what your plans are, where you're at, and then specific questions that are being asked by different members. But obviously there's certain areas where the committee has concentrated on uh, in their observations, such as the safety area, the assurance area, the critical uh, items list, and so forth and so on. And I think that the key uh, safety, as was uh, brought out by so many members, and now I believe that uh, Mr. Mineta is striking at a very important point that has to be aired, in my judgment, and I'm sure the rest of the members, publicly. And, and I, I think I, it's important for me to interject at this point what our plan is after we review with you tomorrow and, and bring our, us all up to date on the technical uh, task force work. Starting next Tuesday, our plan is to start to bring in uh, outside witnesses, namely the manufacturers. And I think it's fair comment to say at this point the first one we plan on calling on Tuesday is Thiokol. Now, Thiokol centers upon the whole O-ring issue and the whole, well, the whole joint issue, I should say. But as the gentleman from California is developing, whether we agree or not and without trying to pin blame, because that's not what the commission did, nor is it what the committee intends to do, certainly not at this point. And it seems to me that the response from Thiokol their observations, what happened on the way to the forum, so as to speak, and what they've been directed to do as of now is an extremely important, vital point to the whole issue that we're speaking to, not only from the accident point of view, but down the road. Where do we go from here? What is our next step? But that also in intimately relates to the Marshall Center, as I understand it, because they're the ones who are the overseers, so to speak, and working on that issue. Now, I think what may be very, very profitable would be, there's an old saying that's written that I have on my wall in my office, and it says that more mistakes are made from lack of facts than from poor judgment. More mistakes are made from lack of facts than from poor judgment. I think it would be to the advantage of the committee, which we'll take up amongst ourselves a little later on, to consider bringing in the Marshall Space key people, technical people, I'm talking engineering people, at the time that we are interfacing with the Thiokol company. I think that might be extremely profitable so that we can get this matter up on the deck, number one, up front, and deal with it. First of all, to dispel any lack of facts, bring the facts forward as they are, if the gentleman would yield further from California, which is the process I believe you're following, so that there can be a response in both directions on that issue, rather than let time lag and all kinds of conjecture or uh, false concerns or whatever emerge. Does that sound reasonable? It sounds quite reasonable, Mr. Chairman. All right. Well, I, then, then I just wanted to make that point of the general yield further, so that is the direction I would choose uh, to go next Tuesday so that you can uh, develop in more depth your, your whole line of questioning. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Chairman. <coughs> If I might, uh, I'd like to ask a little more about the relationship between contractors and NASA. One question I have in this regard is, is this. Is there a standard operating procedure 
pertaining to the launch readiness procedures that was woefully ignored in the case of 51L and perhaps many times before. In the case of the SRBs, Thiokol was talking to level three people in NASA. On the other hand, it appears that Rockwell was uh, talking directly to level two people. Uh, moreover, Thiokol was asked for a written uh, affirmation of their consent to fly. Uh, Rockwell was asked for no such assurance. And it's unclear to me if anyone spoke to the external tank contractors about the ICE situation, or if so, what was the procedure at the time? And, and I guess what I'm asking is, are there procedures which need to be established, or perhaps have to be newly adhered to in order to make this process less erratic and, uh, frankly, uh, more importantly, uh, more reliable? Mr. Mineta, I'd, I'd like to start uh, to answer that question because it, it pertains to what we're really now doing very intensively. Uh, and then I'd like to ask Admiral, Tru Admiral Truly and his uh, associates to respond to the specific uh, point. Uh, obviously, we've got to tighten up our procedures and when we say communications, we, we mean communications and procedures. The communications have to fit the procedures and vice versa. You can't communicate one way and your procedures say something different. Uh, that has to be tightened up all, all uh, up and down the line from the lowest level to the highest level. Uh, having said that, uh, I think Admiral Truly will have to answer, but we really have just started that process and that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, Captain Crippen is here today. Dick, do you want to? <clears throat> the review that you suggested and uh, Dr. Fletcher referred to is, is the very reason that when I wrote into my strategy for uh, returning to safe flight under what we're going to do in a program uh, management uh, context, I specifically wrote in there that we were going to review a number of things and put in the words, including the launch commit process. Uh, certainly, looking to the future, certainly we're going to have one system, which I frankly think that uh, uh, we do now, and I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Aldrich in a moment to describe it, although he was not a part of the task force that did the investigation, but he at least, I think, can describe that process very uh, clearly. But I can assure you that uh, for the future, when that uh, we're going to have one, one procedure used by everybody, known to all. If I might ask uh, Mr. Aldrich to come in uh, about what the process and what the requirements are uh, today, I would like to do that. Uh, Mr. Mineta, uh, we spoke earlier about uh, some of the formality in this area in our review that we would add, including recording and including a more formal list of people for each type of meeting. The process, uh, as it has worked up to now, however, is documented and is uh, fairly clearly laid out in terms of responsibility. The flight readiness review process starts within the contractor, which could be called level four. It's the contractor for each element of hardware, does their own internal review of flight readiness, and then reports to a similar flight readiness review at level three, which is the individual center project elements. Uh, a level two review commences following that at the program level where each of the projects reports their readiness and it's finally culm 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 culminated in a review to Admiral Truly, the uh, Associate Administrator for Space Flight in a level one flight readiness review. And at that time there are formal documented sign-offs by both the NASA project elements involved and the contractors with regard to readiness, including any constraints or ongoing work, in addition to the detailed presentations to describe their readiness. That's about two weeks before launch, and then either one or two days prior to launch, there is a final meeting to tie off any loose ends or to look at any new developments that have occurred. That's normally called a launch minus one day meeting, but it might on some occasions be launch minus two days. There again, there's a formal presentation by each of the projects to the combined level two and level one management. And at the end of each of those presentations, there is again a sign-off that says the contractor and the project element is ready. Downstream of that review, there is then an operation put in place 
as the actual countdown proceeds, which where issues are brought forward to unscheduled but planned for and documented procedures which constitute an organization called a mission management team with formal membership. Those meetings are the ones which have been characterized in, in our early discussions as perhaps not a having the formality that we would like to see in the future. Although they are formal meetings, they're not recorded and there are not usually additional sign-offs involved. Specific issues that have come up as they are required to be treated are treated as close to real time as is possible by that group. And each of the discussions you mentioned with the two contractors were treated in these mission management kind of sessions, although the one with Thiokol was at a meeting at level three and was not really uh, involved with the total team as, uh, as I've described it here. Mr. Chairman, if I might ask very quickly, <clears throat> it appears that the information flows upward uh, in flight readiness reports, as you've mentioned, as uh, those, those are uh, abbreviated because of the closeness of, uh, of uh, launch time. But is there a mechanism between launches uh, where past readiness reports or past problems are reviewed in order to demand accountability for efforts to fix recurring problems? or to explain repeated waivers. I get the impression that Im information only percolates upward at the will of middle management people without corresponding accountability operating in reverse. Could I answer that one also? Uh, well, excuse I, me. I think uh, Mr. Aldridge should, uh, should answer that. On the other hand, uh, Mr. Mineta, I, I want to remind everyone that uh, information has to flow both ways. You can't have uh, communication as a two-way system. Yeah. The procedures uh, are written uh, in one way, but uh, we really, th this is a collegial, if you like, uh, system that we work in. Unless the, all members of the team, team at levels one, two, three, and four uh, uh, respect each other and communicate well with each other, this system won't work well. And yeah. uh, having said that, as a broad generalization, I'll turn to Mr. Aldridge for the specifics. Uh, specific answer to, to problems that occur in tracking from flight to flight, we have a formal and again a documented structure for the process which logs every flight pre and post flight anomaly which occurs with each of the elements, tracks that element to a res that problem to a resolution by the project element, it's then signed off at that level and brought forward to level two again for sign off and for each flight those that are not closed from the past flight are reviewed and specifically identified. So again, the intent is strong that we in fact do have a process of the kind that you, uh, that you brought up and we will certainly be attempting to strengthen that as we go forward also. Will the gentleman yield again for of me? Of course. Please. You know, um, again, I, I, I don't like to monopolize other members' times, but one of the key issues that is gnawing at many, many people in the process is uh, how could it possibly be that the information did not get up to the higher levels? Therefore, somebody had to make a decision in between uh, that they didn't either consider it important or they, were, they felt that they had the authority at that level to make that definitive decision. It's just extraordinary that the top of the heap didn't know. And that's what's, uh, what's annoying at us. And I think what the distinguished gentleman from California is developing, it's not only a two-way street back and forth, should there not be a mechanism in management that demands a two-way street where management at top is also asking? Or is management waiting for memoranda to come up through the line to be checked off and so forth? I don't mean to simplify it. And I think that if you could give us, if the gentleman would yield further, just a little bit of your overview there. But we're really coming back and saying there's got to be some methodology that's devised in management where management can handle particularly that kind of an issue. Is that reasonable? Mr. Mr. Rowe, if I may interject, uh, Admiral Truly, at least as long as he's associate administrator for uh, the, the space transportation, is not a shy person. And he is going to ask questions all up and down the line, both before just before the launch and also in between launches. Well, that's now, see, now. And, well, we're uh, glad that Admiral Truly is with us because we have a shoulder to rest on. I'm looking as to what happened before Admiral Truly got yes. here. Yes, and I, I just wanted to assure you that in the future, you'll have two ways communication and uh, 
I and Admiral Truly will see to that. Well, someplace along, along the line, as we re review, as you know, we're going to be looking into that to yes. see what process we're making. The gentleman from California. The gentleman yield. Be uh, pleased to yield to my. I'd just like to follow up, Dr. <clears throat> Fletcher. I think what concerns us, all of us, is that we've seen this report, and it, it apparently, the, the finding and conclusions of the report is, is, is simply that information seemed to flow freely down from the top, from levels one and two, but in rare circumstances did it flow the other direction. And I think all of us would like to get a sense of your view of that conclusion. What specifically do you think was wrong in the decision making? Is that a, is that a conclusion that you agree with? I, I have not um, participated in this um, back and forth with the commission. I've, I read the report. And well, what is your view of the report? And uh, it, it uh, is quite apparent after reading the report that there was some failure in communication somewhere along the line, just where it was and how it fit procedures and so forth. I'll have to leave to the people that were involved at the time, but uh, you, you can You do not have an opinion as to where that breakdown took place after reading the, the commission report? I, I would like to uh, reserve that opinion until I've uh, learned more about it. This is my fifth week on the job, and I have talked to the people on the commission. I've talked to our own people. I haven't visited Marshall Space Center. Do you Park agree Center. with their conclusions? Yes, I agree with their conclusions. The chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am particularly concerned that NASA has not been insistent that contractors comply with the specs in the construction of various items in the sh shuttle, specifically the solid booster rockets. Uh, we've seen some information that there were specs relating to ambient temperature that uh, have been completely ignored by Thiokol. And also the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Nelson, came up with information that Thiokol claimed to have tested the solid booster rocket at 21 degrees and when in fact that was not the case. What do you intend to do to ensure that the specs are complied with in the future? I think I'd like to uh, turn to Admiral Truly in a moment. Uh, I only became aware of that uh, statement today. Uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, take the statement in the context in which it was given, and then we, we need to respond in, in, in some depth because that's a serious uh, uh, allegation. Well, before Admiral Truly responds, uh, the Armed Services Committee has been frustrated repeatedly about the DOD not requiring defense contractors to comply with specs. And it ended up that they got so frustrated that the DOD authorization law was amended to allow for outside testing of new weapon systems that were delivered to the Defense Department. I think that unless this committee gets some assurance that NASA is going to require that the specs be complied with, that we ought to consider legislation similarly to take the spec compliance away from you and have someone from the outside make sure that the contractors are delivering what they're supposed to be delivering. Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, we are, we're going to see that the contractors uh, comply with the spec. I think the specific instance that uh, you mentioned, we really have to research further and I don't know to what extent our Admiral Truly's people have looked at that particular item, but we, we insist on uh, strict compliance with specs with our contractors. Well, yeah, obviously something big fell through the cracks as far as the solid booster rockets are concerned, and I hope that doesn't happen again. So, Admiral, why don't you tell us how it won't happen again? <clears throat> well, I can only echo what Dr. Fletcher said. I can assure you as part of our, uh, the review of every critical item on the, uh, on the shuttle program, we are looking at uh, design, re uh, design requirements the uh, the uh, f the fact and the testing history the uh, the uh, uh, flight history of that particular article and uh, it is absolutely necessary that when we have a requirement that a, that a, a program requirement that an item is tested to a certain temperature or to a certain condition and certified that way that 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 that, that in fact is the case and we will uh, uh, we will take whatever effort that it, we have to to ensure that. I would that point out. Has, does that mean <clears throat> telling the contractor that you didn't comply with specs and go over and do it again at your own expense? Of course. Sure. I mean, whatever it, whatever it takes. We, 
We uh, have, or I'm, let me also say, though, that, the, uh, that I am not personally familiar with this particular point that was apparently developed uh, by the Commission's uh, investigation. I'm going to get familiar with it as quickly as I can. Until I do, I would have to uh, say that uh, you have not heard all the evidence from the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, which uh, ran that level three or for the, from the contractor and uh, you and we certainly deserve to hear that uh, and, and, and we will get there. But for the future, uh, I can assure you that we will have uh, launch commit criteria that we know that the uh, certification is, is proper. Will the gentleman yield? I yield the gentleman from New Jersey. The, uh, <clears throat> As afternoon progresses after morning, people appear to be either become a little tired or a little testy, and neither is the case here. Uh, what, the, what the committee is interested in developing is the earlier discussion of the gentleman you would yield, that we were manifested our concern with the critical items, the one items and the one R items. And in our course of discussion this morning, we made the point of view that uh, and Admiral Truly did very well on that, and so did Dr. Fletcher, that there was just no question without rehashing. We're going to see that those particular elements are thoroughly reviewed from top to bottom. We have, you've already vitiated and negated all of the waiver system and so forth. I, I applaud. I think that's fine. One of the questions we came back and said, however, that developed from other folks was we were concerned. I believe it was Ms. Snyder from uh, Rhode Island made the point of view that it appeared that there was a a substantial reduction in the number of quality control people, at least numerical bodies. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, that's denigrated or reduced the quality control. There may be parts that you don't need anymore. We respect and understand that, but it was rather a substantial drop. Now, the gentleman from Wisconsin is developing the point of view, which is an extremely important point of view, which I think you ought to use the advantage to expand upon technically. But I'm going to ignore that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Now, the point then goes to the point of view is that if contractors, and we don't know how widespread this is, if contractors are not meeting their requirements that are under the, you know, their contract that they agreed to, then obviously they are, I don't want to say defrauding the federal government, but they are if they're not producing goods. If I'm asking for a bone, I don't want a dog. I mean, that's what I'm paying for, and that's what I expect them to deliver to me. And I don't mean to be facetious. Which leads to this point, if the gentleman would yield further. Mm -hmm. How widespread is that? If I'm going to come back and I'm going to inspect a critical part one, and I'm going to say we're going to review that whole thing, query, if I find any fallacies in the design, not the design, in the manufacturing, did that manufacturer meet the requirements that initially were uh, put on that product or that, that part or piece? That, that to meet the requirements that NASA required. Now, you ought to come back and say to us the following, if I may. You ought to get into the discussion, well, we're moving in that direction. We're not sure how far that went. But however, if we're constantly called upon to provide upgraded and improved parts to get from critical one to critical R1, or whatever the case may be, or get the very best part we can, we're changing this t the, t the, the uh, uh, terms and conditions and the specifications. Isn't that reasonable to say? If I have piece A that is not totally A number one and we found that if we shave that a little bit or put a little more canter in it, it's going to be a better piece, that's going to, then you have to issue a new specification. Is that not correct for somebody to make that part? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Mr. Chairman, I, I think I understand what you're saying. And of course, that's, that's the whole uh, purpose of the uh, RNQA, Reliability and Quality Assurance uh, Organization that we have. Uh, which consists of uh, not only our own RNQA, but we have um, contract monitors and uh, DCAS is done sometimes. Um, that's, a, that's a Defense Department <coughs> organization. But whatever is the case, it's absolutely necessary not only that contractors apply with the spe uh, comply with the specifications, but that we know that they comply with the specifications. Well, In addition to that, your second point is if we change the spec to, ch to tighten it up or, or, or to loosen it, as the case may be, we have to make absolutely sure that that contractor complies with that change spec. That's part of the RNQA system. But come system. Tuesday morning, we're going to go beyond the government's commissions and the government's 
representatives of NASA, including this committee, and we're going to be calling in the private sector. The private sector has already been convicted in the press. They've already been convicted in the press. Who is the bad guy? Now, what's essential for us to be able to assure the credibility of the future of the space program, that where all of the facts are involved, they must be on the table. And what we're, and I'm not admonishing you or being pedantic, and I think that the question of the gentleman, the line of the question of the gentleman's got is very important. Via coal is the bad guy. That's what's out in front on the deck right now. They have a right to defend themselves in the, port of, in, the, in the part of public opinion and what the facts are is the reason we want the Marshall people in here too at the same time. Now the, the, the evil that's floating here is, and it inures because of a document to that particular company, that they did not meet the plans and specifications that they were chartered to do and paid to do. That is what is before us, which is people have been alluding to. And the gentleman from Wisconsin comes back and he, expound, he expands on that. Because if there is one area that the specs haven't been met, query, have the specs been met in all the areas? And then the question is, it's not that we're going to do better. What specifically are we going to do to deal with that? Because if the specifications aren't being met, and that's the finest bit of engineering and the part is made from the engineering, and those specs aren't being made, we have immediately denigrated the safety factors involved. So what, I, if the gentleman forgive me further, what the gentleman is simply saying is someplace, I hope by tomorrow, or when we continue on, that we will be able to ferret out that process. And is there anything we're planning on doing to determine how wide a range this idea of not meeting specifications has gone? Is it in every area? Is it just in that area? It leaves a doubt is where I'm trying to come from. Yeah, I think you're right, Mr. Chairman. The first thing we have to do is ascertain the extent of the specific error that was made. But then, of course, as you properly point out, we need to look at the whole system to make sure that there aren't uh, a, a lot of errors if, if that was one similar to that one. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could Mr. Aldridge would like to make a, a comment if he, if yes, he might at this point. Uh, in that specific regard, uh, one of the actions for returning to space flight that Admiral truly had in his direction to the program and which we have acted on is a complete review of the design certification for each element of the space shuttle program. That is in process now at each of the contractors and each of the project elements at the NASA centers and it is a detailed review of every element, what the requirements are and how those requirements were verified to be met either by test or analysis, whichever was appropriate. In addition, we're also reviewing the environments that the shuttle must fly through and be exposed to as they are the basis for establishing the design requirements for the hardware. So a parallel activity also in process is revalidating and reaffirming the induced environments and then the process at each element, mm -hmm. contractor and NASA, to verify that the design certification is in fact still valid mm -hmm based not only on any changes that might have occurred, but as, as Admiral Truly pointed out, we now have a number of flights of experience in the performance mm -hmm. of the specific hardware and factoring that into the, in, into the analysis mm -hmm. as well. I think this is a, an important piece of the total amount of work we're doing, and it's complementary to the critical mm -hmm. items list review, which uh, I discussed earlier. Uh, may I reclaim my time? I have the one other line from, of questioning uh, I'd like Wisconsin to pursue. Wisconsin has the time. Um, Apparently, the Rogers Commission is not all that trusting of NASA, at least insofar as the redesign of the solid rocket motor to make sure that the specs are complied with and that the safety factors are adhered to. Because on the bottom of page 198 of the Commission report, it does specifically suggest and recommend independent oversight in terms of the design recommendations and the effort that the Commission is, is suggested in terms of the SRMs. Does NASA intend to have independent oversight as the Commission has suggested? Uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, we have uh, set up a, a team uh, appointed by the National Academy of Science and Engineering, uh, which we call the National Research Council, headed by uh, Dr. Guy Stever, one of the officers of that organization, and they, are, they have been busily involved in, in uh, helping with the redesign of that seal, I would say for the last three weeks, something like that, uh, 
So they, we, we got advance warning of that particular recommendation in our, in the pro, and have implemented yeah. it. I don't think that that's what the commission had in mind, uh, that the National Research Council would be in on the redesign because, you know, that makes them in part of the team. Uh, I think what the commission had in mind from reading the paragraph that's in the report uh, was that after the redesign took place, uh, that the independent oversight made sure that the Commission's recommendations were adhered to. And while I was not able to be here this morning because the Judiciary Committee was marking up the immigration bill, uh, the report that I got of this morning's hearing was that you all were less than precise in terms of saying which part of the Commission's recommendations you would adhere to. And I'm just very concerned that at least this part of the Commission's recommendations be adhered to and that somebody from the outside look at the redesign of that solid booster rocket motor uh, so that we won't have another cozy arrangement that apparently led to the disaster. Uh, that particular recommendation, there's no question about we have accepted and we are implementing it. Okay, thank you very much. I'll yield the gentleman from New York if he wishes to. Okay, Mr. Aldridge, you said you're reassessing to make certain that the design specs are valid. What I want to know is who makes certain that the design specs are met? Is it the reliability and quality assurance people? Uh, I'm sorry, I meant to uh, specifically indicate not only that the specs are valid, but also that the design of the hardware and the testing and analysis of that hardware assures compliance in an engineering sense. And that's done by the full engineering elements available to each of the projects, both NASA and government, not only the uh, R&QA organizations in each organization, but also their primary design engineering organization and their project management as well. Fine, thank you. The uh, chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from Tennessee, Mrs. Lloyd. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Fletcher certainly is privileged to me to be able to welcome you back. I feel like I'm a real old timer that uh, we're here together after all these years. Mm -hmm. And also to see your, your colleagues that are with you and we appreciate your time and the attention that you're giving this matter. I'm really playing hopscotch back and forth. I'm attending hearings across the hall on some of the problems that the TVA has. In this hearing, we're trying to assess a, a tragedy, and across the hall, we're trying to prevent a tragedy. But in the two hearings, it seems to me that there are so many parallels, that um, there are so many matters that were not brought to the top managerial level. There was a lack of communication. There was a lack of focus on uh, on a really uh, design perfection. And one of the statements that, that really uh, brought home to me in one of the, in the testimony from across the hall, management's overriding concern for cost and schedule has led to the faulty design and construction of TVA's nuclear power plants. Well, this is bad, but to me what, it, what is even worse is that I really think that, um, that safety in itself is, is superficial. I think that we're talking about something that's so much broader than safety. I think that safety is something that happens. I think what we're talking about is quality workmanship and management and a level of performance in this agency. Now, it seemed to me that the NASA of the 70s is, was really known for its, its excellence and that this high degree of safety was something that was part of the picture. It was something that happened whether the, the agency is designing or engineering manned or unmanned systems. And wouldn't you agree that, that if we put the proper picture in, if we put the, the proper perspective in and, and demand that the quality and, and excellence, that safety will be the byproduct? Well, I think that safety, of course, is the primary concern, but the things that you mentioned, Mrs. Lloyd, is, are absolutely uh, essential to safety. You've got not only to have uh, high quality and high reliability on all the parts, but you've got to have uh, competent judgment on all these things with the people involved. And there has to be good communications, as was mentioned earlier, between the people. So if there's a question about some item, uh, everyone's free to, to raise the question with, with its, his uh, uh, associate or uh, compatriot and uh, resolve the issue. Uh, that's all part of what we mean by safety, but certainly reliability uh, and quality of design is an essential part of safety, yes. See, to me, there was a blatant disregard for any real communication 
but between between your levels. But another thing that, that really disturbs me is the distinction that we've heard yesterday and today between technical people and, and the management people. Now, what really happened, I, I don't really want to date us, Dr. Fletcher, but what happened to the technical manager in aerospace that made these decisions? We had people that had the, the sufficient data to act upon. We had people like George Lowe and Werner von Braun, a Abe Silverstein. Now, why don't we have people like that today? That they're technical managers. Uh, Mrs. Lloyd, uh, it's interesting that you should uh, raise those names. Of course, Werner von Braun is uh, gone and George Lowe is gone, but we did have uh, General Sam Phillips and uh, uh, Dr. Eberhard Rees and uh, Brainerd Holmes and Abe Silverstein, some of the old time veterans, we call them. They didn't That's like right. to be called old timers. They were old -timers managers. In uh, about two weeks ago and had an interchange right. with the current uh, people. And uh, I think that uh, the main difference if I might uh, summarize what we came up with, is that uh, they, there was a collegiality in that group which has to be redeveloped uh, among our own people and is in the process of, of being so. Uh, they, they had no questions about the confidence of our people. Those, of course, were giants because they were the people that uh, uh, put us on the moon and, and brought our astronauts back safely. But we have giants, uh, potential giants in NASA now we have to make them work together properly as a team. Well, I referred to NASA as a wounded eagle yesterday, but I really think that if we are going to fly again, we're going to have to make the demand for excellence and the quest for excellence uppermost in, in the NASA program. And we want to be a part of that, that we, that we will not settle for less. And this committee and the oversight functions as, as well as I'm sure that you and Admiral Truly and Captain Crippen share my, my goals. Yesterday we also learned that um, hindsight is a lot easier than oversight, but I, I would like to uh, review the comparison between uh, Apollo 204 fire and, and the accident. It seems to me that the flaws are, are so much broader now than, than they were 20 years ago and that certainly our resources are more limited than they were 20 years ago. And it seems like that we're going to have to make some policy issues where we're going to go in, in our program, such as we uh, decided to go ahead with the Apollo program. Where do you think that um, we were going now? What, what, is you, what do you think is going to be our main goal? Well, Mrs. Lloyd, uh, that's, a, that's a broad question, but let me give you some broad, uh, broad answers. Uh, allowed for your perspective. The best I can. Our first and foremost goal is to uh, uh, return the space shuttle to safe flight. Uh, as, as soon as we feel it is safe to fly, we will do so. Uh, and we will, we will carry the missions that uh, have been assigned to us to carry, but very carefully. And uh, Admiral Truly and his colleagues are going over the proposed manifest uh, very carefully. Uh, following that, then we, we plan to launch the payloads that we've talked so much to you about over the years, the crucial scientific payloads, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope and the, uh, uh, the, the various uh, Centaur missions, Galileo, Ulysses, Magellan, and so forth, the Space Lab. So following, uh, so following return to flight, we'll, we'll pursue those programs. The little bit longer term goal you also are aware of is to get to the space station, and we need to have an adequate transportation system, both to carry men and equipment back and forth to that space station, but also to assemble the space station. So we have to have a reliable space transportation system to do that. Beyond that, we make studies. We have no, no, uh, no commitments. We have some guidelines that have come to us from the Tom Paine Commission, but uh, uh, he's, he proposes uh, several alternatives, uh, an advanced transportation system to replace the shuttle, for example, is one. The National Aerospace Plane is, 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 is a possible other direction to go, which is already in the process of being implemented. And finally, we can't forget that our long-range mission is to move out into space with uh, uh, men and women and equipment and do useful things, and that includes the moon and Mars and places like that. That may have to wait till uh, the turn of the century, or at least until there's a change in the budgetary environment uh, Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Yeah, thank the gentleman. The gentleman from California, Mr. Packard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back to NASA, Mr. Fletcher, the fiery furnace apparently at the present time anyway. Um, I'd like to follow the same uh, common thread of questioning this afternoon. Uh, I'm still not satisfied that we have all of the commitments that I would be looking for. The Commission found that um, the joint testing and the certification process um, was inadequate. Uh, what is your understanding of what the Commission means by those inadequacies? Well, I, uh, I'd have to refer to uh, Admiral Truly and his colleagues, uh, if you don't mind, Please. Mr. Packard. Let me, give him, <clears throat> let me give you my view, and I would suggest that that, that would be a good question tomorrow for the, for the head of the accident team. I think what the Commission was saying there, and is saying, is that if we had had, prior to the first flight of the shovel, shuttle, the experience of the uh, about a thousand tests that we have done since January 28th on the joint performance of the solid rocket motor, uh, we would not have flown that design. We knew far mo we know far more about it, and we can uh, we can credit that to hindsight if we want to. But the commission concluded, and so did the task force, and so did I think the uh, technical people, both at Thiokol and at Marshall, that we did not understand the uh, the performance of that joint, and I think that's what the commission meant. And I do not wish to dwell on hindsight either, because, but I, sim I certainly want to profit in, in where we go from here in developing that process so that there are not those inadequacies in our redesign of this joint, plus the looking at other inadequacies in the system that have already been identified. Uh, I think what distresses me and, dis and disturbs me the most is, is that we do not have in these areas, some of which are very critical areas, uh, we have ongoing rethinking and redesigning of those, those areas, but we do not have a good flow of those redesign factors into the system, the, the, the launching system. A good illustration is the brakes, which we know that there are flaws there. We've had problems. It's almost like the joint. They have manifested themselves in mission after mission. and. Um, and yet we have not moved into a new design to correct that problem. And I'm not suggesting that we stop all flights until we correct that problem. Uh, sometime, it was, certainly it would have been beneficial to have done that with this, with, with the joint. But that's not, I, I suppose, what we would expect. But there ought to be a time when a, the new design is moved into the system over a period on, on the long-term uh, picture. life and, and, and equipment. I, I guess my question is, are we going to see the redesign of these other areas that we know are weak moved into to, uh, the system without delay and at the same time without uh, rescheduling um, the launches? Uh, Mr. Packard, uh, Admiral Truly can give you, uh, and his colleagues can give you a better answer, but uh, let me just say uh, very quickly that uh, since we are down because of the uh, the seals and the rocket uh, booster, solid rocket booster, we are taking a look at all of those items, uh, particularly the ones you mentioned, but uh, a list of uh, a l much longer list of items. And some and may uh, come up with Mr. Aldridge's uh, point may, that he may made, where well. you will review all of your specs. Uh, and so I think that at least is being addressed. The first part of your question. Uh, Suppose there are new things that come up during future flights. Isn't there a way to phase those uh, new 
redesigns into the, um, into the um, space shuttle transportation system so that uh, we can fix, fix it as we go along, and I think that will be part of our plan for the future. I see that we have brake problems, we have tire problems, we have steering problems, we have main engine motor problems, or mo main motor problems, and I'm not persuaded that we are making the kind of progress on these other weak areas uh, to the point where we won't end up with another accident caused not by a, an improved design on the, on the um, joint, but, um, but on a weakness in the main motors or some other problem. I was at the landing where I think it was three tires blue, and, and that was alarming. And I think it is critical and could be a cost life and, and, and equipment. I, I guess my question is, are we going to see the redesign of these other areas that we know are weak moved into to, uh, the system without delay and at the same time without uh, rescheduling um, the launches? Uh, Mr. Packard, uh, Admiral Truly can give you, uh, and his colleagues can give you a better answer, but uh, let me just say uh, very quickly that uh, since we are down because of the, uh, the SEALs and the rocket uh, booster, solid rocket booster, we are taking a look at all of those items, uh, particularly the ones you mentioned, but uh, a list of, uh, a l much longer list of items. And some and may uh, come up with Mr. Aldridge's uh, point may, that he may made, where well. you will review all of your specs. Uh, and so I think that at least is being addressed. The first part of your question, uh, suppose there are new things get, that come up during uh, future flights. Isn't there a way to phase those uh, new redesigns into the, um, into the uh, space shuttle transportation system so that uh, we can fix, fix it as we go along? And I think that will be part of our plan for the future. That's, I, I don't want to speak for Admiral Truly, but uh, that, that's my opinion. Well, I was uh, going to request the opportunity uh, as an example on the brakes to ask Mr. Aldridge to say a word because I view the brake problem as an entirely different sort of a thing than what caused this accident. The brakes have, it is true that we have had uh, brake uh, problems over the years. As a matter of fact, I flew the second flight of the Enterprise on approach and landing tests in 1977, and uh, that was the first indication. Uh, it was the second flight of the shuttle, and it was the first indication of a problem with brakes. However, from the time that that happened until today, the program has worked the brakes, the brakes very hard. It is true, and, and we have moved out and had planned to move out prior to this accident on a, uh, on a redesigned brake that, that will be uh, 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 accomplished during this uh, period, and we need to do that. But there's a big difference in working difficult, complicated, and contentious uh, technical problems on top of the table and having a problem where the, a breakdown in communications doesn't elevate the severity of it so that we do work it as a system. Uh, we'll never make space flight totally risk-free. I know. It can't, it can't be done or we just ought to quit and not, not try. But, uh, but those other concerns in the Commission's report, and, I, and, and in no way do I want to uh, say that I don't go along with those concerns, because I do. But, uh, but those are concerns that have been worked in a different manner, I think, than this solid rocket motor joint. And to me, that's a, it's a big difference. One, one very quick question, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that will re hopefully only just require a short answer. Um, at no place in your report or in our discussion have you indicated that you would report and brief this committee or parts of this committee on redesign submissions and, and considerations of the joint. Um, I presume that we would become a very important part of that, that review before there was any money out. Well, obviously, we would not allocate funds for those redesigns until we were satisfied that they would meet the requirements. Uh, true, the, uh, the National Research Council and a variety of other in-house organizations will look at them. I've not seen any commitment that they would come back to us before they were approved. Uh, Mr. Packard, that is our intention, to bring before this committee uh, oh. design changes, improvements, gradual steps towards the, uh, the eventual uh, reflight uh, as we go along. Uh, the that gentleman was, would yield. Yes. I assure the gentleman from California 
As long as the gentleman from New Jersey is in the Congress of the United States, along with the other people on this committee, there'll be no flights around here until this committee is satisfied that the requirements and the law is met. And I think that that's what Dr. Fletcher is saying. And I think that point ought to be made abundantly clear because the, the, if the gentleman would yield, the, the point has been out, well, shall Congress take a, a closer oversight? And I think that's, as you're doing things in, in NASA to revamp NASA, that's already been decided. So the answer, sir, is not only the, the funding, it's the action of this committee through oversight and through allocation of, of right. authorizations. If the gentleman would yield further, I, I want to back up a little bit on uh, Mr. Packard's comment on the landing gear and the tires and the other areas. Now, I hope, and I think that's the point you were developing, I, I hope that when we spoke of critical items, let me ask a question, if you, the gentleman will forgive me. Is, is the problem of the landing gear a critical item? Is that in any one of the, is that critical one or one R? Uh, excuse me. Yes, it's criticality one. Criticality one. Now, to me, criticality means that, hey, guys, that's as bad as anything else in the criticality one. Is that a reasonable point? We don't have any, any diversification. We say that if it's, if it's critical one, to me, that's critical one. It's all go or no go. Is that, on, am I wrong in understanding your, your, your nomenclature? It's criticality one in that failure can be uh, catastrophic. That's the point I'm making. Uh, however, design margins can be in, enhanced tremendously, and that's what we're trying, attempting to do with the brake redesigns. That, yeah, but uh, that, that, that's not the point I'm making, and I think it's terribly important because I, don't, I want our hearings to have been thorough and not spongy. And there's nothing personal in what I say. I'm, I'm not as articulate as some other people in getting their point across. But it seems to me, basically, when the commission spoke to the critical areas, they said must. Now, to me, that means, you know, that can be translated, or translated into legislation, too. I'm sure you're aware of that. If it's a critical item and you take X items and you put it on the number one list, now, the number one list, as you say, that could be a list, anything that would happen on that particular part or piece could be critical to the extent of causing a severe accident or even death. Is, is that, isn't that what critical one's about? Yes. Well, now, how can we then take the point of view that as important as the O-ring is, which is the heart of this particular process that we're going through now, certainly the landing gear is critical. Anything else that's critical one is also critical. Would we say that, and I'm thinking down the line in this direction, we have three orbiters that we have to retrofit. And any decision that's made ultimately by Dr. Fletcher's folks and you, your people, if you're going to take a critical item one on that has to be redone, it means it's got to be redone on all the orbiters. Isn't that correct? Wouldn't you say that be correct? Yes, the design I mean, basically, fixes otherwise, we what are we, we're not going to fix up one and let the other three sit there and do nothing. I mean, you know, the, we, we don't want to get too testy today, but we're talking about play, taking parts from here, there, and whatever. If we're going to provide you with the tools to do the job, Congress is equally as important and responsible to provide the resources which we expect NASA to come back and tell us and say, if you want the totally safe system, this is what's going to cost you. Now, if Congress wants to play the games and not provide the funding, then they're not doing their job to the American people either. It's not up to NASA to tell Congress what they should or should not be doing. It's up to us to understand from you, if I were king, what would I do is the best thing in the country. That's what's before us today. That's what we're trying to decide. We want to be able to go back to the full Congress and say, if you're really serious about being in space and we've crystallized the safety issue, which we've done, we're coming back and saying, sir, we need these assurances. We need these testing. This is what we need. Now, it's up to us from a management point to determine what you need and how you're going to do it, and you tell us that. Now I go back to the criticality issue. Well, if we're going to fly anything, it would seem to me that the critical items are first and foremost in this committee's mind. And anything that would not meet those needs, the O-rings notwithstanding, we consider that to be important, including those, those landing gears. Now, does somebody want to respond? Pardon my enthusiasm, but I get enthusiastic. Admiral, about. truly having flown the uh, orbiter, I think ought to respond at least about the brakes. I would hope so. Well, I, uh, uh, I want to tell you that, that what you just said, I'm a thousand percent in agreement with. All right, then we'll if vote. There are, if, all right. <laughs> If there are, uh, and that's what this review that, that Mr. Aldrich is heading up is precisely 
doing, and that is looking at those items, re-looking re at the design. If they require fixing, we're going to fix them before we fly. However, uh, there are cases where, there in a, uh, where we could fly, for example, uh, there, there may be a case where we could uh, put restrictions on the flights uh, and fly three flights under restrictions before, because of the lead time in uh, do it. So there's a lot of things in there. But flew 24 flights. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. I don't want to beat this horse to death. But I, what I'm trying to get across, we said that as far as as NASA and the eloquent presentation Dr. Fletcher made at the beginning, which I just love because he said, "Hey, we maybe we well, let's get on with it." But it seems to me that if we're going to get the answers back from you folks now, and we're going to get the answers tomorrow from a technical, all we know is the facts. Now we're coming back and we're saying, yes, sir, those things have to be repaired and we're not going to gamble anybody at this point until they are repaired. And Congress ought to be able to say to NASA in response, if we're going to need these funds and these kinds of, of resources to be able to do the best we know how in America, as far as safety is concerned, that's number one. Now, we don't want to talk about necessarily redundancy in every part. That's not practicable. We understand that. But we are coming back and saying, yes, we could fly if the temperature was a little here and we didn't have that ice, and I don't want to, I'm not, uh, the answer is no. We're coming back and saying that everything that's on that critical list to us is critical. And everything that's on it, and that's what I want to be able to say when we finish our work. You understand where I'm coming and from? And I agree with you. Okay. Mr. Gentleman Chairman, from California. Gentlemen, just, just, gentlemen, gentlemen, just a moment on a break question. Before I do, let me make a comment on, on what the chairman has just said. And that was the whole point of my question. We had nine years of forewarning on the joint, that it was a flawed joint. There should have been redesign going on during that period of time and a phasing in so that uh, as long as we stayed within the, within the parameters that made uh, even a flawed joint uh, fly safely for 24 missions, uh, that, was, that was acceptable. But but we, we should have corrected that joint long before the nine years was up. I'm saying the brakes, the main motors, and other critical areas that we already know have got some flaws in the design and need to be corrected, we ought to be on about doing that and phasing it in and not wait for an accident to force us to, to phase it in. Gentlemen, now, now I'll be happy to you. Yes, and along that line of the redesign, I'd like to know if the redesign includes uh, eliminating it from the criticality uh, uh, list for abort missions, where you have an abort, which is a lot different than after you've unloaded the payload bay. Are you, are you speaking again about the brakes or yes. the land gear? Yes. And of course, the landing gear, the uh, criticality. Gear and all. Yes, criticality one items are items uh, that are. Uh, that must not fail because they would uh, cause the loss of vehicle or crew. Uh, in the case of the brakes, and incidentally, uh, we have at level two, Mr. Aldridge has approved the new brake design and money, and I have approved it at, at level one, and it is uh, being turned on and we're going to do it. Uh, that will, will not take, however, the brakes out of being a criticality one or one R item. They are still. Uh, that that critical, and they're that critical for aborts or end of mission landings, whenever we would land the shuttle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further. Questions. All right. Well, I, just to clarify that point, I think we we understand exactly what you're saying. You're saying, look, we're but we're going to do we're going to be able to present the best we know how to do. But it still stays on criticality one because if anything happened to it, we can still have the problem. But if we know something's wrong, you, you understand where I come from? All right. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Andrews. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to go back to Mr. Mineta's line of questioning. I think the issue of the decision to launch or not to launch is so fundamental uh, to, to these hearings and certainly to the Commission's findings. I'd like to know, Dr. Fletcher, uh, if you concur with the view that I believe the Commission is saying that the information flows downhill pretty easily but coming back in the other direction, there has been some serious problems and breakdowns of communications. Is that a fair assessment of the situation? Uh, Mr. Andrews, of course, I'm, I've only been here a short time, but uh, I, I, I accept the committee's 
views on that. They, they have worked with our own people and uh, they've worked long and hard and so I, I, I have to accept the fact that their, uh, uh, their conclusion is correct. What, what do you think the largest problem is? I think there's a large number of problems, uh, Mr. Andrews, uh, uh, all of which have to be looked at. It has what to what do, are those problems? It has to do with the procedures. Um, it has to do with the what, what definition of the procedures that, that are uh, written down uh, so that people can follow them. And when uh, they're not followed, we have to have a, fo uh, a way to check on uh, any, any uh, deviation from those procedures. But ha that's not the only thing. You have to have two-way communications, as we uh, mentioned before. You've got to be able to interrogate people all the way up and down the line and, from and level four. And what has been the most serious problem with that? Uh, in the past, I, I really uh, can't comment. I've been gone for nine years, and I, I think somebody else that was involved in the investigation would have to answer that. But that, in the future, is, is the thing that we're talking about when we say tighten up procedures and communications. Well, the gentleman from Texas here for a moment. Yes. I think what we, in our enthusiasm today, and I'm probably the most guilty one of the whole group that are here, that we have to recognize that the leadership that's visiting with us today and testifying are all relatively new. They've had, you know, I would say uh, years and years of experience, but they're back into the stream now. And I think that part of what the commission is saying to us is that these are the, group, the broad base areas where these major problems resolve, and then are looking down the road for this new team to resolve them. And it would seem to me that if the general knew further, that I would hope that from our committee's point of view, that after we uh, finish at this particular phase we're going through and you get back to work, then we will call you in from time to time to bring us up to date as to exactly what management improvements are being made, what exact the technical improvements are being made, and so forth and so on. For what that's worth to the gentleman's line of question. Well, then let me ask that question to Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham, what do you think the most serious flaw has been in the decision-making process to launch or not, or not to launch? Uh, I have uh, more time at NASA uh, during this tour than Dr. Fletcher because he has weeks and I have months. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't uh, represent that as uh, comprehensive. Nevertheless, in my experience there, I believe there <coughs> There has been a serious problem in the information flow upward, as you identify, and I believe that goes, goes up uh, to the top of NASA, uh, to the, uh, the administrator's office itself, and certainly to level one, and I believe to level two as well. Uh, that's, a, to some extent, an, an issue of the of the uh, entire internal environment in NASA and the way it functions, the way information is received at the, at the upper levels of the organization, the way it's understood, and the feedback that's provided. Uh, I have tried to establish a policy of not shooting the messenger uh, when information comes up, even though the information may not be information that uh, uh, goes in the direction that you would like the program to take, but rather to try to change the program and give the appropriate guidance and feedback to the system, but to encourage the flow of information. I believe that has to be done over a, a substantial period of time and at a number of levels for information to come up through the system. As you know, that's, that's caused some problems as well. In fact, I had to uh, change the internal organization to remove uh, one person out of the information flow line to make sure it came to me more quickly after the accident. Uh, I think that and other things are uh, beginning, we're beginning to set a tone inside NASA to encourage information flow, and I believe Dr. Fletcher is extremely receptive to information of all sorts coming up through the system. That, I think, is an absolute mandate on the administrator's office in order to have the information flow absolutely essential to run a system such as the shuttle. Captain Crippen, uh, would, you, would you comment on that? What in particular, it appears obvious that the <clears throat> astronauts have not had adequate input themselves into the decisions to launch or not to launch. And what specific steps do you think need to be undertaken right away by NASA to change that? 
Ms. Mr. Andrews, if I may comment on the on the initial problem. Of course, what the commission was addressing was the fact that the information regarding all of the failures within the O-ring itself and had not flowed forward over the years adequately such that it was emphasized as to its criticality. And then when we got down to the actual launch and we had temperatures that were low and certain engineers were concerned about that, that information did not flow up. I do not think that that means that the whole system was not flowing information properly. I think it does point out a, a specific flaw and we probably had others, but it does say that we have to go back and re-examine our information flow. People have emphasized that the astronauts did not know. Just telling the astronauts is gonna, not going to solve the problem, although if somebody come and whispered in our ear we had a problem there, we'd have probably brought it forward. The proper way to bring it forward is through our program managers, uh, and that is the way the astronaut office normally gets informed, and I believe that's the proper case. Uh, per the task that Admiral Truly has assigned to me, uh, I am going to try to propose an organization that does give us information flow, smooth information flow, both up and down. Uh, I think uh, we said that the information flow down is good. Maybe, maybe we information down was not communicating properly to, uh, to the people down in the trenches that, yes, we were interested in flying at an accelerated rate, but we were still interested in doing it safely. Maybe that information wasn't conveyed properly. Anyway, those are the kinds of things. Up and down has to be smooth, and it has to be simplistic to do that. That also follows over directly to the launch decision process. When The closer you get to flight, the faster it has to flow and it has to flow very smoothly and people have to know who can call the signals. And those are the kinds of things that we're going to be working on over the next few weeks to try to see if we can come up with a proposal that uh, will at least make that work better. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I regret I missed about one hour of the hearing earlier this afternoon, but uh, an unanswered or unasked question continues to trouble me, so I'll ask it even though it's simple and basic. basic. And I'll begin, I think, with Admiral Tully, truly, if I may. In your opening statement, you suggested, you said you were in general agreement with the findings and recommendations of the Rogers Commission report. Do I take it that uh, that leaves you some leeway to suggest you're not in complete agreement? Or No, I want to make it clear that, uh, that uh, uh, there are some choices that the commission left us very appropriately. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I, I, even though I, I did not see a single one of these specific recommendations until the report was published and was not privy to them, I discussed them many times with commission members and with Chairman Rogers, including, incidentally, the, the oversight of our SREM uh, redesign. I think that is uh, very appropriate, and I'm, I'm glad he recommended it and uh, it, sh it should be should be done uh, I don't know of a single recommendation in here that uh, I am not in agreement with however there are some choices in it for example uh, uh, the choice of uh, where in the organization the uh, the person that runs uh, safety reliability and quality assurance is a choice that the administrator will have to consider and, and make the, uh, the choice in the redesigned testing of horizontal versus vertical testing. The commission, you notice, did not, did not uh, direct us to test vertically. They directed us to uh, assure that we looked at it and uh, made a, a reasonable decision. I forget exactly what the words are. And uh, we've already uh, quite a ways along that track to do so. Uh, but. But uh, I am in agreement with this approach. As far as I'm concerned, this is a great roadmap to get started with, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy with it. So, yes. I think it's also we ought to get on the record that through Dr. Fletcher and yourself and Dr. Graham that you, there's a host of other things that are, are, are emanating from NASA itself in its own program. It's not just this group you're looking at. There's a whole other thing that the new management group is looking at. Is that a fair comment to make? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's what I tried to uh, indicate in my open remar opening remarks. Having said that, though, I think I want to reiterate what uh, Admiral Truly said, namely that we're taking this uh, commission report very seriously, 
as an important part of what we're doing to fix the shuttle. I, I just want to, Dean, if I'm I may, sure. Mr. Chairman, yeah, my, uh, we're all taking it seriously. I just want to have on the record that the agreement is complete and unequivocal, acknowledging that obviously in a number of areas, particularly technical areas, uh, discretion was given to you. The reason I raised the question was because you chose the word general agreement in your written testimony, but also when Mr. Aldrich was responding mm -hmm. uh, to one of the earlier questions, I think by Mr. Scheuer or uh, Mr. Nelson, relative to the safety appeals outside safety process, uh, he suggests, well, I'm in general agreement, but not in particular agreement. And what I would like to have as clearly as possible to those areas in which a complete agreement doesn't mean unequivocal agreement, uh, some, some guidelines. I mean, that's clearly to me as a layman, uh, this report is going to be my handle in trying to follow what you're doing and what else you're doing. May I follow with another question? I am concerned as then we deal with the recommendations that at some point uh, the agency make available to the members of the committee some uh, establishment of written objective criteria by which it believes it will, once having implemented, satisfy the recommendation. Um, I'm concerned a little bit about getting caught in a little bit of mishmash um, in this sense, particularly because most of us here uh, are not engineers and technically qualified, and yet we bear responsibility to oversee. Uh, for example, uh, when we had the earlier testimony by Mr. Aldrich that each subsystem uh, was, devi was devised and certified uh, to be 31 degree uh, workable on the low end temperature wise, and yet to find out that the subcomponent parts were not so certified. I don't know how you have a subsystem without the parts. Uh, meeting that criteria. I mean, that obviously was one of the issues here. Uh, can we get some assurance that uh, you're going to give us some working definition along the way as to what you mean uh, by measurable objective criteria, whether it be the brakes, the OCL problem, what have you. So we have something we go back and we talk to commercial engineers or other engineers and say, does that do the job? Uh, you you meant, mentioned several things but let me comment on one of them. As far as taking the report seriously, as you know, we, we are obliged to respond to that report in a number of months. I've forgotten the exact number. And we will, that will be a written response and, and done in, in, in some depth. Uh, we are trying to give you a general feeling about our reactions mm -hmm. to the response, which are, are positive. We, we, we think the recommendations are right on target. It's something that I would have done had I been as smart as that commission. And so that part, uh, I think we, we can assure you that you will get um, uh, a very definitive response. With regard to the other issues that we ourselves are looking at and the criterion for uh, what, uh, what is safe and what is, uh, is not safe, guidelines as you, as you call them, I think uh, you're entitled to have a feel for that, but we haven't yet developed them. After all, we've, sure. we just started the... Uh, uh, response. Thank you. Don, you want to wait? <clears throat> Don, you're up next. Do you want to wait till we return from this vote? This second call. Chairman Fuquay, do you uh, say you're up next? But do you would you rather wait? And I'm trying to find out what type of quorum call we have. It's a vote. It's a live call. A second live call. Ten minutes we'll have to, yeah. Oh. The, com the committee yeah. will recess for 10 minutes while we go and vote. Bear with us. That's the way the world works. <laughs> have, you, have you been a part of this before? When we broke up for the vote the last time, we were about to defer to our distinguished chairman, the Honorable Don Fuquay from uh, Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I know to Dr. Fletcher and all his associates uh, that this has been a long day, and uh, uh, probably they need to spend some time back trying to solve some of the problems. I, I was going to uh, ask of uh, Admiral Truly that uh, in the previous colloquy with one of the members, I think named Mr. Packard or maybe Mr. Volkmer, uh, the subject came up of, of the brakes and the criticality of, of brakes and that that is a, that could be a critical one on, uh, on an airplane or an automobile. 
Uh, I know many times when I've landed at National Airport, particularly under some adverse weather conditions, I was very glad that the brakes worked. Otherwise, I'd go into the uh, Potomac River on one end of the runway or the other, depending on which way you were landing. But uh, would, would not you classify that as a, as a critically that's warm right. item? I think, I think that's a good uh, way to understand criticality one and one R. As a matter of fact, it's just an automobile. Your right front wheel is a criticality one item. It falls off, you have the chance of losing your vehicle and, and you. Uh, you, if you have a problem with it and, and redesign it and recertify it, it's still a criticality one item. Your brakes, depending on your car model, may be criticality one R. You may have a disc brake system that has front, you know, separate front brake system and rear brake system, and you would have to lose both of those to get in the same situation. But, uh, but uh, to me, that's a good way to understand it. But nevertheless, even after you certify it properly, your right front wheel <laughs> still is criticality one, no matter how long you drive your car. I, I was going to point out to uh, Dr. Fletcher, uh, reference was made earlier about uh, where are the giants in NASA? Uh, do we have the, the giants as we had in the past? I remember sitting in this room in 1967 when we were investigating why pure oxygen was designed to go into the Apollo capsule, and that's fine as long as you have no electrical fire or any sparks, and we found that out in a very tragic manner. NASA found that out, and some of those giants of NASA uh, found that out that participated in that, and I don't mean to uh, in any way uh, 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 besmirch their records or find records. I think we have some very excellent people in NASA today. Many of them are sitting right at that table, and many of them are in this room or have been here or be here tomorrow, uh, and it's scattered it throughout the, the whole NASA system. Sometimes uh, <coughs> success uh, breeds uh, complacency, and I think that might be what uh, happened in, in this particular case. Uh, but it's unfortunate we had to find out the way we did, but I think we do have some very bright and talented people uh, in the NASA organization and in the, in the industrial team. Uh, and I hope that we never lose sight of that fact that, uh, that they've made some great contributions over the years. And I don't think it means that, that we have uh, uh, an erosion of talent in this country. Uh, I remember the early days, too, when uh, uh, Mark Russell, the political humorist here in Washington, referred to the vanguard as a civil service. He said he couldn't fire it and couldn't get it to work. Uh, <laughs> that was his remarks, not mine. But uh, the, uh, so we, we had our lumps in the early days of the program. Uh, it's still a very difficult, uh, difficult thing to do, but I, I would just like to set the record that, uh, that there are some very talented and bright people in NASA uh, and, and in the industrial team that can contribute and have contributed and will contribute uh, to, to our space program, not only the shuttle where we are today, but also the space station and the many other scientific, by the feat of uh, earlier this year of the uh, uh, Voyager spacecraft was certainly a great credit to a lot of very fine people. It's not very easy to transmit uh, or get a vehicle to go as far as that vehicle has. And the project of Galileo and some of the others that are in the Hubble telescope, which has had its problems along the way. But uh, I think we, we have to also sometime look at the good side. And I think the commission did in their closing uh, comments that uh, we should move forward with the, with the program. Uh, there are a lot of fine and talented people and a great organization, and I, while we've had a bump in the road, uh, I certainly hope that people that, within NASA do not become discouraged and think that, uh, that the Congress or, or the American public is down on them as being incompetent and uh, people are not capable of the task. They are capable of the task, and I'm sure that they'll prove that given an opportunity. Thank you. Oh. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Utah, Mr. Monson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Fletcher, being from Utah and knowing that you've been absent for a long time, uh, we still consider you one of us, and we uh, are proud of the work that you have done and commend you for 
the public service that you're showing at this time and uh, the spirit of public service that you're showing and wish you all the best as you go about these responsibilities. I uh, have uh, developed a concern uh, throughout this process uh, over uh, whether or not we're doing enough to determine uh, uh, and gather enough data prior to launch as to whether or not weather conditions are uh, suitable and such. Uh, uh, do you, uh, have you gone far enough in the process yet to, to know whether or not it, it would be necessary to uh, to uh, check more uh, areas of temperature, uh, more uh, uh, whatever can be done uh, to determine the effects of wind uh, at higher altitudes and such. Uh, and I know that uh, technology is not fully developed in that area yet, but uh, what, uh, what do you anticipate happening in that regard, if anything, at this point in time? Uh, Mr. Monson, that's an awfully good uh, question. Uh, the only reason I'm responding instead, instead of uh, Admiral Truly, we had a very detailed discussion about that with uh, um, Captain Crippen yesterday. That's one of the difficult things to do because you have to uh, predict weather not only at the uh, launch site before taking off, but you have to uh, uh, be able to predict the weather at the alternate launching at uh, landing sites in case of an abort to landing system. Uh, we have. Uh, improved some over the years, our weather prediction uh, generally, but local weather prediction is still a very difficult art, not quite a science. Uh, and we're uh, in the process of looking at better ways of making those forecasts. Having said that, it may be that uh, Captain Crippen or uh, Admiral Truly want to indicate what progress we've made. <coughs> I, I don't have much more to add, add to that other than the fact that we recognize very clearly that uh, we need uh, better technology, frankly, in, this, in, the, in the country for weather forecasting and very specifically in the space shuttle program, we need uh, the best technology that we can get at the Cape. Uh, precisely where that's gone, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, but we're going to sure, uh, we're going to we're going to sure pursue it and uh, make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, the technology uh, to do as best we can and then the mission rules and the discipline to make sure we obey our rules uh, when we get back to flight. I'm not uh, only concerned about forecasting, I'm concerned about actual conditions and, and our ability to measure them. Uh, uh, it's one thing to know the temperature a thousand feet from the vehicle, but but right up uh, at the vehicle itself, uh, are we going to be doing more in that regard? Are we going to uh, know more about well, the, uh, the effects of the different on the different parts system. of the vehicle and such, uh, 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 based on uh, uh, in in uh, in advance of what we've done in the past? I'm sure that we will, but again, uh, we just aren't far enough in the design process. I would comment that the. Uh, that the, even though that the cold weather that mo morning was not found to be uh, the cause of the accident, it certainly was a, uh, a possible uh, contributing factor in the failure of the joint. And it has uh, made the entire system uh, very aware of environmental effects. Uh, on the joint itself redesign, one of the uh, requirements that the redesign team will uh, very likely choose is that uh, even if the uh, new joint is not, uh, even if it could withstand cold temperatures, it probably will be environmentally controlled with heaters. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, we may uh, very well have direct instrumentation on the mud, but I, that's, a, that's a detail best left to the redesign and certification uh, group. And with regard to redesign, uh, you expressed a, a short time ago uh, that uh, there were there was a lot about the joint we didn't understand uh, even in the early launches uh, and I'm uh, I understand that uh, effects of rotation and such uh, uh, caused 
the parts in that joint to respond differently than it was anticipated they would when they were originally designed. Um, what can we do to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we understand enough before uh, we've gone through a process of several launches before we gain the knowledge that we need to to understand exactly how, how these parts are working and whether or not uh, they are working the way we thought they would when we designed them? Well, I don't have a, a pet answer, but I can tell you that I'm, uh, I'm a great believer in ground testing and uh, understanding the systems through test and then uh, operating systems, uh, you know, t more toward the middle of the envelope. Uh, we've done that uh, in the main engine program uh, in, in the past years. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to take a look at that program, but I, frankly, I, I would, uh, in general, I would say that I'm an advocate of spending money to do uh, testing of critical parts on the ground. Uh, and uh, we may very well find in the program that we make recommendations to, uh, to uh, have a more, ro more robust uh, test, pro test program, particularly on, uh, particularly on criticality uh, one items. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I add just a little bit to that, that the main reason that we're smarter about the way the joint performs now was not just the accident that told us we had a problem, but we d have done a number of uh, just what uh, Admiral Truly said, subsystem tests that have made us smart about the way the actual joint operates. And uh, John Thomas from Marshall, who was the man that, uh, although he was a deputy, he actually did the lead on the accident analysis, was the prime driver behind most of those tests, and he is now the, the lead on the, on the redesign effort. Consequently, I'm, I am certain that he is going to use that same fundamental rule in the design of the, of the new joint. May I follow up just, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, it, it causes me concern, though, when, when I hear that, that what we originally anticipated would happen uh, uh, may have been exactly opposite of what actually happened when, when the uh, rocket was fired uh, in certain uh, parts of that, uh, especially surrounding the joint. Uh, in this instance, uh, not, not this particular launch, but uh, uh, the performance of the joint overall, and I, I, I guess you can never, hundred percent be sure that you, uh, that you have all knowledge. Uh, but uh, I, I assume that uh, from your statements, those tests will, will include the making sure that what we thought we were designing is the act actually the way it uh, it performs. Well, if I understand your uh, your comment properly, uh, personally, I'm going to gain the, uh, the. Uh, confidence to go fly again, not from the design, but from the testing, the certification and the test program. Uh, and that's why choices like uh, the manner in which we test, the configuration in which we test, uh, the analysis of the test data, uh, that's the real data. And uh, we want to go fly again, and we w the nation desperately needs us to get back in the air. But uh, the, the proof of the pudding is in the test program, and that's, and as a matter of fact, no matter whether it's July 87 or any other date, it's primarily the uh, scheduling of that test program with enough time for the system to analyze it that will give us the confidence. And when we get started flying again, we've, uh, we're going to have enough time before the, uh, in between the flights so that we can uh, take the motors apart, uh, analyze them, at the factory and before we commit to the next flight to make sure that we have uh, no evidence of uh, a problem uh, in the joint. So, so in general, I, uh, the, the confidence that we all gain in this redesign will be through the test program. It's a very important part of it. Thank you. Chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Chairman. Not in the report, but uh, tested by several commissioners uh, since the report has come out is the fact that they that some of them claim that if the accident had not happened the system would be shut down by now anyhow because of a lack of spare parts and a, la and a lack of resources do you agree with that uh, I mr. Walker I'm not sure you're addressing the question to me uh, I have I read the Whoever same might st know. statement uh, I think that um, however there's been a rather thorough look at that by uh, 
Admiral Truly and his associates. I don't know which one is the best qualified to answer it. Sure, or Arnie, I would. Well, in a word, I don't agree with that, but uh, I'd rather uh, Arnie uh, speak to it. Or Mr. Aldridge speak to it. Two of, the, two of the areas along that line that are brought out in the Commission's report deal with the uh, availability of the flight software for the flights in 1986 in time for adequate crew training and the spare parts question. Uh, uh, in leading into the, the flights for 1986 that were planned, we knew that we had a very, very tight schedule. We had uh, packed into it all that we thought we could achieve, and we realized there was some risk of, the, of meeting all the milestones. Uh, one of those areas which we spent a lot of time on was, in fact, the mission preparation and flight software schedules. We knew they were tight. We had touched all the bases, however, and had a map that said we could get there. I would be the first to admit that uh, we might have run into delays, and rather than be shut down, we would have been delayed. I think the same situation is true with the spare parts. There are shortages in some areas, but not in others, and depending on which parts were needed and exactly what the configuration of the the orbiter situations were we went forward into the year. We again could have been delayed for parts, but I, I really doubt that we would have been completely shut down. But you would have been pushed very, very hard to complete anywhere close to the schedule that you had manifested. I think we would have been pushed hard to complete the schedule we had manifested, but we might have been close. We had some very demanding things in 1986. Why didn't somebody admit that to the Congress uh, then uh, when we were looking at some of these problems in the upcoming year uh, when you were before us? Well, I can't respond to what was reported to Congress because I was no. not here on that subject. I did uh, uh, go at lengths in the program in support of the uh, spare parts budget, particularly for the orbiter, which is where the question is, and we were able to achieve the budget we achieved through the process we went we through. We kept being assured over and over and over again that these manifested schedules and so on not only could be met, but uh, you, you, were, you were confident that we were, that we were moving ahead and uh, that uh, we were not going to, to have problems, and yet now we find out that there may have indeed been problems. And here's where it, it fits into, it seems to me, then the overall part of the Commission. We have heard testified about today, we heard at that time, that safety is always number one. That throughout this, that you were being pushed hard, that you weren't sure you could make the manifest, and yet safety was always number one. You said it, we believed it, and you had a flight record to prove it. And uh, in large part, it seems to me that uh, what uh, uh, transpired then was that th having had that on the record, we then get the Presidential Commission report that talks about the silent safety program. And uh, they specifically talk about things which are very disturbing. Organizational structures at Kennedy and Marshall have placed safety, reliability, and quality assurance offices under the supervision of the very organizations and activities whose efforts are there to check. That's not a safety program. Problem reporting requirements are not concise and fail to get critical information to the proper levels of management. That's not a safety program. Five weeks after the 51L accident, the criticality of the solid rocket motor field joint was still not properly documented in the problem reporting system at Marshall. That's an atrocity. And, you know, it seems to me it's not only a silent safety program, it's an invisible safety program at that point. Uh, in the problem reports, and you, Mr. Aldridge, it says, it says in the report, that your office and the entire Johnson Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance Directorate were not even on the distribution list for the problem reports. That's not a safety program. But what are we going to do to correct that? Yeah, I don't know where who should start, but uh, that's that, that's a, a, an important uh, element of the investigation that uh, we're going to look into both NASA-wide and in the shuttle program. Uh, we, we do have a, uh, a, a safety program. It, we have to respond specifically to those comments that you just made, but I think more important, we have to make sure that the appropriate safety program is implemented in the future. But, but let, me, let me just follow up. That is a general systemic breakdown. I mean, the things I'm citing here are, are, are particulars, and you may address the particulars, but what you've got is a systemic breakdown. When, when you've got those kinds of, of problems, when, when the top-level management isn't even on the, on the uh, uh, distribution list for the problem reports. Uh, you know, that's a, that becomes then a program on paper, but not in reality. 
And, and what, I'm, what I'm asking is, what are we going to do to solve that problem? Mr. Walker, I think that uh, long journeys start with a single step. Uh, we've got a lot of things in work to, uh, to solve those specific problems. Uh, frankly, I, uh, even though the Commission uh, did uh, uh, characterize it as a silent safety program, and, and, I, and I accept every one of their find every single one of their findings, they just have to be addressed. As someone said earlier, safety uh, is, is, is a, you can't do it with paper. You know, people that have thousands of flying hours aren't alive because the paper said for them to pre-flight their airplanes. They're alive because they pre-flighted the airplanes. We, we do have a number of problems, but uh, I think that uh, we also have a system that was spending a great deal of time on safety. But somehow, uh, through uh, organizational uh, changes and uh, a lack of discipline in some places, it needs to be shored up. And I don't know how to answer your question except to uh, have the commitment to uh, redo it during this downtime where it needs redoing, uh, revalidate it where it's, uh, we deem it to be uh, okay, and, uh, and get to work on it. And that's what we're pledged to do. Well, let me just suggest that it seems to me that in reading the report that we got to a place where you had said to yourselves over and over again that safety was number one with you. You said it to us, as I pointed out before, and you, and you had a flight record to prove it. And you began to believe that everybody up and down the line was concerned with safety, as we would hope they would be. But as a result of believing that everybody was concerned about it, there was no one who had it as their primary concern. And ultimately, that led to a breakdown in, in the system. And so it seems to me the correction somewhere along the line has to be that, that there has to be a primary concern about safety at some point in the system all the time. Would you agree with that? Uh, uh, Mr. Walker, you're absolutely right. There needs to be a, a central point in, in not only in NASA, but at each of the centers in which uh, safety is the primary concern. As a matter of fact, that should be the case with each element of this uh, decision process, for example, starting with level one down to level four. Uh, we do have a, uh, a, a, a central uh, safety location in headquarters uh, in the chief engineer's office. If I may, Mr. Mr. The, Chairman. The fact that it didn't, uh, wasn't communicated properly down at one of the centers, uh, if that was the case, was a glitch and shouldn't have happened. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I might just take a little more time. The, the headquarters person, that's Mr. Silvera's office, he has one person who spends one quarter of his time on safety, reliability, and quality assurance. And he has one other guy who spends 10% of his time on shuttle safety. Now, that's not really much of a commitment on the part of the agency. I'm not familiar with those numbers. Uh, uh, we, we have a, a safety and... Uh, R and QA office. As I understand it, they're in the they're in the report. Those figures are are, are in the Presidential Commission report. Uh, Mr. Walker, I'd like to uh, check that against the current status. I believe the Commission may have been reporting on the status uh, at the time of the accident, which is very germane to the accident and very appropriate for them to report on. Some changes have taken place there already, but it's uh, as uh, Dr. Fletcher and Admiral truly said, more changes are anticipated in that uh, and certainly contemplated in that area. I believe you're exactly uh, right that there is a systemic problem there. The, uh, the safety function can too easily become mixed with other functions inside an organization, and when that happens, the results uh, can be very serious. Uh, at this point, uh, it's uh, a task before us to make sure that, that there are safety channels which don't cross over the program channels in such a direct way that issues which are safety issues coming up through the system uh, become uh, unidentifiable with program issues which have to be worked in their own way and in their own uh, framework. 
But or that is when a, you are trying to meet a manifest schedule that you know you can't meet anyhow, become the things that get shunted aside because they do not fit with what you've got to get done on the schedule that you yes, set for yourself, that, which is an impossible schedule. Yeah, yes, th that is exactly what I mean by a programmatic issue. A <clears throat> programmatic issue is meeting cost, uh, meeting the budget, meeting the schedule, uh, and safety cannot be traded off against that. Risk management has to be a discipline of its own. And those have to come together very, very high in the organization and not be suppressed. And if the Challenger accident has reminded us of anything, it is the importance of keeping these, func these functions and separate least, and distinct. And at least the program managers have to get problem reports, right? Uh, that and certainly and many other things as well. Thank you, Chair. The Chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Volkman. Thank you very much. That took like that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, somewhere along the line and reading the things I've read in the last few days, uh, somehow I have an impression in my mind that there is some concern, uh, assuming that we didn't have the disaster 51 hour, we were going for 16 missions uh, this year, that the question of whether we had sufficient astronaut corps in order to handle that 16 missions and also to uh, do the administrative work, et cetera, uh, you know, would you comment on that? Yes, sir. I, I am not aware that anybody had a concern regarding whether we had an adequate core. We had crews assigned for all the flights and in training. Uh, the same question had arisen that uh, Mr. Aldridge alluded to earlier, and that was getting all of the software, the computer programs, out and delivered on time such that those could be put in our simulators and everybody could be adequately trained. That was part of the things that was stacking up on us. Was it a question of whether we had people? It was a question of whether we had time and facilities to get it all done. There was concern, though. There was concern. All right, thank you. Uh, that will, of course, have to be addressed, uh, Mr. Fletcher, uh, somewhere along the line if we plan to go back once in operation and the numbers that we plan to do with the number of shuttles that we have. It, it, will it not? Mr. Volkmer, even though that um, uh, even if I didn't pay any attention to Admiral Truly and uh, Captain Critton, that would certainly be <laughs> a, a concern that would be fixed. But having two uh, astronauts that have been in the program, I'm sure, I'm certain it will be fixed. All right. Now, the other matter I'd like to address is, uh, and it gets back to where we are now. We now have three shuttles. The question whether we're going to have a fourth. I don't think anybody today can answer that uh, uh, question uh, with assurance. And the uh, statement in the uh, recommendations of the commission in uh, number, Roman numeral number eight, and it says the nation's reliance on the shuttle as its principal space launch capability created relentless pressure on NASA to increase the flight rate. Now, the next sentence is one I want to address today. Uh, at least, uh, Mr. Fletcher, you to give us some idea uh, when we can uh, see some activity, if any, on it. Such reliance on a single launch capability should be avoided in the future. Well, I think that, uh, Mr. Does that Volkmer, mean, well, first, what does that mean to you, that sentence? Well, uh, it's, it's, to me, it's very clear what they mean, and we've already taken some actions, Mr. Volkmer. They, they mean that we need to have a mixed fleet, uh, a mixture of um, uh, space shuttles, um, uh, expendables, large, uh, large expendables like the uh, Defense Department, what they call CELVs, we used to call it the T-34D-7, I think. Right. And then also perhaps uh, additional medium uh, uh, size launch vehicles like something similar to the Atlas Centaur or, or Thor Delta. That's what I think is meant by, uh, we call it a mixed fleet, but uh, other, other transportation systems besides the shuttle. Now, are we addressing the question when you get into the mixed fleet <clears throat> and into the expendables, uh, or are you addressing the question of whether that should be in the private sector producing those and providing those or whether it should be done uh, through the government uh, as we've done in the past with NASA again furnishing the expendables? Mr. Volkmer, uh, we're part of a, a um, interagency group which is dealing with that. It's called the um, a Commercial Space Working Group, I believe. It's under the Economics Policy Council of the White House. 
and we in the Department of Transportation, Department of Commerce, and I think defense also are, are working that problem very hard to decide uh, not whether uh, there will be commercial uh, launch vehicles, but when that should occur. It's very likely that uh, sometime in the future we'll begin to have uh, commercially supported launch vehicles. What would you, uh, assuming that we do not have the force shuttle, we do not get it, uh, what would you uh, predict would be the uh, flight rate, uh, let's say uh, by 89, with three? Well, Mr. Volkmer, I, I, first of all, I want to say that I don't like the thought of having only three orbiters because that's kind of a marginal fleet. It's not, not just the flight rate that's uh, of concern, but it's the uh, problem, suppose you have a brake difficulty and uh, you want to fix it or some other problem with one or the other of the orbiters, uh, the pressure to launch with only three is, is, might cause another accident. And I, I don't want that to happen. Having said that, though, I think uh, Admiral Truly can answer the specific question you asked. We have a fairly major uh, effort within the pro in the program that uh, Mr. Aldrich is running to take a look specifically at flight rate. Uh, the present status of that is, is we, we have taken an initial look with, uh, without having all the data in. And, uh, and I believe that we can safely build up to flight rate with a three-orbiter fleet of uh, 12 to 15 flights. And, but I'd like to make an important point to that. The difference in 12 and 15 is not a push on safety or, or what. It's, it's primarily the, uh, the, the sorts of flights you choose. For example, if you fly a uh, space lab, it requires a longer vehicle flow. Frankly, with the manifest that I see uh, today, we're going to have those kind of those vehicle flows in there. Uh, so I think we're going to be on the low end of that scale uh, after uh, three or four years into the uh, program. In the out years, I'm sure we'll get smarter. There may be ways to, uh, to build it up somewhat, but it'll certainly, uh, or at least uh, on my watch, it'll uh, be planned to be uh, as I said, and, and as the commission uh, in that very paragraph that you, that you uh, referred to, is we will have a, a flight rate that is commensurate with our resources, be they people or dollars or work shifts at the Cape or, or whatever. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The, uh, we're, what I plan on doing is having one more uh, uh, colleague uh, ask some questions, and then we'll, we'll cut around five, but there's a statement I want to make before we quit to get ready for tomorrow. The chair recognizes the single gentleman from Florida, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the commission has a finding, Captain Krypton, uh, that training simulators may be the limitation on the flight rate. Uh, do you agree with that uh, particular assessment of the commission? Mr. Nelson, I think that finding is uh, associated with the statement that I made earlier that it is not the simulators so much as it is the software programs that end up feeding those simulators and how fast we can get those developed and, and fed in. We were saturated with what we were facing this year. And uh, w there is an effort being made to streamline that. Part of it is not necessarily just the flights that you have out in front of you. It is the fact that we were also contending with manifest changes. A manifest change, in effect, begins to look like another flight, in, even though you don't execute it. And it was those kinds of things that we are now trying to smooth out so that, uh, that we aren't faced with those kind of problems. But that's why you're hearing uh, rates quoted by Admiral Truly uh, that are more along the lines of about uh, four flights per orbiter. And that with, with that kind of thing, we can do it. Uh, there are, we could, if we had some additional simulators, uh, it would certainly help because uh, they, are, they are full. And also our simulators right now, uh, uh, the actual basis for them uh, preceded the approach and landing test program, and uh, consequently, 
They, we're in need of new computers to support them. So we, we have some problems in those areas that, uh, that you will see probably addressed in future budget requests. Okay, uh, you're referring to uh, one of the first part of the findings in which it says that the capabilities of the system were stretched to the limit to support the flight rate over the, uh, the winter of 1985-86. Uh, and if I recall, uh, I saw one statistic that had uh, STS-61C that compared to other training hours in the simulator that uh, that crew was uh, particularly low. Uh, if I recall, it was something like 50 hours of training in the last so many days compared to uh, others that had by 20% more training hours. Is, is that an example of what you're talking about on the crew, crew software? It, uh, I'm not familiar with the uh, statistic you just quoted. It uh, was an example that we were faced with more and more of the specific mission training coming later and later in flight. Uh, and it was because the programs to support that training were coming later and later. Uh, and I would uh, assume that what the figure that you just quoted was part of the total problem that we were addressing and why it was continuing to get tighter through, uh, through this particular year when we were looking at it. The Commission report goes on to say, in addition to the software problem that you've identified, quote, the two current simulators cannot train crews for more than 12 to 15 flights per year, end of quote. And uh, that is just physical amount of time that you can put in the simulators themselves. Uh, they can only produce so much training time. And that was why I said that if we were going to go and talk about flight rates on uh, exceeding that, it would certainly be desirable to get supplementary simulators to support it. Uh, Dr. Fletcher, yesterday I took the occasion while uh, Chairman Rogers and Vice Chairman Armstrong were here to get a clarification on their uh, interpretation of the following uh, recommendation. Quote, full consideration should be given to conducting static firings of the exact flight configuration in a vertical attitude, end of quote. Now, that's come up here a couple of times today. Uh, the answer that, uh, that we got back from Mr. Armstrong was that that was not a requirement. It was a recommendation for consideration. In other words, they were not mandating in their recommendations that you test in the vertical attitude, but they certainly wanted you to give consideration uh, to simulate all of the factors in the exact flight uh, configuration. What, what's your uh, reaction to that at this point, and uh, recognizing that uh, you, you don't have all the facts at this point? But. Well, uh, since you addressed the question to me, it just turns out that uh, we've had a lot of discussions with Admiral Truly and his colleagues on that subject. Uh, that's a reasonable uh, thing to, to request. And by the way, it, it has been looked at in some depth ever since I've been here, and probably long before. It, it's a reasonable thing to do, uh, particularly if you test it vertically right side up. But of course, that's, uh, that's, that's a little difficult because you have to have a, a hold down uh, system of some kind. If you test it upside down, I'm not sure that's a reasonable a test. And then, of course, the thrust goes up in the air. Uh, having said that, we're still looking at the problem and giving it the study that it deserves. Uh, but uh, uh, I, and I can, I can tell you this, that if uh, Admiral Truly and his colleagues have come up with any good scheme for doing that, I'd be surprised. But I'd, I hope I'm surprised. But go ahead, Dick. <laughs> if I could, <clears throat> let me tell you briefly where we are and we can go in, in, into it in more detail uh, tomorrow if you if you would like we are already doing precisely what the Commission report uh, said and I've, I spoke yesterday on the phone to a couple of the commissioners uh, so that when we get to our recommendation we can uh, get to the individuals on the Commission that that and uh, who uh, uh, 
uh, discuss this uh, tech from a technical point of view and, and uh, try to get together. The most important part of that recommendation is not really the difficulty of doing the test because even though it's going to cost a lot of money and take a lot of time and probably slow us down, but, wh but which is the, right config the proper configuration on the basis of technical merit that we should do the uh, full-scale testing. I spent, uh, in, in preparation for this hearing, I spent uh, a good bit of time on the telephone with the people that are doing that work and it's not complete, but that is precisely what they're, they're doing. They're looking at, for example, between the horizontal and the two vertical configurations, they're looking at things like uh, how well can you measure thrust, uh, what sort of a range can you vector the, the uh, TBC, the uh, gimbling of the, the nozzle in the two configurations. Most importantly, probably in this situation, uh, the loading on the joints in the two, in the, actually the three configurations. Uh, what would be the best uh, from the point of view of joint dynamics? And beyond that, it, it, you, you sort of drift into the problems of it, for example, well, there's one other, uh, and that is the assembly. In other words, which which of the two configurations would would be the proper one or the most conservative one uh, as compared to the failure that we had? So, so I'm confident that we're we are very very fairly looking at that, and uh, and we're going to look hard at it. I believe that vertical testing could be done. Uh, we have looked at. Uh, approximately 10 sites around the country that I can tell you about. We have a preliminary estimate of what we could do at each of them, There's, but it would, it would be a very, uh, uh, it would be a mighty effort to, uh, to do it, but if it's necessary to do, we will do it. But the, but the first question is, should we do it? And uh, that's the way we're approaching it. The gentleman from Pennsylvania. Oh. Sorry, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Wilburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I realize it's been a long day for everybody, and I have had my, I've had to be absent as well, but, uh, and I apologize for raising points that might uh, have been covered, but I feel I should, and I'm troubled by, uh, by one area, and that is this balance between looking back with uh, recrimination uh, or blame versus going forward. And what I'm concerned about is that, that apparently there's widespread agreement that the mindset in NASA has to change. And, and I'm concerned that the, the, the new start won't have that much of a difference unless we really do assess responsibility. And I, I wonder whether uh, NASA is prepared to look at this sequence of events and assess the kind of responsibility that I, th that I think would be needed to change a mindset and change an attitude. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 the head of the commission, Mr. Rogers, said that in talking to some at NASA, it was like there hadn't been any accident. And that's a direct quote from him uh, here before this committee yesterday, and that's what I'm trying to get at. I wanted to ask uh, uh, Dr. Flesher, uh, you said in your press release in response to the commission's report that the criticism was not, and I think I quote, completely undeserved. You don't mean to imply that there was any undeserved criticism in the report by that uh, qualification, do you? Mr. Walgren, remember that uh, that statement was made uh, after having uh, received the um, report only a few hours. I think um, it was maybe at most four hours between the time I received the report and the time I made the statement. And uh, naturally, you want to cover yourself uh, as far as I know now, there was, there was no part of that uh, report that wasn't deserved. Now, that isn't to say that I have read it so much in detail that every word and adjective and so forth uh, I agree with because I can't really say that. But by and large, the report uh, it, 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 and the harsh criticism is deserved by NASA. 
One of the recommendations was that there be tape recording of some of the conferences uh, where the decisions to launch uh, might be made and where reservations should be made. Mr. Bullard made the point that certainly that would create a record uh, that you would be able to go back on and heaven forbid we should ever have to. I think one of the most interesting things about that is I sense that somehow or other the shuttle and its mission are so overwhelming that it's hard for an individual, a mere individual, to get in the way. And I think when I look back on some of this record, I can see the size of the project, the momentum of the project, and the importance of the project having a kind of, uh, 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 of, of momentum that, that seems to override the individual. And I wanted to uh, ask uh, and, and ask that that recommendation of tape recording be very deeply considered by NASA because I think the one thing it would do is it would, it would elevate the individual uh, and, and encourage them to play their role at whatever point to the fullest, uh, knowing that someone might look back on it, but not so much as a tracking device, but as a mechanism to empower the individuals uh, that are making these kinds of decisions because of the, the psychological momentum uh, uh, of the program itself. Do you have any thoughts on that? Mr. Walgren, uh, one thing that you said earlier I think really is important to say again, and I'll say it a different way. Uh, if we haven't learned by that tragic mistake, we haven't done our job. That's, that's the way we, we learn. Uh, I'm sure there were uh, places in the organization where there was not the appropriate motivation or, as you say, the appropriate sense of responsibility. We can't make this uh, very complicated machine work without everybody in the decision loop feeling that responsibility and being motivated not to make a mistake. Uh, a recording of his conversation is, is possibly one way that we should look at to make sure that people do feel that responsibility. There are a lot of other things we have to look at as well. If I might, one other question, Mr. Chairman, and, and that would be, in one of the Thiokol memos, they talk about uh, the possibility of a near-term fix of the OCL problem uh, or, or the, you know, whatever you call it, the O-ring problem, uh, and uh, being uh, based on shimming the joint differently than apparently it was uh, uh, planned originally. And the Thiokol memo is dated uh, uh, August 20-something, uh, and they say that we, sh we ought to do the near-term shim fix on the flight that is scheduled after uh, uh, STL 25, which was scheduled to go August 22nd at the time. My point is, is that there was indication that there was a very near-term uh, interim improvement that could be made on the O-ring problem. And the question is whether that improvement was made on this uh, shuttle flight that took off some eight months later, and if not, uh, uh, why not? Do you know? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was not. The proper gentleman probably to answer that question is John Thomas tomorrow, who uh, did lead the accident well, analysis thing. Uh, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania who indulged me, I think that it's important to keep our continuity, and you were, you, I know you're at uh, two other hearings, we're bringing those folks in tomorrow who are directly related to that. So I think it would be more profitable you know, to get the factual information rather than conjecture if that's reasonable to all involved. And we'll take that up first thing tomorrow. I think it's, it's appropriate. So I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Thank I think you it, very I think much. it'd be more productive. I want to thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania again for his uh, excellent uh, uh, participation. The, we're going to quit now. And I want to thank you all for being extraordinarily patient and, uh, and very understanding and very upfront. I like that. I think it was. Uh, Everybody's been some difficult questions today, and I think we've all been pursuing them, and I think you've equated yourselves very, very well in the new management team that's uh, uh, heading up NASA. I would hope that tomorrow, as we had discussed, we'll meet at 9.30. It would be, again, very desirable to have Dr. Fletcher and uh, Dr. Graham and Admiral Trulli and all of you here tomorrow as we go through the next step. The next step now is to detail 
through the teams that the, the uh, task forces you set up and go through that drill. I think it's important for the members to understand exactly what happened there, uh, which we're talking about. I would like to, to, for, for you to think about this for tomorrow afternoon. I know that it would be inappropriate uh, for you to be in a position of making policy uh, decisions because it is not your uh, prerogative, it's certainly not this date as it is anybody's until all the facts are unfolded. However, I think that as we go through the phase that we're going through now in dealing with the technological factors, safety factors, and beginning to mature some thought processes as it, as it relates to improving the uh, management efforts which have been discussed in depth today, that the final leg of our journey is going to be what the policy positions will be. And there are different people, of course, who have different views as to what policy should be. Some people say we should have a balanced fleet. Some people say we should uh, have not build the fourth orbiter. Some people say, well, what do we do with three? If we don't build the four, will we be able to do the space station? What about the satellites that are, are sitting in warehouses now and so forth? So there's, a, there's a, a universe of knowledge and fundamental basic information that has not been yet presented into the debate. Most of it has been conjectured at this point. And rightfully so, the Commission took the point of view uh, that that was not their charge under the President's directive. And I think that's a statement of fact as to where we're at now. However, I would hope that as the members uh, uh, unfold their questions tomorrow, those are some of the questions that should be asked so that we can begin to see in both a short-range policy point of view and a long-range policy point of view what are the facts before the Congress. In other words, things such as, well, if we have the three orbiters, why three? Why not two? Why not ten? I don't mean to be facetious. I think that's something that ought to be laid out before the American people. I think the next point is, what is the relationship when we start talking about time and cost as it relates to the space station, the experimental phases, and, and the different things that we're looking to achieve in the space station situation per se? The idea, if you're going to be uh, limiting if we only have a fleet of three shuttles or four shuttles. What does that mean in an objective point of view as far as payloads are concerned, particularly in light of the safety factors and the re-review that you so well testified through here today? So that we could get some um, uh, observations, at least, a factual observations based upon the information that's available to us that we can at least have some foundation for a thought process to develop by the committee as far as policy, long and short range policy would be concerned. So I want to alert you to that for consideration because some of those questions will be propounded by different members tomorrow afternoon. I want to thank you very much for being with us. The committee will stand adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow morning at 9.30.